Good afternoon, members. Um, you're all very welcome to our mostly full council meeting, um, albeit uh, remotely. I'm going to hand over to the Chief Executive, John Kelby, to read the summons of meeting and the uh, attendance list. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, members. Uh, to all members of Derry City and Strabane District Council, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the Council to be held uh, today remotely on Thursday, the 23rd of July, uh, 2020, at 4 o'clock. As the Mayor said, uh, members starting with the roll call firstly. Alderman Bresland. Here. Alderman Devaney. Here. Alderman Guy. Here, John. Alderman Carrigan. What's your over, Michael? Alderman McCutcock. Yeah. Alderman McClintock. Alderman McCready. Yes, here, John. Alderman McCain. Here, John. Alderman Ramsey. Alderman Ramsey. Alderman Wark. Here, John. Councillor Jason Barr. Jason's having difficulty getting logged in, John. Okay, thank you, Martin. Apologies received from Councillor Raymond Barr. Councillor John Boyle. Here. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Councillor Tina Burke. Councillor Burke. Councillor Carr. Here, John. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cusick. Here, John. Councillor Dobbins. Here, John. Councillor Donnelly. And Shaw. Councillor Duffy. And Shaw. Councillor Durkin. Councillor Durkin. And Shaw. Just then, John. Councillor Edwards. Here, John. Councillor Farrell. Here. Uh, Councillor Barr is just indicated in the chat box that he's here as well. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Barr. Um, Councillor Ferguson. John. Councillor Fleming. So, John. Councillor Gallagher. And so, John. Councillor Harkin. John. Councillor Jackson. Sure. So. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Luke. And Sure. Councillor McCann. Sure. Councillor, thank you. Councillor McCluskey. Councillor McCluskey. Councillor McGuire. And Sure. Councillor McHugh. And Sure, John. Councillor McKeever. Here, John. Councillor McKinney. Here, John. Councillor Mellon. And Shaw, John. Councillor Mooney. Councillor Riley. Here, John. And Councillor Tierney. Thank you. Um, Councillor Michaela Boyle, I think I saw you coming in there. Yes, John, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah. And um, just checking back over the list, um, Alderman McClintock. And I'm here. Okay, thank you, Hillary. Uh, Alderman Ramsey. Here, John. Thank you, David. Um, Councillor Burke. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Kelly. I'm here, John. Yep. Okay, thank you, Dan. That's it, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, John, can you just mute your mic, please? Certainly. Members, can I just ask that, um, as is um, practice when we're online, if you're not speaking, can you mute your mic because we're getting some feedback there? Thank you. Um, members, item number three is a statement of remote meetings or for remote meetings. Therefore, I would like to remind everyone who is in remote attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live via the Control's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and the media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council's protocol. Members and speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting 
and to use chat facility to highlight a request. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use of and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes, for the purposes of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of the Council's privacy notice can be found on the Council website at derrickstopan.com. Thank you, members. Item number four is the declaration of members' interests. Um, I can pick them now. Can I suspend standing orders? Who's that? Mark. You want to suspend standing orders? Yeah. To discuss what issue all the work? Um, Mayor, thank you for allowing me on. I'd like these um, today suspend standing orders. A reference to take a motion on the front of us today. It's referring to uh, Councillor Donnelly's motion on Liam Campbell. Unfortunately, we're not at the guild hall today. Okay, um, Alderman Work, just, um, before, just before you speak on it, um, I want to take the vote to see um, if members are in agreement. Mayor, to, I need a seconder Mayor, first of all. I'll second that, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. Morris here. Could I have a vote on that, Mayor, please? Alderman Devaney has uh, seconded Mayor. Alderman, Alderman Work. It will be a recorded vote anyway because we have to do it um, via the roll call. This is, um, the so Lloyd, this is the Lloyd Michael Gallagher. I'm with you. Yeah, I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak once we uh, decide, once members decide if they're in agreement to suspend standing order. So if you can just bear with us while we take the vote, then you will be aware that it's 80% of those in attendance and voting um, required for the suspension of standing orders. So, one of I can ask uh, for a recorded vote on Alderman Mark's proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> um, so, this is for the suspension of standing orders proposed by Alderman Graham Work for, against, or abstain. Alderman Bredland. For, for John. Alderman Devaney. Or. Alderman Guy. Or. Alderman Carrigan. Alderman Carrigan. John. Have Wi-Fi problems, John. Four. Thank you, Alderman McClintock. Four. Alderman McClintock. Four. Alderman McCready. Four. Alderman McCain. Four. Alderman Ramsey. Four. Alderman Wark. Alderman Four. Wark. Four. Councillor Jason Barr. Or uh, Councillor Raymond Barr sent apologies. Councillor John Boyle. Or Councillor Michaela Boyle. Councillor, sorry, say it again. Councillor okay. Michaela Boyle. Against. Thank you. Um, Councillor Burke is still absent. I assume. No, I am here, John. Oh, you're here, um, uh, Councillor Burke. Yes. Against. Councillor Carr. Councillor Schultz. Four. Um, is Councillor Cooper now with us? Sorry, John. Yes, I'm here again. Thank you. Councillor Cusick. Councillor Cusick. Thank you. Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Dobbins. Okay, members, silence will be recorded as an abstention. Councillor Donnelly. John. Councillor Dobbins, is that you? Yeah, it is. Sorry, I was trying to get in a lot of feedback there, and my answer is four. Thank you. Councillor Donnelly. Against. Councillor Duffy. Against. Councillor Durkin. Councillor Durkin. Going to record that as an abstention. Councillor Edwards. Councillor Farrell. Councillor Farrell. Four for me. I think Mary was trying to come on again there. Councillor Durkin, do you want to come back in? Okay. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Four, John. Councillor Fleming. Against, John. Councillor Gallagher. Against, John. Councillor Harkin. 
Against, John. Councillor Jackson. Against, John. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Kelly. Against, John. Councillor Logue. Against. Councillor McCann. Councillor McCann. Against. Councillor McCluskey. Councillor McGuire. Councillor McGuire. Against. Thank you. Councillor McHugh. Against. Councillor McKeever. For. Councillor McKinney. For John. For John. Councillor Mellon. Against. Councillor Mooney. For John. Councillor Riley. For John. And Councillor Tierney. For. For. I'm just checking there with Councillor Durkin again. Okay, thank you, members. Excuse me. For John, sorry, I'm having my baller with my mic. Got it there, Mary. Thank you. Okay, members, um, thank you very much uh, for bearing with us here where we worked that out. The result of the vote was 23 for, 16 against, um, and there were 39 people in attendance and voting. That equates, members, to 59% of those in attendance and voting in favour of the motion. Therefore, the motion falls, and we will not be suspending standing orders to discuss that. Thank you. And we're moving on to declarations of members' interests. Um, I can pick them now or as they come up in the meeting, members. Okay, I don't hear anyone um, indicating, so I'm going to move on to item number five, which is chairperson's business, members. Um, it is uh, customary that people would contact the mayor in advance of the full council meeting if they wish to raise something under chairperson's business and where um, the mayor finds it appropriate, and uh, normally grant social requests. Although we are meeting virtually, I'm not going to change that practice, but I have got a, a few councillors, ex councillors who have contacted me looking to raise requests. So, what I will do, um, I'm going to allow them to raise them, but I would ask that you um, come quickly to your point because you'll understand that we've got a lot of business to get through today. Um, so, I'm going to start with councillor Angela Dobbins. Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor, that's really quick. Um, our over 75s free license fee removal is a really, really cruel um, thing to do. The removal of this condemns some pensioners to a life of loneliness and depression. And ever since the BBC has announced its decision to means test the free TV license, I and all our councillors, as I know, have been inundated with calls and petitions to sign. Uh, £154 doesn't seem a lot. But when, when you don't have it and there's all our bills to pay, well, I, I don't have need to go on. This is a generation that has done everything uh, that they've been asked to do and more. They've been treated as if they've been a drain on society. This is a generation that has provided the country with workers of the future, has paid their way and has worked hard and made their commitment to their country. And when they did everything they've been asked to do, uh, save for their old age, pay this and pay that. They get to that old age and 75 and the same age is, is not extremely old. 
uh, they get to that old age and see everything that they've worked for has been taken away. So, Mayor, with your permission, I'd like to make a proposal to council that this council acknowledges the impact of loneliness on people across the district, recognizes that the mental health impact of loneliness has been made worse throughout the coronavirus pandemic, further recognizes that many older people rely on TV and radio broadcasting for engagement and company, objects to the decision to end the free license scheme for people aged over 75, and resolves to write to the British government to record our strong opposition to cuts in the BBC that have forced this unacceptable change. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Robbins. Um, and I see that we've got a seconder there from Councillor Cusack. Um, so, members, that proposal um, is going to the floor. If I don't hear any uh, speaking against it, I'm going to take that uh, as read that we're, we're going through it. So, over to you, members. Can I come on, Morris? The Vanny, go ahead, Morris. Um, just getting switched on here, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, for allowing me in this subject. And look, I, I, I do support here. The, our party has no problem here in certain uh, supporting this proposal coming forward today. I think it's very pertinent at the moment um, for those who. You know who are the most vulnerable people in society, and I think it's not that long ago since I had brought a motion forward to council um, raising the issue about the, the TV licences. Uh, and look, at the end of the day, uh, I do believe that those in that age category should be receiving the TV licence free. Uh, and I know there's a debate between government and BBC, but we have no problem as a party uh, in supporting the proposal going forward. Thank you, uh, Alderman Davianni. Members, I don't hear anyone else um, indicating that they wish to speak either for or against this. As I say, um, I'm going to take it as read um, on that basis. Rejection. Go ahead, Kristen. Go on, Melbourne, Mayor. Um, Mayor, on behalf of Sinn Féin, um, we're happy to support the proposal. Um, again, this is another attack um, stemming from our port, the Tory party um, in England, um, and, and it's on this occasion, it's attack against um, our pensioners and those that are over seventy-five. Um, it's something that we've we've become accustomed to attacks on our public services, um, and and now this is something, uh, and, and, and we've we've seen here in the north attacks their block grant um, year on year. Um, and this is this is a, a further attack on those um, over seventy five living in, within our communities. So on that basis, we're happy to um, support the proposal. Thanks. Thank you, um, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Sean Harkin. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, uh, people for profit are also uh, happy to support this motion, and uh, want to thank uh, Councillor Dobbins for bringing it in. And as uh, everybody is aware, we we passed a very very strong motion uh, uh, in the last uh, in the, over the last year uh, condemning this. And I would remind Councillor uh, Alderman uh, uh, Devaney that he indeed initiated the discussion, but didn't end up back in the motion that we passed because. Uh, we actually uh, put the blame where it belongs, where the, with the British government, uh, who ultimately are responsible for this cut, one that the BBC should have refused to enact. Uh, and we did call for support for anybody, uh, anybody over 75 who would refuse to pay uh, on that basis, because this is an, unju an unjust uh, attack on uh, the, the elderly. Uh, and I think everything Councillor Dobbins said is uh, every reason why this shouldn't be happening. And unfortunately, the uh, pandemic didn't allow us uh, to properly put the spotlight on this uh, as we neared the date for the uh, end of the free license fee for over 75s. So hopefully this is not the end of this. Uh, I think we want to see uh, a campaign to reverse this decision. Uh, it should be reversed. The Tories have broken a promise that they made that this wouldn't happen. Uh, and I think that we should all be united in supporting people who are campaigning against this. Um, and uh, and take an action around it. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Councillor Harker. Members, as I've said, um, we're not getting much um, in the way of anyone going against any Councillor Dobbins' uh, proposal. So I'm going to take that as read um, and move on to the next um, speaker, who is Alderman Dar Darren Guy. Alderman Guy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to ask members. Um, I would like to withdraw my motion um, after speaking with Philip on um, the various as aspects of uh, entertainment licences. We have agreed to remove the motion to have it referred to September Health and Communities meeting, um, where Seamus will bring a paper to the committee uh, with uh, arrangements on how we could take this forward. So, I'd just like uh, everybody to agree, if it's okay for me to remove my motion. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, um, Alderman Guy. Members, um, Alderman Guy suggesting that he would remove his motion for obvious reasons. Um, everybody happy enough with that? Yeah. Oh, my. There we go. Sorry, members, I flicked screens there. Next indicated speaker is Councillor Rory McHugh. Councillor McHugh. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Really, yeah. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, or Mayor. Sorry. Um, members may recall back in September 2019, um, I brought a motion to the floor of the chamber uh, calling for a soft uh, opt out uh, donor, donation, donor donation scheme to be brought in here in the north in line with uh, Scotland, England, and Wales. And thankfully, that was, was passed. So, uh, on the back of the announcement yesterday from the Health Minister, Robin Swan, I would like to welcome the fact that he is going to public consultation on bringing in a scheme here. And particularly like to welcome the fact that it's around implementing the scheme. It's not if there's going to be uh, a scheme here. And obviously this will come as good news to those people. I think here in the North there's around upwards of 100 people on a, on the organ donation waiting list here, and uh, not least young Dahi McGowan, who came here to this council to lobby for us uh, to call for this scheme to be brought in. So, Chairman, <coughs> I'd like to welcome that announcement yesterday, and I would like to propose that we further now write to the Minister uh, of Health uh, asking for clarity and pressing him to uh, bring in the scheme as, as soon as is possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor McHugh. Um, I would agree with a, a lot of what you said. I was going to ask for a second, but I see uh, Councillor Duffy is seconding uh, your proposal. Members, if um, anyone is against this, can they make it make me aware now? Otherwise, I'm going to take it as read. No? Okay. Thank you, um, Councillor McHugh. Thank you. Moving on, um, Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I simply wanted very briefly to mention Paddy Coyne. And uh, for those who, uh, for whom to mean the name doesn't immediately strike a, a bell, Paddy Coyle, who died on Friday of last week, six days ago, is the young man, child really, uh, who is pictured on a, a gable wall in Rostrell Street, uh, holding a palm and wearing a, a gas mask. It is an image from uh, 1969. Uh, and I wanted to mention it largely because you know, Mr. Coyle was a very quiet person himself, and I've never known him over all the years to try to draw attention to himself, or indeed to have his role sort of in the uh, history of this city uh, acknowledged. He never uh, uh, wanted that, but that uh, a mural has become a global symbol of struggle for civil rights and of resistance uh, uh, to oppression in uh, the state. And that's all I wanted to say, really. I thought it would be wrong, sort of, uh, the first council meeting after a uh, Paddy Coyle's death. It would be wrong if we did not acknowledge his death and, indeed, the, the life that he led, sort of, in a quiet and unassuming assuming way. We should be uh, grateful to him. So I just wanted to say, Derry should remember Paddy Coyle. You, um, Councillor McCann, um, for, for that, uh, I remember as a, a young boy running around the box, I went seeing that mural 
Um, I often wondered uh, who that person was. Many years after it, then I, I actually seen the, the the photograph taken shortly after it, where he had the the, the, the gas mask off. And I think you're right. Um, Paddy Coyle lived a very um, quiet life um, and didn't uh, jump up and down um, searching for headlines. But obviously, um, on behalf of everyone at Derry City and Stormont District Council, we extend our sympathies and condolences to his wider um, family. Uh, Councillor Duffy, Sandra. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I just I just wanted to come on and be associated with um, Councillor McCann's words there. Absolutely. Um, our party would also think it's right that we acknowledge um, Paddy Coyle. Um, he is, it's an iconic image here in, in the city and, and he everything that went with it. So in terms of our party, we would like to say in our condolences as well to um, the family and wider circle there as well. So just to be associated with um, Councillor McCann's words. Thank you, um, Councillor Duffy. Uh, Alderman McClintock. Thank you, Mayor. And while every death is obviously a tragedy for a family, we do not do not in the DUP want to be associated with a mural that depicts anyone holding a petrol bomb. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alderman McClintock. Councillor Martin Riley. Uh, uh, thanks, Mayor, for letting me in. Uh, can I just concur with the comments made by uh, Councillor McCann? Uh, in relation to the importance of marking the passing of uh, Paddy Coyle. Uh, I think that that image uh, does show the city uh, during the time that it was. Uh, and, and I think that as part of the recognition of Paddy Coyle's uh, passing, we should also mark reference to the passing of the person who took the photograph, uh, Clive Limpkin, who died earlier this year in May as well. So uh, I think that it's uh, strange how fate sometimes works itself out that both the photographer and the person in the photograph both passed away in recent months. And uh, and I think that it is appropriate that this council uh, acknowledge the death of those two individuals. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor Riley. Councillor Gary Donnelly. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. Chair, can I also uh, concur with the sentiments and uh, again pass my condolences to the Coyle family and that our thoughts are with them at this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Donnelly. Members, no other indicated speakers on that topic, so we're going to move on. Um, Councillor Sean Hargan. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, we, we, uh, I wanted to just acknowledge that the mayor had uh, taken what I uh, think is a very good initiative. Uh, it was reported in the local press uh, by reaching out to uh, the Dairy Trades Council uh, uh, and also uh, contacting uh, Easton's management uh, and a few other things. Um, people will have heard that uh, Easton's have been slated for closure. And I think that this is obviously devastating news for the city. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not going to be the first or the last uh, in terms of redundancies. Uh, I, I do have a motion that addresses this, but I think uh, given that this is very, very local, um, I thought it would be useful for us to get an update from the mayor, uh, if, he, if he would, uh, in terms of the meeting that he ha held uh, and kind of some of the next steps that have been uh, planned. Thanks. Thank you, um, Councillor Harkin. Um, my, uh, as you describe it, uh, reaching out to the, the, the Trades Council uh, was something I had planned to do anyway. And uh, whenever I came on the office, um, it just so happened that it was probably accelerated a wee bit by the announcement, or the, I suppose, the pending announcement um, from uh, Easton's. You're right, we have uh, written to uh, Easton's management um, and requesting a meeting. I think um, any store um, in our city centre closing will be huge loss, but I think Easton's um, in particular will be a huge, huge loss. Um, and I want to do everything that I can um, as mayor um, to try and um, stop that or, or at least explain um, on behalf of the people of this city and district how important we hold uh, that store um, and how um, people use it on a regular basis. So I want to get that message across to you before they make a decision and before they go into their consultation period. Um, I also, as you rightly point out, I met with the Dairy Trade Council. Um, and we have uh, a few um, things in place. The Trades Council pointed out to me um, how the staff may need some support um, in terms of many of these staff won't have gone through that consultation period, won't know um, the process or the steps in the Trades Council 
um, are able to bring people around the table who will be able to help them advise them um, on how they can uh, do that and what they should look out for and things like that. So I have agreed with the Trade Council that I would um, seek to, um, in any way that we can, support uh, the staff um, and make uh, those conversations and, and give a venue for, for those conversations to happen. Obviously, with the, the time that we're in, um, it's a bit difficult to, to bring people together. So um, before we would announce um, publicly what we're doing, I want to just make sure that we can do it, um, given the, the, the restrictions and all of that. I just don't want staff thinking or hearing that, that we're doing something that we may not be able to do. So if you could just bear with me um, while we work through the health and safety arrangements of, of all of this, um, then once we, we, we can get an understanding of what we can do, um, we, we will um, make people aware. Uh, but that's the update that I've got. Um, Councillor Herkin, I'm sure um, members will um, hopefully agree that as a council um, and certainly as, as mayor, we should be doing all we can to number one to um, put a strong voice across for the staff and agencies and them to do all we can to prevent the closure of that store, but also um, that store as equals doing all we can to support the staff and agencies. And as you rightly point out, if that happens in other stores across our city and district, we should be. Doing and to help them as well. That's that's the update, Councillor Harkin, um, and that's uh, related to the outcome of, of that meeting that you're talking about. Happy enough? Yeah. yeah. Alderman Kerrigan. Uh, Mayor. Yeah. I don't think it has been raised. It's uh, just in regards to a, a scheme there that has been implemented in some of the other council areas, to the wildflowers. Now, it's, uh, the information I've got, I spoke to some uh, council officers that they, they, they don't currently uh, use this system. I spoke to other councils as well. I have spoke to a professor, Marcus Malley, about it, a conservation manager, and there's a lot to it. It is an environmentally... Um, System which is implemented, and uh, there is a environment scheme which they're implementing as well now. To be able to claim so, and it's one where my information they're giving me, uh, Arma Ambridge and Craig Avon Council, is that there were sections of ground which they were cutting up on to 18 times a year, and they're now twice a year uh, as a result of having the planting the wildflower seeds. So it's just something I think would be looked at, that uh, council can take a look at it. I would have raised it on the e &R, but I don't sit in the e &R committee. I don't want to be going one's air due to the cold frictions. So it's uh, just the case there. That could be looked at and possibly we can of the ground, which can us, uh, or other uh, that you could also work with the and the FI roads to identify certain wee parts. That's all it is. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alderman Kerrigan. Um, Councillor Duffy, is it on this issue, Councillor Duffy? Yeah, it's on this issue. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. And no, it's, it's just on that issue, and I would be supportive of that. And it's it's something that I had raised in ENR around um, a pollinator plan, and I know that um, Dr. Christina Doherty had been doing a lot of work on that, and it's all included within the. The green infrastructure plan. So there, ha I mean, the council has been very proactive on that. Um, but it, it's it's it is a really good idea, and we should be doing everything we can. Wildflower meadows are absolutely beautiful, and if we can incorporate them, we should where we can. We should definitely be incorporating them. But I know a lot of work has been done on it um, to date. Thank you, um, Councillor Duffy, Councillor Martin Riley. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, very quickly, just to support Alderman Kerrigan's uh, proposal and uh, agree with Councillor Duffy's comments, uh, and also just to raise an issue in relation to uh, council-owned land at the Waterside Greenway. It's a similar issue, except it's not necessarily on uh, on the flowers and such, but there is young trees in that area that unfortunately have uh been damaged I'm, I'm not suggesting that they've been vandalized but uh they they have came uh have had damage to stay into them uh in winds recently etc so could officers look at the trees at the waterford park uh junction with the uh, waterside greenway uh, because there are some young trees there that are in a perilous condition 
that overhang onto the walkway. Uh, so if officers could give that attention, uh, and I'm happy to liaise with the relevant officer uh, on uh, at location. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor Riley. Uh, I know John wants to uh, come on there, so over to you, John. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I know Karen Phillips is on the call and we could probably say an awful lot more about this, but um, just to be uh, very quick about it, we, we do actively plant a number of wildflower meadows and there are a number of places across the council area where we are um, desisting from cutting grass at particular times of year to encourage wildflowers. Um, there is always a lot more we can do, of course, and uh, I'm sure from, from these comments today, Karen and colleagues would be happy to bring a full report into a subsequent ENR committee. So we will do that. And uh, of course, um, uh, Councillor Reddy, we will look at those trees uh, on Waterside Greenway. So thank you very much, members, for your comments. Thank you. Um, John. Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Chair, my, my uh, issue is about the proposed uh, testing of fireworks uh, at the back of Cregan uh, the other night. And it's it's regards there there seemed to be uh, a bit of ambiguity, and uh, I was contacted by some uh, animal owners who were concerned, uh, particularly some uh, ray, greyhound uh, racing enthusiasts who didn't who weren't uh, you know consulted about this, and uh, some other people who who have uh, livestock in the area. Uh, there was a bit of a discrepancy about whether it was the sheriff's mountain area or uh, in an area called Piggery Ridge. But, uh, and, and I know that, that, that residents of Cregan Heights who, who, you know, some of them have young children and some of them are animal domestic uh, pets. And they were, they were concerned too that they hadn't been consulted or, or told. Uh, so I think that if we already plan this type of activity again, I think that there needs to be proper consultation you know, I know some youth groups had it on, on the website, but I know others where our community organisations hadn't heard. And myself as a councillor for area, you know, unless I missed it in an email or, or something, but uh, I wasn't aware of it until I was contacted by some animal owners. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Burke. Thank you, Chair. Um I just want to put on the on record as well that there was groups approached on it, but they weren't asked to carry out any consultation on behalf of council. So they weren't asked to kind of go and speak to any residents. So I just want that put on record because there was community and youth groups informed, but they were just informed on it. They weren't asked to engage or consult anyone. Thanks. Thank you, um, Councillor Burke. Members, that's all the members who have contacted me um, in terms of chairperson's business. I know that um, Councillor Michaela Boyle asked a question in the chat group, right. uh, which Theresa has answered. Councillor Boyle, are you happy that um, that question has been answered, I suppose? Yeah, yeah, I am, Mayor, and thank you for that. And thanks for Theresa uh, for looking into that for me. And it's just I would want to be keeping an eye um, on it. And if there is a letter or a response that comes through during recess to inform members of it. Thank you, Mayor. Of our um, councillor Boyle, thank you. Members, moving on, item number six um, is the confirmation of the open minutes of the Thursday, the full council meeting Thursday, the 21st of June, and the pages 1 to 50 um, in terms of accuracy. Can I have a proposer and a seconder, please? Who's Mayor John Boyle? Thank you, uh, councillor. John Boyle proposing. I'll second it, Mayor Morris here. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. Um, and the same pages again, members, pages 1 to 50 for matters arising. Um, Councillor Dobbins has indicated there she wants to come on. Matters arising, Chair. Yeah, matters arising, Chair. Um, Chair, can I just have a, uh, an update with regard to page 16, C169 slash 20, please? Thank you. Bear with me a wee minute. Please. Before we get an update, could I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Councillor Duffy. Yeah, um, in terms of the Community Crisis Intervention Service, and I know I have raised it at several meetings recently, the last being the Health and Communities meeting, 
um, where at that meeting the, the request for um, an updated request to meet with the minister hasn't been actioned. But I do know from the steering group yesterday that um, it was discussed there and it was felt from the steering group that the minister should not just meet with councillors and the steering group, but they should also meet with local MLA. So if that could be included in it, um, because I think that any meeting um, with the minister should include um, our local MLAs. I have been asking for this meeting since February. Um, I think it's a, a, it's a disgrace that we haven't had any response to it at this stage. We are now in the end of July. We're coming up. Well, it, it should have been closed if, if the money had ran out at the end of June. But we're coming up again to the cliff age of us having no funding for it. And I think it's an absolute disgrace and it's an insult to the councillors in this virtual chamber. It's an insult to the steering group and it's an insult to the people of our city and district that the minister hasn't at this stage um, agreed to a meeting with us. And I would hope um, that the minister will um, engage with us over the, the month of August. We will make ourselves available. I think it's vitally important and I, I would um, make that proposal that the MLAs are included in that meeting as well. Thank you, um, Councillor Duffy and Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Duffy, my apologies there. Um, I was scrambling through my iPad looking for the, the exact minute when, when you began speaking. I did um, hear you mention that something wasn't actioned yet, um, but I, I didn't I quite catch what it was you were suggesting wasn't acted. At health, at health and communities, um, two weeks ago, I asked had the request gone in um, for the updated request for the meeting with the minister, and it hadn't at that stage. So I just wanted to make sure that that request has gone in. It is going back February um, when I first made the request that we meet with the minister. Okay, um, I'm sure that'll be included. Mayor, just checking if Karen McFarland is on the line, if she can shed any light on any updates there. Um, members, uh, Mayor, um, you are correct that the steering group met yesterday. Um, they have reviewed the economic appraisal that has been updated. Um, that is being submitted um, to the, the Minister of Health um, with a request um, for a meeting uh, with the steering group and with the elected representatives, if you wish um, MLAs to be included in that. Uh, we are content to take that proposal. My understanding is, Mayor, that there is separate correspondences on this issue issued by your office to reinforce that across other parts of the executive. Yeah, yeah that all the understanding will be correct. Yeah. John, can you just speak to mic, please? Excuse me. Um, but I'll give an update on that um, once there's a number of indicated speakers here. Um, first one is going to Sean Harkin. Councillor Harkin. Okay, Councillor Thanks, Keyser. Thanks, oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, uh, regarding. It's a different issue from the uh, community. Uh, no, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, can we just wait? And That's fine. Yeah, with, no a, with the same issue. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Councillor Keyser, is yours on the crisis intervention service? Uh, Mayor, yeah, it's just in connection with, with uh, something that Councillor Duffy said there, and I just wanted to make a note of it on behalf of our part of the SDLP, uh, just with reference to. Um, the MLA is being included to in, uh, invitations where uh, ministers um, are being brought to the city and district. Um, just recently there, there was a ministerial um, uh, visit by the uh, communities minister. And unfortunately, our MLAs were not invited. Uh, I believe that was remiss. We were told la later that it was an administrative error. So just to put that on record, that the SDLP would have been more than willing and able to attend that meeting. And just in case anybody thinks that we were uh, deliberately um, not attending, so that's on record that the SDLP MLAs uh, were not invited because of an administrative error. So just wanted to put that on record. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor Kuzak. Councillor Martin Riley. Well, my item is uh, not related to that particular item. It's under other items, so I'll, I'll happy to come in in due course. Okay, uh, Councillor Riley. Thank you, um, Councillor Dobbins. Um, go ahead, Angela. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry. 
I was actually asking about it, an update. I was aware that uh, the minister uh, had come here. So were was our were you not invited um, to this to this meeting? I, I would just like an update as to where it does sit with with regard to this. Um, I, I would just assume that okay it would have been it was on the request of uh, Councillor Duffy on the the last month's meeting. That is what I'm talking about. No, no, what, well, nothing else. But surely, if a minister had come down, was was you as mayor, you know, not not even invited in that. So I'd just like an update on that as to who was invited. No, right, thanks. Angela, Angela, the mayor. Excuse me, excuse me, Councillor Duffy. Councillor Duffy, excuse me, excuse me, Councillor Duffy. Um, we'll not be having driving across a, a virtual chamber. Thank you. Um. Professor Dobbins asked me for an update, um, and Karen has pointed out I have written to. Uh, I've met with the uh, external community crisis intervention service, and I agreed in the outcome of that meeting that I would write and request a meeting with the minister, three different ministers: um, the minister for justice, the minister for infrastructure, and the minister for police. Those letters have been sent, and they have been followed up because um, we hadn't received a response. Today, um, I received a response from the Minister for Infrastructure. Um, we, are, the staff in the Mayor's office, are um, working with the staff in the, the Minister's office to try and get a, a diary date, uh, which suits um, both of us. So I'm hoping that that meeting will take place very shortly. I haven't received a response from uh, the Department for Communities or the sorry, the Minister for Communities or the Minister for Justice. Um, and to answer your question bluntly, no, I wasn't invited to um, meet with the minister when she was in the city last week, despite my um, request for a meeting with her. Um, so that I hope that answers your question. I was disappointed that I wasn't that I didn't pick up that opportunity, but hopefully um, we followed up on the letter, and hopefully she'll be able to take up pretty soon. Excuse me, Councillor Dobbin. Excuse me. Um, as Councillor Duffy has pointed out, we are running out um, towards the end of our funding, um, and it's vital that we get the opportunity um, to speak to all the ministers um, who we believe have a response. And we can get it sorted. Um, uh, Councillor Duffy had indicated to speak there. Councillor Duffy. Thank you, and I welcome your update, um, Mayor. Um, but just for clarity's purposes, my request in February was for a meeting with the Minister for Health. Um, the Minister for Health did come to the city um, in June. He did meet with the, the Mayor, Brian. Um, he did not inform any of the other MLAs. Maybe he had an administrative error as well. So my request in February was for a meeting with the Minister for Health, and I would still like that meeting to be held. And I think it's insulting to the people of Derry that that meeting hasn't happened at this stage. I think. Um, well, I, I don't know. I was certainly clear on what um, you were, your request um, to include MLAs was, Councillor Duffy, and as Karen has pointed out, um, that will be included um, in the letter going uh, forward. Alderman, uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Keir Maguire has indicated to speak. Councillor Maguire, is it on the same issue or a separate? I'm oh, sorry, separate issue. Um, Alderman McClintic, same issue. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Very, very briefly, yeah. just to put on record as well that our MLA wasn't invited to the meeting. I know we're going out in circles about it, but just to put on record that we, our MLA was not invited to that meeting about the Community Crisis Centre either. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor McClantic, thanks for that. Um, Alderman Guy, I suppose you weren't invited either. <laughs> I was invited to that one. Right? So, right. Uh, no, I just want to say that. Uh, it was very last minute, the meeting that we had with the health minister, along with the mayor. Um, and as you well know, these things happen. I, I, I'd be very much up for a meeting with the health minister. I'd also be, I, but I think these things, and it's been said before by the health minister, that it's very cross-departmental, this. And we as a council need to come together and search ways of funding for the CCIS. Uh, as it's happened, the councillor Duffy says, there is only a few months, I think it's at the end of August, is it? September. September, and we're running out of time again. 
Um, I think it, it's just not the health department we need to be looking at money for here. You know, there's the finance department as well, who hold the purse strings. So let's see them go step up the plate here. Thanks, Bear. Okay, um, Alderman Guy, thank you very much. Members, um, I think that's all indicated speakers on that. Uh, Eamon, I've got you down. Um, I had indicated there just to come on after Darren. And no, I have come on a couple of times. So if you don't yes, want to. If you have, so if you, <laughs> if you can come very quickly. Um, very, very, very quickly, I will say that the health minister did bid um, to the finance minister for additional money. He received additional money. He received 90 million, but he only bid for 1.5 million for mental health. He didn't even include in the bid money for the crisis intervention service. So for the finance minister to give the health minister money to fulfill his obligation in terms of the community crisis intervention service, the health minister has to ask for it. Thank you, um, Councillor Duffy. Members, moving on, um, the next indicated speaker that I have is Councillor Sean Harkin on a separate issue on the minutes of full council, just so people remember where we're at. Um, the minutes of full council, pages 1 to 50. Councillor Harkin. Thank you, uh, Chair. This is in regard to um, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, I need to find the minutes there. Uh, can you let uh, Councillor McCann go ahead of me there? Thanks. Well, there's a list. I'll let the next speaker go ahead of you. Right, thank you. you. Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, uh, Chair. Chair, my uh, matter is C178 forward slash 20, page uh, 22. And I'm just wondering, is there an update on the report between the connections uh, between Council and Unity of Purpose, including uh, funding? Mayor, I might come in there. That report we will bring to Governance and Strategic Planning Committee, uh, Councillor Donnelly, at the uh, beginning of September, just after the recess. And Mayor, just for the record, I wasn't invited either, but that's not surprising. There you go, James. Well, moving on, members, um, Councillor Riley. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, I, I have a number of items under the previous meeting to raise, uh, so if you bear with me. Um, the first one is uh, C167 forward slash 20, um, it's page 6. It's in relation to the point I raised um, uh, about a local community radio station. Um, I'm wondering if you have any update on that item. Uh, so that's C167 slash 20. Um, on the second item is page two of the minutes from the last meeting and it's C164 slash 20 about care homes and the, the, the discussion that we had about RQIA. I'm conscious in the chat box, Councillor Michaela Boyle has asked if there's any update. Uh, my question on that is whether we have had any uh, indication or uh, any update in relation to whether members of the community are entitled to go and visit their loved ones in care homes. Um, I think that that's becoming an issue uh, in, in other places and I'm wondering if this council uh, could write to the health minister and indeed the independent uh, health and care providers to see uh, what their plans are for allowing visitors to go and visit their loved ones who are in care uh, because especially for people with dementia i think that there is an issue there uh, about allowing people to have uh, access to uh, family visits and we all know the concerns around coronavirus uh, but, but also uh, the care homes should be allowing and facilitating visitors uh, especially for people uh, who uh, are forgetful and uh, and that brings benefits for the person in the care home but also for the family member uh, who wants to come and visit them so uh, I, i'd like to propose that the council writes to both the minister for health and the uh, the independent health and care providers just seeking uh, their position on visiting for uh, those that are in care homes um i'm conscious you need a seconder for that uh, proposal but when i have the mic i'll move on to the third item that i have from the minister the last item um the last meeting, which is C177 forward slash 20, and uh, that's the Minutes of Business and Culture. 
yesterday and at the Business and Culture Committee on the 9th of June, uh, there was a proposal uh, about writing to uh, the, um, uh, the various different businesses across the council area. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, the, if Stephen Gillespie's on the line or somebody from council could give us an update on what's happening in relation to that item. Uh, so if Stephen could give us that update, please, and then I'll come back in and hear the update. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Um, just in, before I bring Stephen in, in relation to the meeting um, or the, the minute um, in connection with um, your request that I meet with 3105, um, I've had that meeting um, and I had a, some officer support with me um, while, whilst we were going through it. Um, it's my understanding that officers are working through and working with um, 3105 to see um, how we can um, best offer support for Councillor Riley. At this stage, um, the best comment that I can give is that it is a work in progress, and as soon as we have anything, we'll uh, we'll, we'll bring it back. Um, I'm going to bring Stephen Gillespie. Is he is he on the line? Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Here. So, in relation to the update, in relation to the letter that was to go to all employers, um, there was an original letter, and then there was a, a follow up letter that went to a list of approximately fifty six organizations and uh, large scale employers, the care homes, and uh, also the, the local call centers or contact centers. So that letter included the, the issues raised by council. The wider list that uh, that was referred to at the, for that last council meeting, which included all employers, community groups, social economy sector, voluntary sector, we're currently working our way through the database, we don't hold the database of all of those contacts and, and members would understand that we, we have a, a number of da databases that have some of those contacts, but we wouldn't have a comprehensive database. So we're trying to pull all that information together. I mean, there's approximately 5,000 registered businesses in the Derry City and Shaban District Council alone. So there's a large number of, of employers and, and, and community groups social economy groups, et cetera. Um, the other concern in the middle of all that is obviously GDPR. So not a lot of the information we have has been provided to council for a specific reason and not necessarily for this reason. So therefore we have to be very careful as we go through those lists that we, we don't identify any individual and we send the, the letter to a generic, uh, either general manager or whatever that happens to be, or if it's an email, it'd be an, an info at. So we're working our way through those lists, trying to combine them. There's quite a considerable amount of work, as, as members would understand. So we'll probably take us a couple of weeks to get that full list as, as full as we can together. And then the letter will go out to all of those groups. So that's the, the update we have. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, Councillor Riley. Yeah, uh, thanks, Stephen, for the update. Um, I, I'm just conscious that uh, if you're saying that that's you say around five thousand businesses that we that we need to try and uh, collate a, a database for, and and if there's GDPR uh, complications uh, with how we do that. Um, in previous times, the council had, um, when this type of issue was involved about writing to all businesses, uh, we had indicated that the best way to do it and, and the most cost effective way in terms of officer time and indeed cost. Uh, in terms of mailing out things, uh, was to put it through the um, the, the council newsletter that circulated uh, out on a on a regular basis. Uh, you know, it gives the the issue some prominence if it's in our document that we're sending out uh, to repairs and, and businesses across the city and region. Uh, it, it strikes me that that's probably maybe a better way of dealing with it because uh, it, it's more cost effective in terms of officer time and indeed the cost to the council uh, for, uh, for for doing that piece of work. Um, thanks. Thank you, um, Councillor Riley. Councillor Harkin. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and I have already had a discussion about this and um, uh, that my understanding is that, uh, and I think what we've agreed to as a council is that we send this out to every employer individually. And that doesn't mean it goes out in a stuffed envelope, that it can be sent out uh, through email. Uh, and that's probably an easier way right now to uh, engage with uh, employers in the district uh, as far as widens we can. 
And I would also say that, like, it seems to me that we should have a database uh, as a council to be able to re outreach to employers if we wanted to contact them regarding a health and safety issue or anything like that. So I, I actually think that this is a, a supremely important issue, um, that the message needs to go to uh, employers that, uh, that this council's um, for workers having a collective voice in the workplace and that we want a direct we want that sent message sent directly to them and we want the direct response from employers uh, i'm hearing stories right now of uh you know people being told they're going to be fired if they mention the word union in our district at employers where uh these people are seen as uh you know the great and the good in the city and this is just unacceptable especially now when we see uh the the you know the, the worry around these redundancies there has to be a, a voice for workers trade unions traditionally have played that role uh, and so we have to send a clear message to employers that uh, their workers um, the people who do the work that creates their uh, revenue streams uh, should have the right to join a trade union and far too many employers don't respect that right now and that's what this letter is about um, and I, I think we have to make sure that we uh, that this isn't lost um, that it's not uh, seen uh, if you want to see it that there's a very clear message coming from the council because uh, we voted on this and many other uh, motions in support of trade unionism that uh, we expect employers um, especially the biggest employers uh, in the city uh, and in the district uh, respect uh, the democratic right of workers to join a trade union to have a collective voice and so it seems to me the most effective way to do that is for each employer as to the best of our ability to receive um, the letter that we've uh, put together uh, and that with the agreed language that will be the, and, and then ask for a response. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Harkin. Stephen, have you anything to add? Um, no, Mayor. I mean, in terms of we can continue to pull the database together, it's up to it's really up to members how we issue it i mean i'm happy to we are looking at email addresses where we can so we're, where we can get those so we'll continue to do that if that's the request of members stephen thank you um for that Councillor really i know that you're suggesting that i go into the the easing or um are you making that a proposal well i, I was off the back of what stephen had said initially the the fact that it uh, that the database currently doesn't exist uh, that is going to take a number of weeks to pull it together and the fact that he's saying that it's going to be around five thousand or so businesses it, it occurred to me that a, a more cost effective way of dealing with it and, and a timelier way of getting the message out and i take on board what councillor harkin's saying about the motion we, we voted in favor of the motion when it came in uh, we, we we know that there's another motion on the agenda this evening uh, on a similar issue that we intend to support as well so so we get the importance of it that's why i think it's better if it gets out to the businesses uh, as fast as possible in terms of the that messaging uh, and, and, and in my view, it, it, it achieves the same purpose if we put it in the in the council messaging uh, that, that we do corporately, because that's where most businesses are likely to, to pay attention to what is sent out, uh, as opposed to sending it to an info at um, business address that, that may not have the same uh, type of impact. So, so I, I think that in this virtual chamber or in the physical chamber, we have the opportunity to speak out. We, we can do that ourselves as local councillors in any event about the importance of workers' rights. Uh, and, and we do that. We've supported the motion uh, previously. We'll support similar motions today. But I think in terms of getting this move forward, uh, you know, uh, it, it strikes me that that's the best way, the fastest and the most effective way to do it. So if, you, if it needs to be a proposal, yes, happy to, to make it a proposal, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, um, before we move on, there's two other indicated speakers, but before we move on, can I get a seconder for that proposal? Please? I was coming in to second it, to be honest. Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, you're next on the list, anyway. Constant, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, so no, in terms of everything that Martin has um, outlined there, um, we don't have the database, and that's that's very clear to see it at, at this point. And it's going, to, I know from building my own databases and stuff at work, it takes a lot of time to gather that sort of information together. So I think the two can go in tandem. 
we should be building the databases so that we have that information. But at this stage, for the for the sake of expediency and getting information out, um, we should use the scene. Um, and then once we have further information, we can then build upon that. But at at, the, at this point, in terms of workers' rights and all the rest, with the 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 fastest way that we can get this out is in terms of um, Councillor Reddy's proposal. So I would support that at this stage. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Um, Councillor Logue. Uh, just very briefly, um, Mayor, thank you very much for letting me in. And it's just more to, to concur with the previous two speakers. I think we should uh, proceed uh, with this motion as quickly as possible, um, but that at the same time, we should uh, strive to build the, uh, the database and put it out in the, the easing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lowe. Um, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, it's, it's, the motion was passed uh, and it's a corporate position of Council. So I would be thinking that the Council should be using every avenue possible to get the message out that Council supports workers. To see uh, under this pandemic and COVID and all the rest, we've seen a lot of businesses close. We've seen a, a lot of workers feeling unsecure, uh, receiving threatening emails, and they don't know where they stand as a worker individually. And a lot, a lot of uh, scrupulous employers are using the blanket of COVID to manipulate workers. And as a corporate body, we should not be standing by and letting it happen. We need to get the message out that workers see us as a corporate body supporting the working class that underpin this entire district. They underpin the infrastructure. And we need to get every avenue, not seeking one avenue or another. We seek them all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, I'm Councillor Gallagher. Um, for, the, for that, members, there's a proposal on the floor from Councillor Riley, seconded by Councillor Duffy. Um, I'm assuming we're going to have to take a vote on this. So, Councillor Harkin wants to come on. Councillor Harkin, go ahead. Mayor, look, uh, I, I actually support the proposal of sending it out on the easing. Um, and I, if, if Councillor Riley and, and the others who are back on this proposal can clarify what they're suggesting, because what Stephen uh, reported was that it would take a couple of weeks to put together the database. That's fine with me. So uh, I think we should send it out on all communications. It's already been sent out to some employers. So we can't have uh, easing for some and then uh, individual letters for others. So I would, in addition, so we can get clarification on that, because I, I, I would be against the idea that we drop the database and only send it out in the easing. If it's uh, that we will do both, I'm very much in favour of it. And, and we do it on the time frame that uh, the that uh, Stephen Gillespie mentioned, because that seems fair to me. But I also want to propose that it go out uh, through a press release sent out by the council to all press in the district and that it go out on all the council social media platforms uh, that the letter goes out on Facebook, Twitter um, and whatever else, whatever other social media platforms that the council is on. My main concern here is that uh, this letter doesn't get buried because I know that some people might feel it's a bit awkward to tell an employer in this district, especially if some of these people are held in high esteem that they should be treating their workers with a bit of decency and not threatening to fire them if they say they want to join a trade union because there's far too many workers in the district who are on minimum wage and have uh, skills that should be earning a lot more. And there's also many workers right now who are facing redundancy and who don't have a trade union, they actually represent them. So they're in one-on-one uh, -on -one negotiations with employers who in my experience of representing workers right now Employers are Councillor Harkin. Councillor Harkin. One second, Brian. No, no, try, try. As they Excuse go me. along. Excuse me. I'm I'm chairing this meeting. Um, there's no one um, from anything that I have heard who is 
um, moving away from the sentiment of it. it the, the, the proposal from Councillor Riley, as I understand it, is about how we send it out. So we don't need um, a whole rehash of, of the reason for, for the proposal. Everyone's in agreement. Well, no, with, there is an everyone's issue in agreement, yeah, but Everyone's in agreement with, with the, the, the sentiment of it and the principle of it. It's about how we actually do it. Now, I'm going to so, ask Councillor Riley. I'm going to ask Councillor Riley. I'm going to ask Councillor Riley to clarify his proposal, which um, you had suggested that you needed. Um, Councillor Riley. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, catching the tail end of Councillor Carkin's uh, submission, um, he was indicating that people mentioned the word overturn. I was said before, say again, no one's looking to overturn anything. We supported the motion when it came in uh, back earlier in the year. Uh, we're supporting motions that are happening uh, later this evening. The point I'm making is that the the quickest and fastest way, and, and that touches on what Councillor Gallagher was saying about the fact that we're in a pandemic and workers right now need the council uh, to make it clear to them uh, and clear to employers that, that in this council area we stand up for workers' rights. So the quickest way from listening to what, uh, what Stephen Gillespie, the director, has said is to get this message out, is to put it out through the easing that is available now. And I have no issue with the database being being produced. Stephen's indicated there's D GDPR in implications which, which need to be considered. I, I don't have an issue with, uh, with the database being produced. But right now, to get the message out, the quickest way to do that is through the easing. So, so that's why I'm proposing that we do it that way. I have no uh, councillor Harkin then mentioned about social media platforms that the council has. I don't have an issue with that either. I think that that's a good way of messaging it out, consistent with the easing that we would do anyway. So, uh, in terms of all the avenues that we have, social media, the easing, uh, yes, go with all of those uh, as the quickest and most expedient way and cost effective use of ratepayers' time uh, in terms of officer time and cost to the ratepayer as well to, uh, to get the message out. So. Um, I, I'm happy. I hope that clarifies it for you, Mayor and Councillor Harkin and others. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Riley. Um, members, there is a proposal, as I said, um, on the floor from Councillor Riley, which has been seconded. Um, am I hearing any uh, dissent from the proposal? I, I, I still have a question of clarification because. Stephen said it would take two weeks to put together the list. If that's what we're agreeing to do, along with sending it out in the easing, I am fully in favour uh, of Martin's proposal. And Martin agreed with the uh, additions I made about uh, sending it out on all social media platforms and also to uh, the press. That there's a press release goes out that attaches the letter, uh, and that the sooner it goes out, the better. And that includes individual letters to all employers. Uh, that's what we've agreed already, and we can't turn that over, overturn that at this at this meeting right now. Okay, members. It's there in front of you. Um, well, it's there. We've we've heard it. We've hashed, thrashed it out long enough. Um, I'm not hearing any dissent, so uh, I'm going to take Councillor Riley's proposal as is read. Thank you. The next indicated speaker um, on those minutes is Councillor McCann. Thanks very much, Jim. Sorry, sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Sorry, Councillor McCann, just one second. Before you move on, Chair, in my earlier comments, I mentioned the issue to do with care homes, and I made a right. uh, So that needs formally seconded in the first instance and then put to the floor. Thanks. Sorry, my, my mistake, Councillor Riley. Um, you're right. Councillor Edwards has seconded. And can you just remind us what you're what your proposal actually was? Yeah, the proposal was under section C164 slash 20 for when we discussed RQIA coming to the council uh, previously in the last meeting. My proposal today is that we write to the health minister and the independent health and care providers to get clarification on their plans to allow visitors to attend care homes for the benefit of both the patient or the, the person in the care home and also the, the well-being of the per, the loved one who wants to visit uh, their family member. Okay, Councillor Riley, um, so it's, uh, it's obviously been seconded by Councillor Edwards um, and that is to, uh, I, I, as you've just outlined, members, once again, um, if I'm not hearing any dissent, I'm going to take it as read. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor McCann, 
Uh, it, I refer to C178 slash uh, 2020, uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, the question which immediately arises and may already be on some people's minds is why bring this up again? I've been asked that. Why on earth are you bringing this up for the third time in council? But it's very simple. I'm bringing it up because no explanation or justification have been given by anybody concerned as to why the Black Lives Matter protest was treated in the way that it was in stark contrast to the way other protests uh, over the same period uh, uh, have been treated. Now, let me lay out very briefly sort of the sequence of events, because we can't understand what happened and why people before profit is so concerned about it and others, that we don't get that uh, uh, tight sequence. You remember that sort of on the 4th of June, a Thursday, a statement was issued on behalf of a local group of a somewhat mysterious nature. We don't have a list of the members of it or when it met and decided to take uh, this action. Uh, it called for the cancellation of the Black Lives Matter protest two days later, that is on June uh, 6th. Move on 24 hours. On the next evening, the Justice Minister Naomi Lawn approved a measure warning that the law would be brought to bear against anybody participating uh, in protests. That is hours before, or just the evening before the Black Lives Matter protest. Here's the thing now. Within an hour of Mrs. Long making that announcement, there were policemen at the doors, and police women, sorry, at the doors of organizers of the Black Lives Matter protest in Derry, warning them about the legal implications for themselves and others if they went ahead for a, a, with the demonstration. And of course, on the day, the PSNI lived up to that warning on the day of the demonstration. June 6th, people arriving in the Guildhall found that the PSNI had blocked every entrance into Guildhall Square. Everybody entering the square was questioned as to what their business was and uh, whether they were part of the demonstration. They were warned that if they went ahead through the police cordons and took part in the Black Lives Matter demonstration, they were leaving themselves open to legal action. In the event over the next uh, hour or so, two things happened. 57 people in Guildhall Square, 57, were warned that they might be in trouble with the law if they uh, uh, stayed in Guildhall Square. Their names were taken, some were given fines on the spot, others told that they faced a, a court action. 57. The reason I keep repeating that is very simple. We've had in the same period demonstrations that are by loyalist organisations. We've had bonfires. We have, of course, had the case of the Bobby Story funeral in which hundreds and in some cases thousands of people were gathered. On, and these uh, a, a events were predicted and predictable. On not one occasion did the PSNA visit anybody's home and tell them that they'd be in trouble with the law if they went uh, ahead with it. The score stands in relation to... Uh, Councillor McCann, can I ask you to bring your remarks yeah, to a close, please? The score stands in relation to uh, uh, the Justice Minister Lawn's sort of edict and the police, uh, the PSNA actions on foot of that. The score stands at... Loyalist demonstrations, no action by the PSNA. Republican meetings, no McCann, please. Black Lives Matter, 57 and Derry and 11 in Belfast. How is this to be explained? Will somebody now explain it to me? And we stop bringing it up. I never mention it again in this council. If somebody will explain how this vast disparity, this grotesque difference between different the treatment of different organizations, I finally ask Con this question in a couple of words. And the, an objective observer who knew nothing about Councillor McCann, I'm trying. The fact um, that Black Lives Matter you, you've had Black more than enough time, Councillor McCann. To do with the way that organisation was treated. So Councillor McCann, please. Thank you, Councillor McCann. I think it was more than fair um, uh, in terms of the time yeah. um, that was allowed there. Um, and I would just ask members to, to remember that we're trying to, to get through a lot of business here and we're trying to, to, to make sure that we can get it done um, in a efficient manner. Um, Councillor McCann, I don't know um, who you want um, to answer those questions as to why um, those different um, protests and events um, were, were, were handled differently um, by the PSNA. I, um, I can't provide you with that answer, and I would suggest that you take that up with um, the, 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 the PSNA, is the best that I can do um, in this meeting. Okay, um, members, there is no further um, indicated speakers in terms of the minutes from full council.
Um, and the matters are rising. So can I get a proposal, Chair. please? Chair. Yes. Chair. Who's who's calling? McGuire, Councillor McGuire. Sorry, Kieran, you're right. You did you did call a, a bigger pardon. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. In relation to uh, C one seven zero slash slash twenty. Uh, in relation to the rural uh, work, um, I don't. I know the chief executive uh, has actioned uh, someone to have a look at it, but I would just like to maybe know what what plans he has for it. Because if we set up uh, actually a working group, it means one from each party plus an independent. Or if we set up a subcommittee, it has to be li aligned to. Uh, a committee of council so therefore you know the rural people would actually be excluded you know uh, for some so maybe there would there's probably some issues there or some other mechanism required to set up this rural uh committee or w whatever we want to call it so i was just wondering what way the chief executive was thinking of uh going to operate that because Really, what we don't want is, is, you know, two or three rural people on it, and it filled out within with other people with no interest. We would want all the rural people on it, on if, if Urban wants to come on it as well. But we, we would nearly we would need to be catering for the rural people, just so it's just one of them things that falls between two stools. And uh, uh, just like to know what way the chief executive was thinking of going about it. Well, sorry, through you, Mayor. Um, yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Councillor McGuire. There's a, a number of ways of of setting something like this up, um, and I have tasked one of the senior officers with considering the matter in the first instance, and we'll meet uh, during uh, the next couple of weeks to look at it. Ultimately, this will be a matter for members to decide um, collectively. So, what I propose to do is to is to bring back a paper into governance committee um, with a number of suggested options, and then for members uh, to take a to take a view on it at that point, uh, Councillor McGuire, um, and and to and to um, and to discuss the various um, pros and cons uh, for for each uh, type of setup, so to speak. Thank you for that, John. Um, Councillor McGuire, I hope that answers your, uh, your 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 query there. Yeah, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, and I look forward to seeing the paper. And just uh, one issue, Chair, uh, on Councillor McCann's point. Yeah, I do want to remember the family of Bobby Story, who have been forgotten in all this pol politicking and all this uh, rubbish that's been going on here. Uh, well, there is a okay. family. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor McGuire. Councillor Harkin. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, just on the issues Councillor McCann raised. Uh, first of all, uh, part of the issue is that people uh, who were fined, uh, who didn't pay their fines, now have court dates. Uh, I'm one of those people, but there's many, many other people here in Derry. Uh, and so the issue is that uh, there's been many events, but uh, this is the only group of people that are facing fines and prosecutions. So. The council should back those people. Uh, it's already called for the fines and prosecutions to be dropped. Uh, and, and I think that those court appearances are going to be coming up uh, soon. Um, and uh, we will be able to challenge them on the grounds of, uh, you know, the contradictions and the differences. So that's, I think, very important for uh, councillors to know and council to know. The second one in relation to that is uh, the Northwest Migrants Forum are organising a community walk for racial equality on Saturday at noon in St. Collins Park. Uh, very important event. Uh, obviously, this will be a socially distanced event. I would encourage people who uh, want to see racial equality to attend. Um, and then the second issue, which I, I had on earlier, Brian, that I missed was, uh, and I'll do this quickly, it's in regard to uh, C164-20, uh, the RQIA. Uh, the former uh, interim chief of the RQIA made a presentation to the Health and Community Committee a number of months ago now, um, uh, and I believe that he misled the uh, committee in relation to a question I put to him about physical inspections, and I want to get that on record, and we'll bring that to the Health and Community uh, when it re-meets again in September. 
Thank you, um, Councillor Harkin, um, for all of those points there. Um, Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me in. And I just want to go back to the comments of um, um, Councillor McGuire there regarding the story funeral as rubbish. No, we're not doing it. I'm, I'm sorry, we're not doing it. Well, I can assure um, no, you from our party, no, it's no, not we're, rubbish. We're not doing it because um, it has. No, it has I'm been not, mentioned, not, Mr. Mayor. It has been mentioned. Yes, it was mentioned. It wasn't terms, being mentioned. It, it was it mentioned. Wasn't mentioned terms, but it was mentioned in terms of. Uh, Councillor McGuire, I'm trying to remember that there's a family at the heart of this, and I'm doing the exact same, and I'm not hearing it. Um, but all the of any, I'm not. But him was intimated you, that it was rubbish. It was rubbish, continue, Mayor. If you continue, I'm going to mute your microphone, um, and, and we're moving on uh, as of now. Councillor Donnelly, if it's in relation, Councillor Donnelly, to the comments from Councillor McGuire um, around that funeral, um, before you start, I'm telling you we're not going to hear it. So, go it's, ahead. It's not there. Okay, it, thank you. I'm just. Lagging that up because you did on the around the same time as Alderman Devaney, and I was just, um, my apologies. Go ahead, Councillor Donnelly. Yeah, I think that that should be allowed to rest in peace and nobody. Yeah. You know. But my 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 point, Chair, is 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 regards uh, Councillor Harkin and his upcoming trial. I I want to make a proposal, Chair, and uh, that we send a legal uh, send a council uh, observer to the trial. Uh, to observe proceedings, I I was in Guildhall Square that day, and I too was uh, threatened by by a PSNI officer that if I went any further, then I could be getting fined. So I would like just to, that that to make a proposal that we send uh, an observer to on behalf of council to any upcoming trial. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. Um, Councillor Donnelly, I'm going to pause for a second or so. Um, and just get some advice around that proposal. You can just bear with us, members. Thank you. I just noticed that Councillor Gallagher's indicating that he will second that, but I just want to pause first of all and get some advice. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you, um, Councillor Donnelly, for, for that proposal. Um, we've paused, obviously, so I could get um, some advice, and I'm going to ask Philip to, to, to share that um, with you. Uh, Philip? Yeah, uh, Chair, there's no difficulty with an officer attending at the court in relation to any of um, Councillor Harkin's court dates, um, if he can provide details of, of when those dates are likely to be. Um, I am aware at the minute there's some uh, that the courts are not open to the public and therefore it may not be possible to have a physical attendance at the present time. I believe even defendants are not being required to attend court at the present time. But once there are open courts and they're open again to the public for attendance, we can certainly arrange at that stage for a, a, a one of the council officers to be in attendance in an observing capacity. Thank you for that, um, Philip. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll have to put the the proposal from Councillor Donnelly as well to the floor, members. But before we do that, um, Alderman Ramsey um, wants to come on. Alderman Ramsey. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, Councillor Donnelly, once again, you know, he likes his bit of showboating. Like everyone knows that the public and the public, general public, can attend any case in court. Um, you know, uh, wanting a council officer there, like any of us can go. Um, and it's just typical, really, um, just to wind things up as, as he normally does. And I just want, uh, him they realize that uh, you know all he does is wind people up older man ramsey i don't think that, that that's but, fair to be honest with you i that, i, I, that I is, you know i know that you're fact. talking about you know you're saying that any member of the public can go any member of the public can go um to that um court no, um no. And, and observe um and in normal circumstances but my understanding is the proposal from councillor donnelly is the weekend um a member of uh council is Police department um, and an observant capacity um, uh, to do that. It's not, in my view, it's not the same as a member of the public actually going um, and sitting uh, through that. So I don't think that that's fair to be to be um, attacking Councillor Donnelly like that for making a proposal. So I want to move on. 
Um, Good PR move. Well, you're not too bad at it yourself, really. Um, but we're moving on, as I've said. Um, Councillor Donnelly's proposal is on the floor. It's been seconded by Councillor Gallagher. Um, and I see Alderman Devaney coming in. Alderman Devaney. Chair, for allowing me in, and I know our party from the Democratic Unionist Party will not be supporting this proposal going forward. I think uh, as we look at council officers at the moment uh, with the COVID-19, I think they have a lot of work to do And as we look to the future of moving out of COVID-19. Those officers are all needed uh, um, uh, at their job, um, supporting communities and groups out there. So we will not be supporting the proposal. Thank you. Um Alderman Devaney. Members, there's no other indicated speaker. The proposal from Councillor Donnelly is that we send a council representative to the, the court. Hearing all... Sorry, Councillor Gallagher. Yeah, go ahead. Is that Councillor Gallagher? Yeah. yeah, it's just in regards, you know, the public versus council and all that. We need to bear in mind that Councillor Harkin is an elected member of this council. That is a big difference. He is there by, with a mandate. He's elected and he represents people. And that's what he was doing. And now he finds himself in court. And this council, as a corporate body, should be there observing and reporting back to this council on what happens an elected member for representing people. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Gallagher. Um, and that will is what will happen. If this proposal is carried, and once we put it to you, um, and as I say, it is that we send a, a legal representative to the court um, hearing of Councillor Sean Hargan. Um, and Councillor Hargan will engage with um, the appropriate people in council to make them aware of that date. Members, I'm going to put it to the floor. Um, obviously, we're, we're going to have to call a vote because Alderman Devaney suggested that the Democratic Unionist Party aren't going to support it. So, um, John, over to you for the, the vote, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, the proposal, um, the Mayor has made very clear. Um, so, Alderman Bresland. Alderman Bresland. Alderman Devaney. Against. Alderman Guy. Against. Alderman Carrigan. Against. Alderman McClintock. Against. Alderman McCready. Against. Alderman McCain. Against. Alderman Ramsey. Alderman Ramsey. Against. Alderman Wark. Against. Councillor Jason Barr. For. Uh, Councillor John Boyle. For. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Councillor Burke. For John. Councillor Carr. For John. Councillor Cooper. For John. Councillor Cusick. For John. Councillor Dobbins. For John. Councillor Donnelly. For. Councillor Duffy. For. Councillor Durkin. For. Councillor Edwards. For John. Councillor Farrell. For. Councillor Ferguson. Abstain. Councillor Fleming. Councillor Fleming. Councillor Gallagher. John. Councillor Harkin. Or. Councillor Jackson. Or. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Kelly. Or John. Councillor Logue. Or. Councillor McCann. Councillor McCann. Can you hear me? I yeah. can. Or. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor McCluskey. Or. Councillor McGuire. Or. Councillor McHugh. Or John. Councillor McKeever. Or. Councillor McKinney. Against John. Councillor Mellon. For. Councillor Mooney. For. 
Councillor Riley. John. Councillor Tierney. Four. Thank you. Okay, members, the uh, result of that vote was 28 in four, 10 against, and one abstention. So that proposal um, is carried. Um, Councillor Harkin, I note that you have said briefly, and I hope it is. Very briefly, I just want to thank uh, Councillor Donnelly for that proposal and for uh, the vote in favour. And really, this isn't about me, uh, it's about the many people who've been fined, and it sends a message that uh, the Council is on their side, and also to the members of the BAME community who, who organised these protests, uh, and I think that they uh, were uh, for a just cause. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Members, we're moving on. Um, no other indicated speaker in those minutes, so we're moving on to item number eight, and that is the adoption of the open minutes of the special meeting of the Environment Regeneration Committee, held on Monday, the 6th of July, uh, pages 51 the 6th. For accuracy, can I get a proposer and a seconder, please? Propose, Brian, Andy. I second, I second that, Mayor John Boyd. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, and for matters arising, <laughs> uh, Councillor Donnelly, can I propose Councillor Carr for the working group? Yeah. Can we just ask what working group? I'll have it in front of me, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, page 57, SER 14 forward slash 20. There's uh, nominations for a, a working group. It's a signage at the recycling centres. It's the heading. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, and you're nominating Councillor Kiar. Um, thank you very, very much. Members, if there's no other matters arising, um, 8B. Is the monthly governance and strategic planning committee held on Chair, Tuesday? The Chair, Chair, just before you move off the environment one, could I just come in just for a quick break, just to just to thank that department for the recent intervention around lifting many tires uh, up up behind the Craig in there and um, was known as Piggery Ridge. Uh, the intervention of of Connor and and John and the team. I. Uh, has gone a long way to prevent preventing the burning of tyres and air pollution in that area. So, just like to put it on the record of thanking that department there. Thank you, um, Councillor Gallagher. Um, your points will be noted, and those and those words of thanks will be passed on. Governance to strategic planning member held on Tuesday the thirtieth of June, pages sixty three to eighty. For accuracy, please. Proposer and a seconder. I propose it. Yes, seconded. On President, and who was that seconded? Sorry, Guy, okay. Councillor Guy. Councillor Guy. Um, and for the same pages, remember 63 to 80 for matters arising. No matters arising. Um, C is the monthly planning committee held on Wednesday, the 1st of July, pages 81 to 92. 
I'll take a lift. I need someone to propose it first. Propose it, Councillor Kerrigan. Second it. Proposed by Councillor Kerrigan and seconded by Alderman Breslin, I think that was. Matters arising from those pages. None. Item D is the monthly planning committee reconvened held on Thursday, the 2nd of July, pages 93 to 106. Proposal and seconder. I propose those. Chair uh, John Boyle. I'm sorry, John sorry, Boyle. Sorry, sorry, Mayor. Seconder. Chair, under accuracy. We have Councillor Kelly, I think that is. Thank you, yeah, thank you Chair. Uh, just in relation to the um, application for the discharge of condition on at the, the bottom half of page 102, it doesn't have a reference number, uh, but uh, at the beginning of that uh, application, I did ask for legal advice to be entered into the record in terms of uh, applications that hadn't previously been circulated uh, to members uh, when they had been newly validated coming to the committee. And the advice from uh, the lead legal services to uh, the generality of the provisions of the protocol for the operation of the planning committee. Whilst there was a moot point because this application came to the committee, for other applications, it's not, and I think that advice should have been entered into the minutes. And I would ask that they would be added to the minutes at this stage. Okay, Councillor Kelly, um, those, uh, that advice um, can be added onto them. Thank you. Any, thank you. Um, any other matters arising from D, the reconvened planning committee? No. Okay. E is the monthly business and culture committee held on the 7th of July. It is 107 to 114 for accuracy. Can I have a proposal and a seconder, please? Happy to propose, Brian. Councillor McCluskey. Seconded, Mayor. I think that was Alderman Kerrigan. Guy, maybe. Alderman Guy, okay. Um, for matters arising, is that Councillor Farrell? Are you looking at for matters arising? Councillor Farrell? Yeah, well, it was actually in the accuracy of the minutes, uh, specifically BC 8920, um, relating to the, the proposal I made in Chair's business. Um, the re proposal as recorded in the minutes isn't strictly accurate. Um, by way of background, the, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer announced $1.5 billion for culture, arts and heritage organisations. And the Barnet consequential for Northern Ireland was $33 million. Um, As everybody knows, the executive is under no obligation to spend that money in cultural organisations. Um, the proposal in the minutes is pretty simplistic, but my proposal was actually twofold. Uh, one was that we lobby the executive to ensure that the, the entire $33 million actually goes down to cultural organisations, arts organisations and individuals. And the second element of my proposal was that <coughs> council lobby DFC or whatever agency is tasked with delivering that uh, fund to ensure that venues, organisations and individuals across our council area uh, get a fair share of that funding. Uh, what I don't want to see is that the lion's share of this funding goes to Belfast, to the Lyric, the MAC, the Ulster Orchestra, etc. And then very worthy organisations across our city and district are left fighting for crumbs. Um, I've already sent this to um, the Business and Culture Directorate, uh, so I'd be grateful if that could be amended. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farrell, um, for, for that. Members, um... Business and Culture Committee, the matters are raising. Anybody want to raise anything? No. F is the Monthly Environment and Regeneration Committee held on Wednesday, the 8th of July, pages 115 to 130 for accuracy. Can I get a proposer and a seconder, please? Proposed again. Andy McCain proposing. Seconded Morris here. And Alderman Davini um, seconding. Matters are rising for the same pages. Uh, Mayor, Mayor uh, sorry. Who's there? Uh, Alderman Alder Kerrigan, first I heard, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Mayor. No, just ER121 slash 20, Kiln Recycling Centre. Uh, no, uh, 
there is more information to come in relation to that. But it was a wee issue was raised with me in relation to uh, blue bin waste. Uh, apparently now uh, it is the case that uh, you need to have eight people and a and a dwelling house now to get a second bin. And the question was asked that because there's so much pushed in for recycling now that uh, oftentimes it is the blue bin that is full to capacity and in excess. And particularly now with the kiln site not being opened and people haven't either travelled to Strahan's Road or Newton Stewart, it was just the case of if there's a potential of individuals who are seeking to get a second blue bin, unless they can get uh, additional, first, unless they have more than six people or someone with a disability at their dwelling, the second blue bin will not be lifted. But that was, was raised with me that that's people that are trying to recycle and trying to put more into the blue bin rather than filling their black bin. And they're saying, well, we're not going to lift it. You can get a second blue bin, we'll sell it to you. But will not you'll not it'll not be collected. I know it's it's one thing in particular was raised to me because of the kiln site, but uh, it's uh, maybe more for E and R in general. But thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Alderman Kerrigan. Your uh, well, Mayor, just a, a a quick response to that. It it might be useful if uh, if Alderman McCain uh, could refer that individual family uh, to our waste team. Who will uh, who will engage with them personally just to understand the issue? Thanks um, for that, John. Um, I think that was Kerrigan instead of McCain. Alderman, Alderman Kerrigan. Yeah. Same uh, same response. Members, G it is the monthly health and communities committee held on the 9th of July, pages 131 to 152. So proposed, Mayor Morris. Alderman Devaney. Second, Mayor Mandy McCain. Mandy McCain. Matters rising for the same pages, members. And I see. Reiner, just uh, on accuracy, just as Councillor Riley Sorry. here. Uh, Go ahead. Can I may attendance recorded as apologies because I wasn't able to attend. Uh, the meeting was not uh, online, so I wasn't able to attend due to shielding. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Riley. Um, Councillor Donnelly on item uh, HC122 forward slash 20. Page yeah, report. just bear with us, Councillor Donnelly. There's a, few, there's a few looking in here. We'll come, come to you now in a, in a wee second, all right? Apologies. You're okay. Um, Councillor Edwards. Mayor, thanks for letting me in. I don't want to come under um, HC11320 um, about the Western uh, Trust. Uh, Mayor, since I became a, a councillor seven weeks ago, one of the biggest issues that people are talking to me about is elective care procedures. And it was in the media this morning um, about a lady and a family who, who've been struggling to, to try and be seen in the West. So I think it's important that the council does what it can to, to highlight that. So I would like to propose that Mayor, the council writes to the Western Health and Social Care Trust to raise concern about elective care waiting lists, especially during lockdown. Um, and asked that any additional funding um, has been received from the Department of Health. I know that 90 million was was uh, allocated across the north to, 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 in terms of elective care at the start of the month. So I want to see what additional money is going to the Western Trust and how they'll tackle the elective care waiting lists um, as they start to ramp up services again. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor Edwards. Just bear with me. I'm trying to go down through the chat box to see who. Wanted and, and the next one is Alderman Devaney. Is it on the same issue? As Mr. Mayor, um, it's, it's to do with the Western Trust uh, uh, and the discussions are around that. And I know we did, uh, during that meeting, Mr. Mayor, we did uh, um, discuss a number of issues around the health minister and stuff like that there. But uh, I think, Mr. Mayor, uh, in the present climate, um, for those people who are now waiting on hospital appointments, and some of them, um, some of them red flagged. Um, for quite a long period of time. And I do believe that uh, in our discussions, if we can get the, the health minister down to, to, to discuss the other issue re, re, that was raised earlier um, regarding funding, I do believe this is a pertinent issue to raise with them, that we do believe for those people now who are waiting long term on waiting, uh, waiting on appointments, and for those people who are waiting first time to go on to see appointments, uh, and I can speak for, for, from a personal capacity here. I have a, a, an ongoing issue, and since March, um, it has been red flagged. And 
we, you know, for those we just cannot get in uh, for first time appointment. And I think it's important that we do raise this issue with the health minister when, uh, if and when we get him down. Okay, um, Alderman Tavini, uh, thanks for that. Um, Councillor Gallagher, on the same issue, around the Western Trust. Yeah, Chair, thank you for letting us in. Just in regards to the Western Trust, and, uh, I came across a, a couple this week, an elderly couple, uh, both suffering from Alzheimer's uh, and cannot get the care in their home. Uh, and when we're writing the trust, I think we need to be writing the trust and saying, there's people in our community who are very, very vulnerable that is in need of their services and the service is not available. So I would be uh, glad to input the details of who and what at a later date if we were engaging with the trust. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Gallagher. Remember, just before we go on, I just want to double check here um, in terms of this issue um, that Councillor uh, Edwards has raised. I have three further indicated speakers, and they are Councillor Farrell, Councillor Hartman, and Councillor Ferguson. Um, if anyone else is looking to speak, can they please let me know? Um, thank you. So, Councillor Farrell. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, it is relating to the same item, uh, HC 11320, um, but it was specifically about the deputation uh, from Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. Um, at the deputation, I raised the issue of recruitment and retention of staff and the specific impact that has on the waiting lists for children accessing mental health lists. Um, it's worth noting that there's a ministerial target that states that no child should wait longer than nine weeks uh, to engage with the service, and the trust is missing that target. Uh, there's approximately 488 kids uh, waiting over nine weeks, and that's quadrupled in the last year. Um, at the meeting, Councillor Logue made a proposal uh, that we write to the Trust and we write to the Department of Health to see what they can do to entice uh, staff to come and work on the service. Um, that will address the recruitment, the recruitment issues, but it won't necessarily address the staff retention problems. So I'd like to propose a slight amendment to uh, Councillor Logue's proposal. We send a letter uh, about enticing staff, um, but we also include um, to find out what the trust and what the department will do to keep the staff that they actually have um, so that we can reduce those waiting lists for children and adolescents seeking to engage with the service. Uh, thanks. And there's one further item on health and communities. If I uh, we'll, we'll, come back, we'll come back to you. We're just right. to this one before. Um, before we do that, uh, right. Councillor Farrell, thank you. Um, Councillor Harkin. Yeah, two two issues pertaining to the Western Trust that I think it's important we take note of. Uh, one is uh, that uh, the car parking fees for uh, staff uh, have been suspended, but it's now been announced that uh, they will be uh, charging again the workers, NHS workers, our health service workers, our Western Trust workers. Uh, and I think we should send a clear message from the council that we think that uh, parking should be free for uh, health service staff um, uh, uh, and that that should continue. Uh, the, these are the workers that we were clapping regularly on a Thursday night. I think it's an insult to ask them to pay for parking uh, at the uh, at, at, at Western Trust uh, parking uh, car parks. Uh, and the second one is that there is concern about the future rectory field. Uh, we have uh, supported the keeping re rectory field as a residential home in the past, uh, and now workers uh, and the trade unions are concerned that uh, there will be a change uh, of use for rectory field. Uh, the, the rectory field and William Street are the two um residential homes that we've campaigned to keep that way here in the city and i think we should take note and stand with the demand that rectory field remain a residential home thank you thank you councillor harkin uh for that councillor ferguson thank you mayor um just basically wanted to say that i'm happy to um 
support the proposal to write to the, the trust about the waiting list. We all know uh, a couple of months back that we had um, a meeting where they were prioritising people that had been on the list for many, many years, my, my mother being one. But I wanted to add, is there a way possibly write also to the um, BMA and GP services? Because another reason at the moment is the lack of access to your local GP and the confusion around how services will go forward and the want to flu vaccination. I've got a lot of constituents coming through now. Personally, I've written to the chair, Dr Black. I haven't heard back, but maybe some clarification from the, the GP services and how their practices will be going forward in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Um, Councillor Lowe. Chair, just a couple of uh, comments. Just on Councillor uh, Farrell's uh, proposal, or to add to my proposal, of uh, given it was not given uh, the word he mentioned, but it was in incentives to, to bring more staff here. I have no problem with adding in. Uh, the their attention got staff too as well, and just on the GPH services, I too have have written to uh, certain organisations regarding issues uh, around this matter. Lovely, um, Councillor Lowe, thanks for that, Councillor Farrell. Um, before we move on, can you just um, repeat for us maybe your proposal? Um, we, we, we didn't just get up when you were giving it the first time, please. Uh, uh, well, I suppose um, in the, the proposal, uh, I'm going to have to try and find uh, Patricia's pr proposal. Um, nearly there. If, right, I so. could just come in, if I could just come in, uh, Mayor, maybe. Go ahead, that might just. Uh, uh, I, I, think that this is, uh, I just haven't got it in front of me here either. I find it hard which between the two but uh the business of my proposal was that we write uh to the trust and the department of health uh given the current situation here where we find it very difficult within uh, this trust district to attract staff and then i suppose retain them that uh, some incentives are put forward uh, for this council area uh, to attract staff, uh, to attract staff, but Councillor Farrell now has added, has, has once added that uh, that that is also to include with the retention of staff too as well. Uh, well Councillor Farrell. Well, basically, uh, well, Patricia's proposal was that we contact the trust and the Department of Health to emphasise that some incentives needed to be given to entice workers in the health and health care sector to work on this council area. I agree with that, but that only addresses recruitment. The big issue within CAMS is the retention of staff. Um, at the deputation, they said they lost 10 staff in the last year. So in that letter, we need to ask the trust and the department what they're going to do to retain the actual staff that we have. You know, this is about children's mental health. Um, so we need to keep these people on board. We need to get them here in the first place, but we need to make sure they stay as well. So again, it needs to be twofold. What are the trust and what is the department going to do to get the vacancies filled and what they're going to do to ensure that when the vacancies are filled, that they remain filled and that CAMS can deliver the service that everybody in this council area and the Western Trust expects of them. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Duffy, is it on the same issue, Councillor Duffy? Yeah, it's it's just on that issue. Okay. At the at the presentation, um, they did say why they had lost 10 staff in uh, such a short period of time and it was to do with the establishment of multidiscipline routines at that stage so maybe the retention of staff is not the issue councillor farrell actually believes it is it was a one-off in terms of Uh, 
Thank you, um, Councillor Duffy, for, for that. However, there's been quite a lot um, discussed um, in the matters arising from those minutes. Um, and I have no further indicated speakers. So, um, our people can't uh, that we um, have discussed it and, and we'll, we'll move on from it. Okay, yeah. So, Yeah, on a separate issue um, at the Health and Communities meeting, um, Councillor Donnelly wishes to raise an item. Councillor Donnelly. Chair, Chair, it's just HC 122 forward slash 20, affordable warrant. I'd like to propose Councillor Paul Gallagher for the working group. Okay, um, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Donnelly. Councillor McHugh, my apologies. Um, I never seen it. You indicated in, in the chat box. Um, so if you want to come on now, uh, go ahead. No problem there. Um, it's regarding HC one thirty slash twenty, Melvin Arena. Um, yeah. I've been contacted, as I'm sure other Derry councillors have been, by Derry View Football Club in Castle Derry, and I know they have been in touch with Ryan Dehan and uh, Keith Thompson on the matter, but they're seeking to explore. Uh, possibly listen the mobile changing rooms uh, that are going to become available when the work starts at Melbourne. Um, obviously, their uh, fo uh, football league championship club and and her own, and uh, their current setup with work due to begin under the shared spaces scheme on their training pitch uh, wouldn't permit them to continue playing in that league. So they're obviously looking to explore um, a temporary lease of those portable changing rooms to facilitate their participation in that league. So uh, could I just ask Karen, um, and I'm conscious that that could probably merit a report being brought to the, the Health and Community Committee, but I'm just I'm aware obviously that won't be until uh, September. So could it just get an update maybe from Karen? Um, is she aware of it? And uh, is it a possibility or where things are sitting out there? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay, um, Alder, or, sorry, Councillor McHugh. Um, and again, my apologies, as I, I must see you on the, the chat box. Before we bring Karen in, I'm going to go to Alderman McCain as he wants uh, to raise an issue on this uh, particular um, item as well. So Alderman McCain. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, for letting me in. Uh, I suppose just a wee point of clarification that uh, I also received the same email as Councillor McHugh there. And I talked to Barry O'Hagan yesterday around the same issue. And Barry has clarified the, the situation to myself and has a WebEx meeting, I think, agreed with uh, Lady Linda Cousins, I think, who, who wrote the email. So, um, and I, I don't think that. Um, the the toilets are going to be made available but anyway i i i've been talking to barry o'hagan on that issue yesterday and uh there is a webex meeting set up with derek view to explain the situation to them uh, just thank you mayor thank you alderman again um for that and again before we bring karen on i'm going to go to alderman kerrigan um as it's on the same issue yeah Alderman kerrigan uh thank you mayor uh, no, again supporting the derek view football club there in relation to that, um, the R has been stated. There's a third. There's a third football club within our city and district. And to be fair, any you know, that know the area know their facilities are not powerful. You, you know, and anything that we can do to try to support them, they are a championship team, and they're they're doing quite well out of it. And I suppose their facilities don't definitely don't look like it. So uh, anything that we can do uh, will be much appreciated by the club. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan, um, for, for, for that. Um, Karen, are you on the line there? Um, yes, Mayor and members. Um, there are a number of issues around pavilions and changing facilities um, on by both the Council's own estate um, and requests by clubs. We're reviewing those and considering those, so I think it would be appropriate if we report back into the September Health and Community Committee. Um, in the interim, if we can liaise and discuss with clubs um, who um, don't use council facilities, uh, we'll do that um, between now and September. 
Thank you, John, for that. Um, members, I hope that uh, answers uh, a number of your queries. Um, we're moving on. Um, Alderman Guy wanted to come on on the same issue as Councillor Donnelly, so I'm assuming it's just a nomination to the Affordable Warrants, is it? Alderman it is, Guy? I just put my name down on that there. Alderman Guy, thank you. Um, and that'll be noted. Councillor Farrell on uh, a separate matter. Councillor Farrell. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I, I probably should have raised it in accuracy. Uh, it's HC 11920, so it was about the extension of the Pilot Appeals and Tribunal Programme. Um, I spoke on the item um, in health communities, um, and I praised the three providers across our council area, who are Advice Northwest, Dove House, and the Resource Centre. But in the minutes, uh, there's no mention of the resource centre, so I don't want them to think that I, I don't uh, appreciate the work they do for the people across this city and district. I, I definitely do. Uh, and I'd just like to make a point about what Councillor Duffy had said about uh, the multidisciplinary teams. Yeah, I was listening at the presentation. Um, I'm aware that Darren's got 10 members of staff. Councillor uh, Farrell, we've, we've moved on from that issue. Um, we've moved on from that issue. Thank you for, for Thank highlighting you. it. And you're, you're right, you should have raised it in uh, accuracy. Yeah. Um, and I uh, hope uh, the one at the resource centre sees that, particularly not uh, Betty Feeney, but we'll move on. Um, members to H, item H is the monthly audit, assurance audit and risk committee held on Wednesday, the 15th of July 2020. Are we issue under Paragon, Mayor? Right, okay, go ahead. Uh, just very briefly, uh, and I suppose it's just about the parking of Daff and Alton Galvin, the doc, or uh, the councillor Harkin was referring to. There is free parking for staff uh, at Alton Galvin. You know, staff as a rule doesn't have to pay, but the, the difficulty being that there sometimes is not enough spaces uh, for the staff. Uh, obviously, I feel that no staff should have to pay for their parking at any hospital. And uh, I was I'm of the understanding that some spaces was to be made available in the multi-story care park for staff. Uh, I think they're roughly a hundred they're roughly a hundred spaces short for staff um, generally. And uh, if I could make even a proposal that uh, we as council would write to uh, the Western Trust requesting that some of the multi-story care park be freed up for free parking for staff, because I think it is ridiculous that staff and quite often low-paid staff. And maybe domestics and catering staff who are on an evening or twilight shift have to pay for parking. So I, I'm going to make the suggestion that uh, we write to the Western Trust and some space is freed up so staff uh, are allowed to park freely to, to attend their work. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman McCain. Um, that, as you see, has been seconded by Councillor Harkin. Um, members are, I don't imagine anybody will be, but is anyone, uh, is everyone content uh, to go ahead with that proposal? Alderman McCain. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Members, um, it is the monthly audit assurance and risk committee held on Wednesday, the 15th of July, pages 153 to 162 for accuracy. I have a proposal and a seconder, please. Post Mayor. Who was that, sorry? Mr. Ramsey. Uh, Alderman Ramsey. Seconder, please. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. Members, the same pages for matters arising, 153 to 162. Uh, Councillor Donnelly, uh, can I come in? Or is there yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Councillor Donnelly. Chair, uh, I it's the AAR 25 forward slash 20, uh, the audit, particularly the, well, specifically the audit into the, the PCSP and the fact that there has been uh, over 40 recommendations. And I found that uh, very, very worrying. Uh, I don't think there was enough information in in, in the report to uh, Chair, can you excuse me one second? <laughs> the last time that I seen that dog, it barked at me. What, one, um, second, <laughs> one second, Go ahead. Uh, if 
Apologies to everybody. I think it'll be all right the night here. There was a, a cat working outside. Uh, <laughs> you've, you've just woken my dog as well. <laughs> Turned a whole crisis. Uh, apologies for that, everybody. Chair, it says that given the fact that there's that that this this scheme has uh, been operating, I don't know how long, but I imagine I think it's at least five years. This is the first audit. The fact that there's forty four recommendations, uh, and I I didn't think that we had enough information to uh, to to rubber stamp it or pass it on, and and I I do think that I'm going to make a proposal that we get. Uh, an external independent uh, forensic audit of the, the PCSP to look into these issues and uh, all our issues. You know, uh, I know some of the officers, uh, you know, I know I know one officer said that there was at, at a glance, I think was the word that was used, that there doesn't appear to be any notion of fraud. Uh, I, I'm sort of, you know, I don't know how that could be said uh because i i haven't had any supporting evidence for that how that opinion was formed and looking back over the video there was another comment from another officer and this is not a criticism of of of, of officers you know but uh you know where where we shouldn't put too much attention on the the and i'm paraphrasing here on the recommendations but read the body of the report i'm i'm a bit uh you know, I don't understand. Obviously, recommendations are risk factors, and I think they need to be taken into the account. So, so I have uh, serious issues with it, and I'm going to propose that that we we ask for an independent uh, forensic external forensic audit. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Donnelly, for that. Now, uh, members, there's a few people who have indicated they speak, but um, as you will see, there's the chat box has been. In there, so I just want to make sure that I've got um, all the indicated speakers before we, we come to them. And I notice that Mr. Sean Carr is saying that he will second uh, that proposal from Councillor Donnelly. All the members who have declared an interest um, as members of the PTSP will be noted. Um, uh, also, members, I'm not going to call them out, but whoever has indicated here um, will be noted. In order that I have seen them, um, I have Councillor Logue, Gallagher, Alderman Kerrigan and Councillor Carr. If I haven't called your name, I've missed it. Um, so can you please drop it on the chat box and let me know? Alderman Devaney on the chat. It was on the chat box, Mayor. Yeah, I've missed it. I've missed it. Um, Alderman Devaney and Alderman Work as well, I see. And uh, Alderman McClintock as well, please, Mayor. Okay, every member of the DUP is going to speak on this. Uh, Work, um, McClintock. And Ferguson. I'm just declaring an interest as a member of the PCA. Oh, you're declaring. No, so you don't you don't want to speak. No, you're just declaring. It. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so now, for, in terms of speakers, I have Mr. Luke, Oliver, Kerrigan, Carr, Devaney, Work, and Ferguson. All other members who have declared an interest will be noted. And if I haven't called your name out, I haven't got you down to speak. So, so can you please drop a message in? Thank you, Mayor. Just to clarify, I was only declaring an interest. <laughs> okay. I had it on the group chat. Yeah, yes, and I said that everyone who's in the group chat will be noted. Um, and I'm only and I don't want to speak. Yes, that's fine. I'm only calling out names of people who I have indicated to speak. So, speakers are Councillor Logue, Oliver, Kerrigan, Carr, Work, and Ferguson. Anyone else who has put a chat, a, a message in the chat, will be noted as having a declared an interest. Councillor Logue. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um... I too have uh, am a member of the audit committee and have just recently rejoined that committee after being out there for quite a number of years. However, um, I suppose just familiarizing myself again with the, the purposes of all that, um, which I have done over the past number of weeks, but anyhow, for me, the purpose of an audit is to ensure that there's a framework to carry out the function of any department and that that framework is effective for the overall objectives of, of the organization as well as being compliant with the controls the governance the risk management and the letters of offer um, we in Sinn Féin believe that this audit was carried out diligently by the audit officers with the cooperation of the PCSP manager and their staff 
while there was quite a lot of a uh, number of recommendations which we believe are now in the process of being implemented, they must be considered in their individual context. Given that the member who proposed this item be brought to full council has been an audit committee since 2015 and was indeed chair during the term 1920, I am somewhat surprised that they do not appear to have the basic understanding of audit reports and that the re recommendations should be considered in their individual context. And can I just say it has maybe um, uh, heightened that surprise by the comment that I made just recently there uh, regarding an officer's uh, comment on read the body of the, of the report. Or could it be that given it is public knowledge of the members views certain organizations, it is the members own hostilities towards certain groups and organizations that is leading to their inequality of response. And what I mean by that is I have looked over all the other audits that have uh, be taken place, all the other internal audits that have taken place uh, within the, the number of council terms. And there was quite a few that had a similar uh, number of recommendations, some more, uh, some with a different rating, but that was because they were in a different context, some with the same rating, uh, and again, all in the context. And after having reviewed all our internal audits that would have received, I suppose, similar audit opinion and those that did not, as well as speaking with the auditors and the PCSP manager, we in Sinn Féin fully support the recommendation of the audit assurance rating of satisfactory. And we are proposing we accept this report. Therefore, Chair, uh, we in Sinn Féin will not be supporting the, most, the proposal that is currently on the floor. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that, Councillor Lowe. Councillor Gallagher. Councillor Gallagher, are you online? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Just, just in regards to this uh, this report on on the audit, how uh, and the many recommendations that, that have come out of this, I think that we as councillors, they are very rightly need to challenge us. Uh, we've seen this group hand out uh, somewhere in the region a quarter million quid. Uh, it hasn't been audited in the last five or six years, so we could be talking well over a million quid. But what they found is they haven't even checked the background of the groups as, as these groups register charities, are they not? Uh, they haven't checked out, are they giving these groups money? And is there any double funding going on this? And there's a crucial there's a crucial element in this. A lot of a lot of these groups, and I've had a number uh, of groups come to me and, and believe that they've been unfairly treated and, applic and applying for this money. Because there's a criteria used. And some of the criteria that they use, they say, we're going to match fund. We're going to bring £10,000 you give us ten thousand pound, and they get a higher score than other groups because they have brought money to the table. Who do you want to send it to? But this—that's my phone going. But this, uh, this findings in this report, they haven't went and checked. Was the match funding there? There are so many okay. fundamentals found found within this report that we need to look deeper. We need to look deeper in it. And I would uh, concur with Councillor Donnelly's proposal yes. and look so, for a forensic audit. Thank you. Thanks for that, um, Councillor Gallagher. Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you, Mayor, for letting me in. Uh, Mayor, I uh, was on the audit committee and it was raised that this is the first audit of PCSP. There were 44 recommendations came up on it, uh, but these were all classified as, as minor level uh, issues. There were no major issues which caused us to be a final audit report. 
Uh, there have been other uh, uh, organisations and other groups which have had their first audit, such as Council Fleet, such as Foil Arena, various items such as that, which have came in with a similar level of, of uh, recommendations on their first audit. Uh, and as well as that, uh, Mayor, I, I do state here, what was I looking at, it wrote down here, why has this audit of the PCSP been treated differently? And now we still have all our departments there. We have the audit license. That's not the first time, it could be the second, the third, the fourth time that's been audited. And that's still coming in with 23 recommendations. So I just thank Mayor Oft. And it was claimed at the meeting that this was a uh, red pair's money and had to be accountable for. And, and you, you know, could be an additional cost here involved in this. And I would like to see what, as a, if we could get a rough idea of a cost and how much this could be potentially to bring in forensic auditors. And I, I personally feel that this is setting a very, it's setting a, a precedent here that if you're going to turn around and audit, you know, get a forensic auditor in to look at the PCSP, why not look at the rest of them? You know, it could it could cost a massive amount of money. And I have faith and confidence in the audit team that they have looked at this and they're content, it's not serious. And they said they couldn't bring anything up between the audit committee on the 15th and now full council. They said their recommendations are being acted upon and they will report back to the September meeting. And then at that stage, if, we, if nothing's been done, yes, something can be looked at in that regard and we may well support that. But at this stage now, uh, Mayor, uh, there's no way that we could support this here. I, I think it should have been left if it had been done right at the committee. It would have been left that the audit that the committee would have brought it back to the September meeting and brought the report then on how those 44 recommendations have been dealt with. So we'll, we'll not be supporting the proposal moving forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Alderman Kerrigan. Councillor Kiar. Mayor, uh, I am seconding this proposal from Councillor Donnelly because uh, I'm on the audit as well, but it just kept on, and there was a sample of five taken out. There were problems with the whole five. Why was there not more samples taken of that, of their works, and then bring out another report? But there wasn't, they just stopped. And how could you stop when the five samples you took, they're false with them? So there has to be open and transparency on everything and it doesn't matter what strain or uh, appendix of council or where it's in council there has to be open and transparency and we need you need to have a audit an external audit of the pcsp and it's not just because it's pcsp we need to be looking at this because it is out in the public the meeting was out in the public and the public wants answers and i do believe that we need to be having this audit Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Kiar. Alderman Work. Well done there, Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. I haven't asked you to speak in that. I, I was part of me, be a part of PCSP, Mayor. Okay, okay. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say that I wanted to check for clarification. Do we have an external auditor come in and pick out so, so many samples? Let's say, I think the PCSP does some fantastic work. I understand the concerns with 44, but they're 44 lower recommendations. They could have you know, been as simple as a signature on a sign-in sheet. Um, I am all for open and transparency, so I'm um, for an external auditor and, and to go for the proposal, but I don't necessarily think that it should just be the PCSP. It should be a sample of audits, um, and hopefully that would be a framework that we would work on um, going forward. I do agree with uh, Alderman Kerrigan. We need to kind of see what the, the cost of having a, a forensic audit, um, but I need more clarification around um, whether or not we do have an external auditor come and, and so many samples. Um, but I'm happy for anything to be scrutinised and challenged. Going forward, it would just make their case stronger and, and um, show what the great work that they are actually doing. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. I'm Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Harkin. Thanks. 
Thanks, Mayor, for letting me in. Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess I would follow on from Councillor Ferguson's remarks. Uh, look, I, I think we should be as open and transparent about this as possible. Uh, there are many things that get audited. Uh, Councillor Donnelly has proposed the, uh, uh, an external audit of this uh, uh, body. And I think that we want to be, uh, for those who are, I think, acting defensively, I think that if, if there's nothing there, then it's better to be open and transparent. And, uh, you know, I think that this is the way to do it. Um, you, you know, there's lots of concerns about uh, financial abuses. I mean, we've just had our HIE and there's many, many financial scandals. So I think it's better for the council to be, uh, as uh, others have said, transparent and open about this. There's also the issue where, uh, yes, there is lots of great work done uh, through the funding uh, and there's a lot of money at stake. Um, uh, and, and people do do great work, but unfortunately, there are some who won't engage. Uh, and so I think the issue of uh, financial abuse, if that is uh, at all possible, or even if it's raised, uh, needs to be properly investigated, that we can't have that be an additional issue um, for people to be concerned about. So, you know, we, th there's a lot of money at stake here. Uh, there's people who already have questions about this. This has been raised at this meeting as a proposal. Um, and I think it's in best practice of the council to be uh, as transparent and open uh, 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 about all uh, bodies and all funding. Um, and there is recommendations there. So, uh, you know, if there, if there, there could be more. So uh, we'll be supporting uh, Councillor Donnelly's proposal. Thanks for that, Councillor Harkin. Councillor Durkin. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, uh, a lot of it's already been said, Mayor, you know, especially in this current climate, we owe it to the public to do our best to uphold transparency, openness and accountability and all spending at every level of public money. Um, so would support the sentiment of the motion should say, uh, just to be clear, I'm not exactly sure what done. It's an external forensic audit. I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, there may be costings around that. I'm not saying that the costings not justified, but also I wonder who. You know, how do we ensure the independence of this auditor uh, and how is selected and and I suppose the exact terms of reference of the audit. But um, I definitely have no bother in. Um, supporting the call this call for more scrutiny of this um we have to remember that the public deserve nothing less than a full and anxious scrutiny of payments of public money thanks for that um councillor turkin um uh, councillor duffy Thank you, um, Mayor, for allowing me in. Um, I, I would just like to say um, our party's not being defensive or deflective or anything around this, but we do have um, an audit committee. We do have an audit section, and I think we're we're actually steering into quite dangerous territory in terms of calling into question the independence and the how they go about scrutinising and auditing are are the work of council. Um, I know that they do a great job. There is openness and there is transparency. Our audit committee is probably one of the only audit committees that try to do all of its business in open business um, across the north. Um, I know that at that audit committee, while I wasn't at it, um, that the, end, the audit office were in attendance at that meeting as well. So I don't believe that anybody has been trying to hide anything. Um, what I would say is I think there are people that are trying to mislead people. I think that um, in terms of the recommendations that are in the audit report, I've read the audit report, the, the recommendations are not major recommendations. They are minor recommendations that any audit you would expect there to be minor recommendations coming out of any audit. I met with the audit, uh, the audit staff, um, with Councillor Logue and the PCSB manager. I know that the majority of those recommendations are already being actioned, and there's a further report coming to committee in September. I think that this is actually ridiculous, and I think it's straying onto dangerous ground. Um, we'll not be supporting it because I think that in terms of the audit that is in front of us. 
and the report that is in front of us is very clear in terms of the recommendations. PCSP do great work and the, the groups that are involved in it. As chair last year, I got to go out and visit quite a number of them and the work that they are doing is second to none. And I think that there, there's there's nearly allegations being made here. And I would just ask people to step back and, and show a bit of caution in terms of it. Absolutely, there should be transparency. Absolutely, there should be openness. But I think that people need to be represent the facts properly and not as a quote from my, my father, um, the devil can quote the Bible for his own ends. And I think that might be a wee bit of what's happening here. Thanks for, for that, Councillor Duffy. Alderman McClintock. Thanks, Mayor. And I think there's definitely other agendas being played out in this. It is really just a mischief making here by uh, Councillor Donnelly, who should know better. I am a former member of the Audit Committee uh, up until um, last term, and the scrutiny that happens within that Audit Committee is amazing. And for anybody who hasn't been on it, maybe they're just not aware of the level of scrutiny. And I think before we take a vote, I would ask, and I'm sure you're going to do it anyway, Mayor, is to ask that either Denise or John or someone comes in to provide some information to us. But I mean, we do have an external auditor, as uh, Councillor Duffy has said. We do have the Audit Office who are there and who ask a lot of questions. So there really is mischief making going on here. We have been told, um, or listening in to the to the meeting last week, uh, we were told that um, a lot of these issues will have already been resolved and we need that update before we start jumping ahead and calling in for a forensic um, accountability on this. So I think we need to take this a step at a time. Those who have never been on the audit committee are probably not aware of the level of scrutiny that actually happens there. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman McClampick. And you're right. I am going to ask um, Denise um, to come in um, shortly, but I want to make sure that we have given members ample time to speak so that she can wrap all of the, the queries and questions together um, and respond to, the, to them all. So the last speaker that I have at this stage is Councillor Donnelly. Go ahead, Gary. Thank you. Chair, I'm a bit surprised by some of the comments here. You know, when nobody accused anybody of hiding anything. People are saying that this is setting a precedent. People are saying this is dangerous ground and that others are misrepresenting the facts. There's an agenda at work and there's mischief. Chair, I am simply, this is not a precedent. We have been here before with student contracts. When we went through the same process that we seem to be going down now when it was resisted, when, when all sorts of allegations were put to people who were asking for transparency, what have people got to be afraid of, of an independent audit? You know, if we come out of that audit and everything's sound, then that's the assurance. What price can you put on that? The public will want to know. You know, it's not a president. We've been there before. There was a lot of resistance to it. People had to go and make complaints to the audit office. I've already received correspondence from respectable community workers in this community saying that they had, had had a number of issues with this whole process. Is it going to be left for them? They have to go to the audit office because we're going to be seen to be resistant, to be looking into things properly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. And just before I bring Denise in, Councillor Donnelly, can you just, um, again, obviously we've had a a number of speakers on this proposal. Can you just outline your proposal um, again, please? Chair, I, I propose that that we carry we get an external independent forensic audit. Yep, that's grand. Thank you, Con Councillor Logue. Uh, thank and then, and then I'm bringing this uh, discussion to the end because uh, I want to get the the lead assurance officer and um and get the vote done. Sure logo the last uh, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, it is going to be very brief. Councillor Donnelly uh, goes on and on about process, and we all agree about process. See those groups that are coming to him with any concerns? He should be advising him as a councillor, as a representative of this council, to go with the process. Not bring it in and shout about it, but go through the complaints process. 
as uh, as it would any, any other issue. Um, as for transparency and openness, the audit committee is transparent and it is open. And uh, again, again, I will just have to voice my surprise at the said members. Um, I, I don't know how, it, it, it seems ignorance of how the audit committee uh, report and function. Um, so I suggest that this member go and educate himself. Okay, thanks for that, um, Councillor Lowe. Um, member, I'm going to ask Denise to come on the address, um, Councillor Ferguson's um, query around the, the difference between an, an, an external audit. So Denise, if you're on the call. Yes, Mayor, thanks for bringing me in and thanks, Mayor. Um, in response to a few of the queries, yes, the PCSP, there was two audits carried out, um, two reports presented to audit committee last, last week. One was for 2017-18 and the other one was for 2018-19. Um, in terms of that, there, there, as members are aware, there was a number of recommendations made um, and the audit received a satisfactory assurance rating. The reason that it received a satisfactory assurance rating, despite the number of recommendations that were was made, was that um, the first part of the audit looked at the governance and the risk management arrangements around the, the systems and controls that were in place. There were 17 areas that were reviewed as part of that audit. In nine of the areas, there was no recommendations made. And in the remaining eight areas, there was 13 recommendations made out of those eight areas. So that's the reason the audit received a satisfactory assurance rating, because there was more than half of the areas looked at which didn't receive any recommendations. In terms of the other recommendations that were made, it was a very detailed audit that was carried out. There was 140 invoices sampled in 1718 and there was 102 invoices sampled in 1819. So there was a very, very detailed audit that was carried out. Um, as, as some members have said there and the audit committee reviewed last week, there's an action plan at the back of both of the audit reports and the recommendations are in the process of being implemented. And in terms of the function of audit committee and what we would always do is provide an update to the next audit committee in relation to the implementation of those recommendations. And that is the plan for the next audit committee meeting. In terms of some of the, the comments that members have made, particularly Councillor Ferguson, um, yes, we do have an external auditor, obviously the Northern Ireland Audit Office are our external auditor and they review our financial statements. As part of the review of the financial statements, they will review all of the work that has been carried out by internal audit throughout the year. Um, as members know and members who are on the audit committee know, the external auditor attends most of our audit committee minutes or most of our audit committee meetings. They receive the minutes of all of the meetings and they also receive all of the audit reports. Um, they will all, they will carry out a sample testing based on the audit reports that we have completed throughout the year and they will play, place reliance on the work that they've completed as part of their annual audit report. They will advise members on an annual basis as to whether or not they can place reliance on the work of internal audit and as members will know, um, the, the external auditor as per the Northern Ireland Audit Office have consistently placed reliance on the work of our internal audit team year in, year out. Um, in terms of the specific question that Councillor Ferguson has asked, um, would they carry out a forensic audit? The answer to that is no. Um, we would have to appoint someone to carry out a forensic audit. So that would obviously be a procurement exercise. We would go out to tender and we would appoint someone to carry out that forensic exercise. And, and just for clarity, again, the internal audit team, they look at the internal systems and controls and the external auditor looks at the financial statements. I'm happy to take any further questions, Mayor, that, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you um, for, for that, Denise. Um, Members, there's a proposal in front of us, uh, which we've um, discussed um, in, in, in great detail um, from Councillor Donnelly, seconded by Councillor Kiar. I have received a few queries from members of the PCSP in relation to their um, ability to vote, and I've asked, John is going to provide some advice um, on that before we go to the vote. So, John, um, and, and then we'll go to the vote. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, members. Um, as the Mayor said, a number of members have declared uh, an interest. Uh, in this matter, my understanding is that is that that is a non pecuniary interest, uh, and as such, it is therefore uh, up to each individual member whether he or she wishes to vote uh, or to abstain. But there is certainly no requirement not to vote. It's a matter for each member 
uh, to decide on the basis that this is an, they have a non pecuniary interest. So, on the basis of that, Mayor, do you want me to proceed with the vote? Yes, please, John. Um, Alderman Breslin? Against. Alderman Devaney? Against. Alderman Guy? Against. Alderman Carrigan? Against. Alderman McClintock? Against. Alderman McCready? Against. Alderman McCain? Against. Alderman Ramsey? Against. Alderman Wark? Against. Councillor Jason Barr? Barr. Councillor John Boyle? Barr. Councillor Michaela Boyle? Councillor Michaela Boyle? <laughs> Councillor Tina Burke? Against. Just. Councillor Clark? Barr. Councillor Cooper? Against. Councillor Cusick? Barr. Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Dobbins. I'm, I'm, I'll have to rely on someone else. To, uh, Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Duffy. Against. Councillor Durkin. Councillor Edwards? Four, John. Councillor Farrell? Four. Councillor Ferguson? Four. Councillor Fleming? Against, John. Councillor Gallagher? Four. Councillor Harkin? Four. Councillor Jackson? Against. Councillor Kelly? Against. Councillor Logue? Councillor Logue? Against, John. Councillor McCann? Four. Councillor McCluskey? Four. Councillor McGuire? Councillor McGuire? Against. Councillor McHugh? Against, John. Councillor McKeever? Four. Councillor McKinney? Against. Councillor Mellon? Councillor Mooney? Four, John. Councillor Riley? Four, John. Councillor Tierney? Four, John. Thank and you. Councillor Michaela Boyle and Councillor Donnelly have voted on the Jack Ripper. Councillor Michaela Boyle's vote is? Against, John. Sorry, I had to take a Thank you. Against. And sorry, did you say someone else there, Mayor? Councillor Donnelly. I've got Councillor Donnelly. I didn't get Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Dobbins, that'll be recorded as an abstention. Okay, just give me one second, Mayor, please. Okay, members, um, the result of that vote is 17 for the proposal, 21 against the proposal, and we have one abstention, so the proposal falls. So that's the monthly audit, assurance audit and risk committee um, in terms of the matters arising. Um, is there any further further matters? Sure. Can I can I just come in to thank the staff for the the report? There's a lot of work done there. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly, for that. I'm sure they'll uh, appreciate it, members. Moving on, item number nine is the. Uh, yep. Um, item number nine is the COVID nineteen recovery update. Uh, which was sent out by email today, and I'm going to ask John to 
the tickets through that. Members, I know we're pushing time, um, and I suggest that we take a short break after um, this um, item. Members are, are happy with that. So, Mayor, we'll jump. Mayor, sorry, Mayor. <clears throat> Mayor, do you mind if I request that we take a short break now, like five minutes, if you don't mind, it's John Boyle here. I, I know it, it is, John, um, but we're trying to get this done, so I'm suggesting that we take this first of all, and then we'll take a break after that, unless um, there's a further proposal, um, which I'm happy to, to hear. I'll have to run to the toilet, you I'm afraid, Mayor, thank you. That's grand, John, thank you very much. Members, um, we're heading on, um, so over to yourself, John. Thank you, uh, members. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I, I will be brief, pardon the pun. Um, just very, very quickly, members, in, the, in relation to the first two slides, very quick update on the corporate situation. Obviously, during the month of July, we held socially distant physical council committees. Uh, 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 in the broadest terms, they, they worked quite well. I know there were a number of issues uh, with a number of members shielding. We will fix that uh, for September. And uh, Paul has put in place um, some more technology that will ease that situation. Obviously, this evening, this evening given the numbers and uh, given the potential length of the meeting and issues associated with um, refreshments, uh, we felt it would be uh, very unwise uh, to hold the meeting socially distanced physically this evening. So thank you, members, uh, for the late notice to hold it remotely. Um, the guilt hall opened to the public on July 14th. Um, we're seeing a reasonable uh, number of people through the doors, and the mayor is currently um, also now holding external meetings, although they're all very carefully uh, socially distanced. Uh, Harbour House is now also operational with restricted capacity for members and staff. And if we move to the next slide, please, Paul. Um, all of our senior leadership teams are now back as physical, socially distant meetings, um, which are actually held here in the council chamber uh, on Tuesdays. Um, we will probably uh, toggle those um, between socially distanced and uh, virtual moving forward. Council offices are now all opened again for staff. Um, they've each and every single room um, has been risk assessed, and there's a lot of new signage in the buildings. Each and every room has a sticker on it, um, which indicates the maximum occupancy. Uh, we are still encouraging staff to work from home uh, where possible, uh, to keep in touch with their head of service and their director. Um, and we are also now beginning to have um, where they are absolutely necessary. Uh, socially distanced uh, meetings with external partners if they can't be done effectively by WebEx. Um, moving on to the next slide, uh, we propose to open the offices uh, for a limited um, uh, extent to the public on Monday the 27th of July. We've put in screens, we've put in signage, lots of sanitation. Uh, lots of uh, information in place. We will manage uh, any visitors, uh, although they will be very limited into the building and they will be escorted. Um, the meeting rooms all have maximum usage, modified layouts, uh, sanitization and signs in place. And we have designated uh, toilets for public use for those who are visiting um, the building. I'll pass over to each of the directors for a very quick run through uh, each of the directorates, starting with Karen McFarland on Health and Communities, Mayor. Uh, Mayor members, um, this, the slides are there for your review. Um, just very quickly, the Health and Community Committee considered in detail phased return to leisure and sport, and the detail of that discussion is contained within the confidential minutes uh, for this evening's meeting. Obviously, it takes into account the timelines and regulation changes and public health guidance. So our proposal is that the Tier 1 sites would um, open firstly. Templemore, Foil Arena and Riversdale, along with Derg Valley Leisure Centre to give some rural coverage. There are significant uh, measures in place to provide assurance and safety um, for both the staff and the public, and we will be releasing a, a safety video um, as part of the uh, PR for this meeting. Um, in terms of industry guidance, and the proposal is with the gyms and classes first, um, but as you will appreciate, um, given public health guidance, uh, there are limitations around the capacity, the housekeeping, the sanitisation, and the fact that there will be a change of users' um, behaviour to include um, becoming um, to the centre as, as gym ready. We've done a consultation with over 1,700 people, 
Um, and that process will on go um, as we look at the implications around um, the uh, reopening of swimming um, and other activities. Moving um, to slide two, um, our outdoor sports and recreation facilities have reopened. There's relatively strong demand, particularly for football pitches across the district. And we are planning um, the uh, review um, of the reopening of community centres following the regulation changes. Uh, the births, deaths and marriages services are fully operational across both the city and Straban from Monday, um, obviously an appointment basis only um, and with death registrations currently remaining online. Um, marriages and civil partnerships in line with the new guidance will be facilitated on a risk assessment basis. Um, and as agreed at Health and Community Committee, um, we will be bringing a report on toilet provision um, to the September uh, meeting uh, for decisions um, from yourselves. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. And moving ahead now into environment and regeneration, a quick update from Karen Phillips, please, Karen. Thank you. And through you, Chair, members, uh, as you're aware, our play parks and muggas opened on the 10th of July. Uh, we now have eight of our recycling centres opened um, with three still closed due to social distancing and traffic management requirements. Members uh, Glen Dermot and Eglinton, we are currently working very hard to get those open as quickly as possible. And um, we've been liaising closely with the health and safety executive who are happy with uh, the um, arrangements actually within our sites, but it's the wider traffic management um, plans for the wider sites that um, are still to be um, agreed. And that we're working very hard with the owners of those sites in relation to that. Um, our parks remain open, our cemeteries remain open and steward and arrangements, as you are aware, were stepped down and that's all working well. Um, and members, our street cleanse and refuge services and grounds maintenance services are all on ongoing. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Members, in terms of the status of some of our capital developments, um, which were awarded contracts prior to the say in terms of the Donamana changing units, um, members, that is work is now complete. Um, in terms of Ardigarvan grass pitches, uh, members, uh, the site has, was temporarily reopened for the sowing of grass surfaces, and the, the contractors expected to return um, when they can obtain specialist fencing and netting materials. Uh, in terms of top of the hill community centre, the site uh, was restarted and work is due to complete tomorrow, subject to the final inspection. Um, in terms of Chantalo community centre, the site reopened and works are progressing well. Uh, in terms of the Northwest Greenways project, uh, Route 3 in Straban uh, had recommenced on site um, and that's progressing again well. The Lee Fair, Fair uh, ball catch works are now completed on site and the Mourn Play Park uh, Village Renewal Scheme works have recommenced on site and are progressing well. Um, and in terms of visit dairy, works have recommenced on site and we expect that to finish in early September. Uh, members, if you move, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, Bishop Street Car Park, again, the contractor is appointed and has commenced now on site. Uh, Castle Derrick shared space. Uh, the contractor has been appointed and we expect them to, stay, to start on site in August. Uh, Castle Derrick uh, Castle access improvements. Again, we expect them to start on site in August. Um, and in terms of the Appalachian Trail, there's uh, a few outstanding lands issues. And once they're uh, completed, we will appoint the contractor. Um, in terms of the Straban Canal access improvements, um, we are still awaiting some land agreements to allow the Gribbons works to start on site, but the contractor's been uh, appointed well and the canal works are actually progressing. In terms of Melvin Arena improvements, members, you will be aware that planning approval has been awarded. The contractor is appointed and we expect them to start on site in August. Uh, the Riverbank restoration works, both contracts have been appointed and we expect a start date again in August. Um, and in terms of Sion Mills Play Park and Maher Mason Play Park, the contractors are appointed and we expect a start date in August again. Um, thank you. If we move on to the final slide, uh, members, all other relevant capital projects are um, actually progressing in accordance 
with that agreed at uh, Governance and Strategic Planning Committee in, in October uh, 2019. A few milestones. Uh, the design team has been appointed for the Newgate Cultural um, Centre. Uh, the tender for the Riverine Design team, team has been issued. Uh, the tender for the Glenview uh, Design Team appointment will be issued very shortly. Um, and the tender for Park Footbridge uh, has appointment will be again be issued very shortly. Um, and the tender for the Spare and Sculpture Trail will be retendered very shortly. Um, thank you, members. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Karen. And through you, Chair, passing over to Stephen for business and culture. Thanks, John. Um, in terms of business and culture members, obviously our car parks reopened to charging on the, the 1st of July. Um, they've been operating um, quite well and the revenues are growing steadily, uh, increasing in terms of numbers, probably up to about 50, 60 percent of what they were previously. Um, the Tower Museum is reopened to the public on a reduced hours and uh, that's going very well with numbers quite strong. Uh, about approximately 70 to 100 each day over the last uh, uh, week or so. Um, the Alley Theatre has reopened again on a reduced hours and the Tourist Information Office is available, although the cafe remains closed as the operator is, is unable to return at this stage. And obviously at this stage, there's obviously still no ticketed program either. And Harbour House is now fully operational and available for booking for members. Thank you. Okay, thank you officers, Mayor uh, and members. That's a, a very brief update uh, with regard to the current recovery situation. And obviously, um, we're all here to take any questions or queries you may have on that or anything else that may arise. Thank you. Thank you, John um, and the officers. Members, there's a, a number of indicated speakers. The first is Councillor Mellon. Um, Aileen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thank you very much to the council staff for the update. Um, I'm sure, Mayor, you see, we might have noticed um, together and along with the Bell Air there, we've been waiting patiently to see information come through for the Gelia Community Centre. I would just like to point out this is the second time it's been left off an updated list, a uh, COVID update briefing. Um, I know that's obviously administrative. Um, difficulties or mistakes, but just to keep that noted, I know that Fergal had given update to myself, um, Karen, a few days ago to say that the contractors would be on site mid the end of August. Um, could you give a bit of an update? Is that, is that for them to, to start on site or is that a site visit? Or um, what what is the time frame there? Because we haven't had an update with this um, particular community centre in terms of the post-COVID briefings for this is the second time. So if anybody could answer that, that would be great. Uh, through you, Chair, members, I don't have that information today, but we can get someone to contact you tomorrow in relation to that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Could I just make sure that, okay. just in that um, it's a, it's a site visit. Is it a site visit on the mid day in August, or is contractors ready and in place? Uh, and that's probably what I would like a wee bit more detail on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you uh, for for that, um, Councillor Mellon. Um, remember, if it's all right, we usually want to take um, all of the questions and then the the relevant officers, and we'll 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 come back with with your queries. Um, next is Alderman McClintock. Thanks, Mayor. And I just want to thank John and the three directors for the report. Um, it's good these reports are getting briefer because we're on top of all of these things now, which is absolutely great. We're going in the right way. And I think it's good that there is a positive message coming out now that we are reopening uh, different um, places and the, the the rebuilding and the contract work starting. And I think that is good that the positive mes message is going out from council. I just want to, it's no question, but I just want to thank the individual officers because sometimes it's easier to deal with these things with the individual officers and they have taken numerous calls from us and dealt with them very efficiently. And I think that really is the way forward. So I'm not going to prolong things by asking any questions now, but just to thank you for all your uh, perseverance whenever we do ask with all, all the different questions that come our way. But good to see that things are moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Alderman McClantic. Councillor Mooney. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you to John and the management team for their um, update. Just two matters really pertain to the water side. Um, I have been asked to ask this meeting about any possible uh, dates for the opening of Glen Dermot Resettlement Centre. Um, there seems to be a lot of frustration out there amongst um, residents in the water side about the closure, and uh, they would just like some um, idea if there was any possible date for reopening. And secondly, um, I've been asked by uh, numerous residents as well over the past while uh, if um, it could be possible if, if the urban areas of the water side could be prioritised for the brown bin rollout. We understand there may be, there's possibly about 7,000 left contributed, but if that would be possible. Um, again, there's a certain degree of frustration about these bins not getting out quick enough to residents of the water side. But I'll be grateful for any response in raising that there. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Sir John. Councillor Logue. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a very uh, brief two questions. The first one's around the cemetery opening. Um, sorry, I'll step out here just to the take this off. Uh, just the opening hours of the cemetery. Um, it's still 2.30 for the city cemetery, so if you could give me uh, some more information on that, please, when it's going to resume the normal hours. And just the resumption of the uh, external maintenance, grass cutting, etc. When is that going to uh, resume to uh, normal routes? To thank you. Thank you, Councillor Log. Um, Councillor Harkin. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I had a few things that I wanted to raise. Uh, one is um, so uh, it, it's been brought to my attention that the that the council. Uh, is covering the capital costs to make the council owned and community managed community centres COVID ready for the return of uh, the public in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but that there, the, and there's a request that the council play a role in uh, making sure that um, community owned centres in Rosemount and Bally McGroarty uh, access funding to do the same. Uh, and I think that this is very important, obviously, from a health and safety point of view. Uh, obviously, those centres can apply, but it'll probably take quite a while for a uh, turnaround for funding. Uh, so there is a request that we look into uh, funding uh, to do that, help to do health and safety prepared. This funding from the um, uh, DFC Community Service Programme. So that's really a question in regard to that, uh, if, if there's anything we can do. Uh, and then a few other questions. One is... Um, I, 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 it's obviously the case that there was a there was some magnificent uh, work and effort made by everybody through the community resilience plan, uh, and I think we've acknowledged that and we commended people for for their efforts. Uh, and some of it, as we know, is still ongoing. Much of it has been scaled back uh, already. Um, I do think it it would be very useful for the council to lead a review. Uh, of the work that was done, because uh, as has been acknowledged, there was some excellent work, but there was also some frustration uh, uh, by people within the community resilience pl plan and effort, but also people who felt excluded from it. Uh, and this has been raised that uh, through council meetings, uh, through the report meetings, but also meetings, uh, full council meetings. So I would ask that there be a uh, a review of the community resilience plan um, that uh, that uh, our uh, that councillors are involved in, with strategic managers and and people who are at the centre of it, to see what lessons can be gained uh, in order to make it. Uh, if we ever have to go back to it, which is, unfortunately is a real possibility, uh, that we that we learn all the lessons and implement it so that more people are involved uh, and uh, there's less frustration around that. Uh, and then the, the last couple of questions that I have are, one, uh, I felt that the uh, response from the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister to the Council's call for a recognition payment for frontline workers across the different sectors was really inadequate. And they don't seem to have taken that up uh, at all as a serious proposal. It seems to have been uh, dropped. Um, uh, 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 these things were popular when we were dependent on frontline workers. Now they seem to be going. Uh, they seem to be getting buried. 
So I, I will be uh, bringing that forward through the various committees uh, because I don't think it should be dropped. And I, and I know all our councillors feel the same way. Uh, and connected to that is the, uh, there was a call from this council to support a recognition payment for our own frontline workers. Um, I know that there was a planned paper. Uh, I, I didn't actually read the planned paper. Uh, if there was a planned paper, um, uh, if there was a report on that, uh, and I missed it, uh, I, I, I apologise, but I, I don't remember it coming through for discussion. Um, I know that there was a surplus uh, in terms of our budget. Um, and uh, I, I think that we can't forget the tremendous efforts that uh, frontline staff in the council and beyond met, met made. Uh, and we may be in a situation where we're asking them to do it all over again. Um, as the, you know, we've, we've, we've had the scare now of this spike through Limavati and beyond. Um, and we're not meeting in the guilt hall, obviously, today out of health, health and safety concerns. Um, so I think that uh, we can't forget the uh, great contributions of frontline workers uh, through the pandemic. Uh, and and uh, I don't think it would be well received that these um, discussions were dropped when we when we come to ask them to do, do it all over again, if that's necessary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Alderman McCain. Thank you, Mayor, for letting me in. Uh, a wee quick question directed at, at Karen Phillips. Uh, is there any advice in Castle Park, Castle Derg? That's all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Alderman McCain. And we'll hopefully get you an answer when we when we get to all the questions out of the way. Alderman Guy. Thanks, Mayor, for letting me in there. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to echo what Councillor Mooney says about the Glen Dermot Road recycling. Um, any more word on that? And the brown buds being released in the final phase. Uh, I just, how are we uh, progressing with uh, pavement trading and working with DFI and the closure of streets, whether it be for a one way system or full street closures? And the cycle lane along the foil embankment. Has all work stopped in that? Because were we not supposed to cut down a lane along the foil embankment for traffic? I remember passing it and there was eight people standing with luminous yellow jackets and hard hats on and one man down a hole working. But there's been no more. It seems they've all died away. Uh, there was a load of vigour about that at the start, but it's gone. And the leisure centre survey, um, and I may have missed this, maybe Karen did say this, but uh, in regards to the booking system through the app, uh, how long before that will be up and running? And that's basically all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Guy. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, there's a few points, like the other Waterside councillors. Um, again, I'm getting a lot of queries around the Glendemmet Road Recycling Centre. Um, so, any update on that? And I appreciate that. You know, council officers are working hard on it. Um, they come to a resolution, but there's there's a lot of there's a lot of frustration out there. Um, it's a facility that's that's well used within the watershed. Um, I've I wanted to come on and specifically thank officers. Um, it would be remiss of me to let the pass to let the completion of the work at the Table Hill Community Centre go without comment. Um. It's been a, mu a much anticipated project. There was a lot of work that went done there from a council end. And I want to acknowledge the role, um, particularly with, uh, with, with Karen McFarland's uh, department. Um, there was a lot of work that went done there, um, work alongside the local community. And I just want to um, pass on my appreciation for, for that. And I, I know, the, the campaign for Tapa Hill Community Centre um, has been has been going on for thirty years, and we didn't expect um, that when we finally got the project completed, um, it would be in the current climate where um, the local community wouldn't have the access to it that we would have expected. Um, but again, uh, I still I, I still don't want um, this uh, uh, this sort of landmark the 
Pash, Bethoy Comment, um, and it's a, and thank all the work that's went on it. In relation to a comment from Councillor Harkin in relation to the Community Resilience Plan, um, I for one have been very proud to be part of the Community Resilience Plan. Um, and not only during COVID-19, but in any emergency within our community, um, I look, I'd like to stand beside my neighbours, um, local community workers, and, um, and, and youth workers. They respond to the needs of the local community at almost every, um, at, 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 in every incident. Um, I don't believe that elected representatives should be getting special treatment. I don't believe that we should be having the, the red carpet rolled out for us. Um, I think that we should be um, we, we should be there um, on hand. Uh, as it should be natural. Um, I don't uh, the, this idea that elected representatives deserve special treatment um, against it, it flies it, it flies in the face of the, the the local community response that we've witnessed over recent months. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to uh, and John for the presentation. Um, it's just on the back of the comments made by um, Councillor Harkin. Um, just I too have been lobbied um, from those um, community workers who who uh, who run community halls and centres throughout the city and the district, and particularly Straban. Um, who are not in council ownership, and I, I too would like to uh, call on council uh, to work with those uh, community groups and, and, and halls and centres in terms of um, doing a risk assessment before they open up. They are struggling to put safety measures in place. They don't have the assistance or the, the support financially or otherwise to ensure that their centres are fit for purpose. Uh, for reopening. So if, if council could look at ways of engaging with those uh, community halls uh, and, and to support them uh, going forward, um, it would be very much appreciated. They do feel that they're out in a limb um, uh, as opposed to other centres having that um, support of council and, and, and they don't. So, so going forward, I would appreciate if council could do that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Boyle. Councillor McKinney. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for letting me in there. Uh, just thank you to John and his team there for sort of keeping us updated. Uh, I'd also just like to say I totally agree with the sentiments from Councillor and many of the guards to Brian Benz and the opening of recycle centres. And with regard to what Alderman McGuy said about the uh, road closures, widening pavements, etc., and also about uh, street trading. Um, I hope the council can maybe take into account that those with impaired vision, I've had quite a few emails through about it, and maybe they could just take it into account. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor McKinney. Last speaker, or last indicated speaker um, on this is Councillor Harkin. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I appreciate uh, that uh, uh, Councillor uh, Michaela Boyle uh, raised supported that similar issue on the uh, community-owned uh, centres. I think that's very important from health and safety. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know what Councillor Jackson's talking about in terms of rolling out the red carpet for councillors. That's not what I was talking about at all. Um, I do think we should have an assessment uh, of the community resilience plan. Uh, I think that there was some excellent work done uh, brilliant effort by many of the volunteers, uh, but there was also, as everybody knows, some frustrations. Uh, so I think it would only be fair to uh, uh, have an assessment meeting led by the council uh, to hear what those were in order to strengthen the community resilience plan. Unless Councillor Jackson wants to argue that it's absolutely perfect uh, and doesn't need anything uh, else added to it, uh, which I which I would doubt. So my proposal was uh, not to roll out the red carpet for any councillors. Uh, uh, I, I, I would just put, like to point out that Councillor Jackson's sitting at home uh, right now, uh, uh, which some people might consider a red carpet, uh, while other workers are, are at work and are being 
uh, encouraged to go back to work. Um, um, and uh, so, you know. Sorry, I don't, I don't think that's a fair point because um, Councillor Jackson would have, like many of us, been prepared to come on here today. Um, but we obviously took the decision to, to do this meeting by WebEx um, and where he's sitting um, at the moment um, isn't a, a, a topic of, of discussion um, on this meeting. So I don't think that that's a fair point. So we're moving on. Um, there's been a lot of questions asked there um, of officers. So I'm going to ask John to take the lead um, and, and address the ones that he can. And those that he can't, um, um, he will obviously um, delegate to officers. So John, yourself, please. Thanks, Mayor. I'll run through these uh, as quickly as possible and maybe ask uh, colleagues, both Karen's actually, uh, to pick up on, on quite a few of them as well. But we'll, we'll keep it as quick as possible, um, given the time. Um, thanks thanks for all of the comments, members. Uh, look, in respect of the uh, community centres that are under construction and on back on site again, um, I know they have been... Uh, required by the communities for a very long time. Um, it's it's only within the last uh, three to four years that um, we've actually, as a new council, been able to secure the funding for them, put in place resources to deliver them. So it's absolutely fantastic at this stage to see so many of those new facilities either being built or just about to be finished. Uh, and uh, uh, Councillor Mellon, I can only uh, but apologise uh, that Gallia dropped off the list. It certainly isn't off the list in terms of its priority on site. Um, so we'll uh, we'll make sure we get you an update on that. Glendermott Road um, Household Recycling Centre members, it's it's as frustrating uh, to us as officers as it is to uh, residents that that facility still remains closed. We've worked really closely with HSENI uh, to get that reopened. There's an extent, an element of this that is beyond our control in relation to the wider traffic management uh, of the site, as the other businesses on that site have reopened, HSE and I have requested of the owner of the overall site uh, a traffic management plan. Um, as I understand it, HSE are absolutely content with how we are managing the site within the cartilage of the overall site, but want to see a traffic management plan for that overall site, which includes uh, how the traffic is managed for the many private sector businesses within that area. So there's a big degree of this out with our control. We have offered to work with the private owner to assist the owner in drawing up the traffic management plan. And uh, I think we're working very closely with them on that. So hopefully there will be some movement on that soon. But it's just to reassure you members that there is an exceptional amount of work going on in the background to try to get that reopened. Um, and it's not fully within our own control. Um, with regard to pavement trading, um, we are, of course, um, uh, uh, as part of the consultation, um, consulting with uh, disability groups. Um, the uh, temporary arrangements that we've put in place have seen a number of applications coming through from a number of cafes. So it's been very welcome um, that Council has taken that approach. And I know that Karen and her team are continuing to work with DFI in relation to temporary street closures and uh, the potential for a closure of the lane of foil embankment uh, to encourage greater walking and cycling and reduction of space for vehicles. I think a number of those proposals are currently actually uh, with the Minister uh, for consideration. Some of these won't be easy, members, and some of them will draw undoubtedly short-term criticism, particularly as the city gets busier, busier with traffic. But if we are trying to make uh, positive change, um, um, it is it is important that we try to take this time to 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 try to reprioritize road space where it's possible, um, and maybe Karen Phillips will want to say a little more about that. The cemetery opening hours, as I understand it, remain as they are um, at this moment in time. Um, grass cutting services are pretty much back up to speed right across the whole council area. Although again, Karen may would want to um, come back in with some of the comments on that. Um, we will, of course, like everything. Uh, review uh, where we are um, with regard to uh, any service area and um, Martin Daly um, will be liaising um, with the community resilience groups and others including yourselves on um, best practice with regard to the community resilience plans. Uh, paper in relation to um, the recognition uh, of council workers, uh, Paula has been looking at that uh, considering some options, and we will bring that paper to you as soon as possible, uh, members, for consideration after the recess. Um, 
in relation to some of the leisure survey stuff and support for uh, community centres that are not in council ownership. I'll ask Karen McFarland uh, to come in with regard to, to some of that. We will, of course, make available to uh, any of our uh, colleagues in the community sector all of the advice that is available to us. We're happy to collate all of that and to point them in the right direction and steer them in the right direction uh, and to help them uh, understand how to uh, undertake risk assessments uh, where these are required. So we'll do what we can um, with regard to that. So I'll pass over in the first instance to Karen Phillips, Mayor, to pick up on some of the specifics I may have left out. And then if I could ask when Karen's finished, Karen McFarland, please picks up. Thank you. Thank you, John, and through you, Chair, uh, members, uh, just to echo John's uh, discussion around Glen Dermot, we are working very hard on that site. We share members' frustration. Our environmental health team is working with the owner of the site, and there's a further meeting on site tomorrow um, to consider that, um, and we need to engage the HSE um, to get their site off on that, which we hope to do as quickly as possible. Uh, in terms of grass cutting and maintenance, members, we have had an awful um, lot to catch up on. We believe that we're pretty much back to as normal as we, we can be. But if members have any specific uh, issues uh, in relation to grass cutting or maintenance, please contact either myself or, as you know, the streetscape manager, John Quinn, who can help out with any queries in relation to that. And members, in terms of the ongoing work in terms of COVID recovery in the city centre and the town centre, an awful lot further work has happened in relation to that. Um, and we've been liaising with uh, DFI in relation to road closures. Um, they have sought further assurance from us that that council is supportive of their um, you know, their, their suggestion around uh, closing the lane along the river, which we have fed back that, yes, Council is supportive of that. Um, and indeed, members, uh, we believe that the DFC hopefully should be in a position to um, move forward with the COVID fund um, in, the, in the coming days, uh, which we hope uh, that we can get out uh, on the ground, both in terms of physical interventions and also business support uh, in the very, very short term. Uh, members, just a few other minor points. Brown bins, we are doing our best to get the third roll out, out as quickly as possible. Um, and members will try and provide you with an email update on that um, over the next week or so um, and to let you know the specific time scales in terms of that. Um, and indeed, we are continuing to assess the cemetery opening hours. We will um, again come back to you should there be any change. Um, and in terms of the toilets at Castle Park, uh, members, we will come back to you with an update in relation to that as well. It's not part of the normal the current scheme that we have, but we will again continue to look for potential to uh, consider what we can do on that site. Um, so I think that's pretty much uh, it, and I'll pass over to Karen McFarland. Uh, Mayor members, starting uh, firstly with the community centres issue. So um, as we, we've uh, been uh, in the meeting, um, Stephen Gillespie has offered the services of his um, event safety team um, to assist organisations um, look at the risk assessment and any other related to, um, health and safety work. So if you want to let either Stephen or I know of any specific groups, um, we'll ensure that um, we get that um, resource available to them as quickly um, as possible. Um, I suppose in terms of the financial aspect, and it could become quite a considerable ask if you look at the number of voluntary community centres there are, um, we'll explore what possibilities are there. Um, and it may well be something that we may present um, to the um, uh, DSC um, departments. Um, there is guidance expected in terms of the opening of community centres from the department. Again, we will share that. And we have built up quite a big resource um, of templates of webinars and so forth in relation to the opening of facilities. So we'll look at how that can be packaged um, and made, made available. Um, in terms of the booking app, um, the app is in testing at the moment. Um, we would ideally have liked to have it for the 7th. It may be a few weeks later than that date. Um, but in response to the user feedback, that's the key mechanism that people want to use to start to bigger facilities that than that on the web. Um, as such, 
Um, and in regard to the resilience um, funds, um, obviously Martin Daly will have his role to play there, um, but our officers where possible will assist um, in reviewing um, and, and taking feedback and input um, from other areas of the relief effort, um, including um, the food box scheme. So hopefully members that covers all of those issues. Okay, uh, members um, and officers, thank you very much um, for those uh, detailed presentations and obviously uh, the updates uh, which followed. I think all um, members' queries have been answered. And members, I know that I suggest that we would take a, a, a break after um, the COVID update, but the delegated authority uh, to the Chief Executive during summer recess is the next item. And then we're moving on to notices of motion. So I want to suggest that we take that item. Um, first of all, hopefully it will be um, quite quick uh, that we move through it. And then we so will proposed. Deliver it. So proposed by Councillor Duffy, I think that was. Yeah. 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 Um, can so I get a second? Uh, Mayor Martin, right here. Yeah. There we go. Um, any other members? Um, any input or no? Okay, members. Um, I know we've been at this for quite some time. Um, I'm going to suggest that we take a break at this point before we head on to the notices of motion um, for the second half. And I'm suggesting members that we take a, a 20 minute um, break, which will bring us back at quarter to eight. Um, so if members can try and be back online um, for around quarter to eight, um, that would be good. Thank you.
okay, members. Um, if we're all uh, back on and, and ready to go, we'll uh, kick off with item number 11, our notices of motion. And just before we do that, can I just remind members that the protocol in terms of remote meetings is three minutes speaking if you're proposing a motion, two minutes if you're responding, um, and you will only get on to speak once um, on a particular motion. And I would ask members just to adhere to that, um, and we'll get through this a, a lot quicker. The first notice of motion is in the name of Councillor Paul Fleming. Councillor Fleming. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you, Brian. Did you say three minutes, Brian? I? Three minutes to propose, yes. Three minutes to propose. If I could take the motion as read, Brian, and ask for one of our people or somebody to second it, please. Yep. Second thank you. Seconded by Councillor Duffy, I think that was. Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Fleming, go ahead. Okay. Okay, Brian, thanks. Uh, what a technical here, but Brian, uh, as I said, taking the motion is read, and obviously in terms of uh, the motion uh, against the backdrop without going into it in terms uh, what we, we've all known and lived through in terms of uh, uh, the past and uh, the economic inequalities and uh, in terms of regional inequalities. But the motion is in regard to obviously across a number of uh, modes of, of transport. We have uh, all of us have tried to be, uh, uh, address that balance and balance and obviously a, a key part of our own uh, strategic uh, growth plan within uh, within the council, and in terms of uh, rail, uh, we have uh, obviously seen a number of progressions in rail, albeit after a, a period of time. We've seen phases one and two. We've seen the hub uh, delivered, albeit they're still working on it, but in essence delivered. And we've also seen an increased number of passengers using the facility and uh, the benefits that it brings to this city and, and, uh, and wider region. And in that regard, we also welcome the statement of uh, the 10th of June from Minister Nicola Mallon uh, in relation to it actually being back uh, on the table after uh, been taken off during the period of, of storming been down. So we, we see that as very important uh, we understand the minister has asked for a, a feasibility study, conscious of years ago. Uh, the fact that, that this one, uh, in terms of it not being a long, drawn out process, bearing in mind uh, the, the discernible gap in real services in the Northwest, and not just in the North, but obviously taken in uh, the broader Northwest and, and the island, which is something that we believe needs to be addressed as well. So in terms of uh, calling for the, the feasibility study to be done as quickly as possible, but as but also thoroughly and an opportunity also to take a look at all our aspects in terms of uh, not just the improvement of the track between Eglinton and Downhill, but also as there are other things, uh, attributes that can be added to it. Uh, in terms of all our halting uh, uh, stops along the way and, and passing loops, obviously they give us better uh, frequency and also better safety. Some people suggest that if the track isn't addressed, that over a period of time, it will become a, a bigger a bigger issue. And also in terms of the wider aspect and in terms of uh, the whole transport uh, piece as we see it, in the region, but also how it links Sunday, the, the wider island in terms of the Western Transport Corridor, the, the greater frequency of trains to uh, Dublin, uh, and in terms of the, the, the speed of which that they can go. So the phase three uh, to us and to obviously a, a lot of our people, and we would also uh, welcome uh, everyone to be into the one voice in this, uh, in terms of ensuring that the the feasibility study is done as quickly as possible, as thoroughly as possible, and that the phase three is still able to start in the, the date 2021. And uh, I also had uh, contact 
earlier from uh, Councillor Mary Durkin, who uh, uh, kindly furnished me with a, an amendment uh, in terms of because not just in terms of the, the Department of Infrastructure, but obviously the wider responsibility and as all well, to deliver these major key infrastructure projects, uh, we will be accepting uh, Councillor Durkin's amendment for me. Um, for that, uh, Councillor Fleming. Councillor Durkin. The fair, uh, just to check, uh, uh, I'm useless at this multitasking. Is the wording of my amendment on the on the screen? I did email it earlier. There. Oh, there, that's going up. Yeah, it's just simply at the end, calling for the Minister of Infrastructure and the wider executive. Can we get a seconder for that amendment, Councillor Durkin? Um, well, Councillor Fleming's accepting it. That no. Still has to go to the. It still it has to go Martin to the floor. Riley. Martin Riley. Yeah, Councillor Riley seconded. It. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Durkin. All right. Well, yes, very happy to support this motion and um, okay. thank Councillor Fleming for bringing it. The phase three upgrade has been the subject of at least two motions at full council some of, of this term in the last 13 months or 14 months and that has also been raised at the government committee uh, councillor fleming's correct the feasibility study was nine years of frontage um phase one and two were completed phase three was never completed the failure of Stormont to deliver the implementation of phase three in the last decade is symptomatic of the absence of regional balance and symptomatic of the chronic economic neglect of the northwest and yes we've had that for years but that did continue under the Stormont administration of the last decade phase three works were delayed and frustrated under the watch of relevant ministers and and the executive so that was last decade now we've had new decade new approach regional balance is a key priority uh, the five executive parties have signed up for that, and we really need to see delivery in this regard. So the Minister for Infrastructure, Minister Mellon, has made it palpably clear that she's committed and that the SDLP is committed uh, to delivery of phase three, uh, and indeed more than that, phase three is a starting point, and she wants to see it in her mandate. Time and time again, she's indicating her commitment to tackling regional imbalance and connecting communities and also to tackling climate emergency. Now, this motion quite rightly points at the, the, the importance of a transportation network for economic recovery, but investment in rail is also so vital in reducing carbon emission levels and in tackling climate emergency. That's a, the subject of a motion later this evening. And climate action is also a key priority addressed in New Decade, New Approach. So really, if this executive is serious about their commitments in New Decade, New Approach, and they want to show that they're serious about climate emergency and about regional balance, then completion of phase three must be delivered. Um, in terms Arthur of- Arthur Durkin, can I ask you to bring your remarks to a close, okay, please? Okay. The funding, reg the, in terms of why the feasibility study was directed, it's because of funding regulations for executive spending because of the delay the last time. I just want to say, um, pay tribute to Into the West for all their work and campaigning on this issue. Without them, we wouldn't be having a debate about phase three. But also, Mayor, if you just indulge me, one of the Can you be quite members, Durkin, please? one of the founding members of Into the West has passed away. He found um, during the pandemic, Colin Joyce. And uh, it's just to record condolences. Um, we heard um, lovely public tributes by Councillor McCann, who's also a, a founding member, but it's to record our condolences. And um, it was very sad and we pay tribute to him and indeed to the other founders of Into the West for the work they've done since 2001. Thank you, Councillor Durga. Um, and we have a, an amendment members are on the floor. I've got three indicated speakers, Councillor. McClintock, McCann, and McKinney. Are you all looking to speak on the amendment or on the original motion? On the amendment. Councillor McClintock, go ahead. Thanks, Mayor, for that, Mayor. Um, I think 
everybody in this chamber, virtual chamber, I'm sure will agree that infrastructure is essential to us from the Northwest if we're going to capitalise on the city deal and other investment in our region. Um, phases one and two, as has been said, have been very successful. I believe phase one increased the numbers using the railway by something in the region of 60%. Uh, we can't wait for phase three. We do need it. We do need the feasibility study um, updated urgently. Um, there has, of course, been historical underinvestment in the whole Northwest and in particular in our railway infrastructure. And I think we do need faster trains. We do need more frequent services. We do need express services. And all of these are for increasing our tourism potential, our business uh, potential for the students, for the for the day tripper and for everybody else. So I think the amount of money involved in this, uh, as has been um, identified by the Into the West group, is small compared to what some other infrastructure um, projects have required, have needed. Uh, but it's very, very important. I think we can't have any more excuses or any more delays on this. And although I think fundamentally this lies with the Minister for Infrastructure, I certainly take on board the point by Councillor Durkin that it's a wider executive does need to look at this, particularly with the whole climate change and the other benefits. So we will be supporting this motion before us. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman McClintock. Um, Councillor McCann. On the my, uh, oh, oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Eamon, Eamon, you yes, don't is, my, on the amendment? Uh, is, is my amendment uh, available to be put up on screen? No, I have to take, Eamon, um, I have to take Mayor, uh, Councillor Durkin's amendment first. Okay. Um, so if we can take that, I'll come back to you just okay. Get on. Get on. Thank you. Um, members, Councillor McKinney has indicated that he's also looking to speak on the, the motion. Um, uh, the original motion by Councillor Fleming. I have no other indicated speakers on Councillor Durkin's amendment, so I'm going to put that amendment to the floor now. Um, and members, I'm not hearing any dissent, so um, I'm going to take the amendment as is read, and I'll come back to Councillor McCann. Ah. Councillor McCann. Okay, can my amendment's uh, not lengthy, but there's a fair amount in it, so can it be put up on the screen rather than me reading it out? Yeah, have you provided it to committee staff? Yeah, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure Teresa will get it. Oh, there it is. There, um, ah, yeah, it was just coming online there now. Yeah, get on. So, we need a seconder, um, Councillor McCann, for that amendment. Seconded, seconded by Councillor Harkin. Go ahead, um, Councillor McCann. Um, okay, and... go ahead. I could say there's seven or eight paragraphs in that. I mean, in the interest of you know saving time, I'd rather not read it all out if that's okay uh, with people. Uh, the the it, 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 my, my amendment does ask a number of questions of Translink and of uh, the department, and you can read them there. I mean, uh, they're not intended to be aggressive uh, questions. They are intended to tease out sort of how we have got or part of how we have got a uh, to this uh, uh, situation. I. Uh, you know, we, I, it, 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 it may well be that a new feasibility study, an outline business case, are needed, but I'd want that uh, conveyed to me and explained to me, as would the uh, members of Into uh, uh, the West. I also query the time scale now envisaged uh, for a, a phase three to uh, proceed, because the way I read it and the way all, you know, in Into the West, other people in Into the West read it, is that on this basis, we are unlikely to see phase three up and operational until 2026. I don't think, and maybe even 2027, I don't think that's acceptable. So we should push harder. As uh, Jack Charson said, keep them under pressure. You know, and don't uh, anticipate sort of that we're going to get our way just because we deserve it. And also point out that real is, uh, for all the reasons Marty Durkin said about the environment and so on, but also uh, because of what is happening in the rest of these islands. Real is the coming thing. Real is going to be the main means as it ought to be of mass transportation here. And I'm looking at a copy of a, a, a Real magazine, British uh, magazine, with a headline, Beaching Reversals, 50 Schemes Taken Forward. Beaching was the guy who presided over the dismemberment of the real network in Britain uh, uh, in the 1960s. There are 50 schemes to reopen and refurbish lines closed in Britain in, uh, uh, in the 1960s. We also have in the south of Ireland, 
sort of announced that, uh, uh, last weekend the uh, uh, Minister for Rural Affairs, sort of Sean Kelly, announcing sort of new uh, a, a, a developments uh, uh, in the south, talking sort of about the Athenry to and Claire Morris Sligo rail line about to be refurbished and opened. The significance of that is particularly to do with Sligo, if we want sort of an, an all our uh, real network. And I'll finally on this, uh, I'll just read you, after a, a Minister Canny made his announcement, a uh, very uh, positive announcement, sort of in Galway sort of last week, the West on Track a, a campaign, sister campaign of Into the West, if you like, we work quite closely with them. They announced West on Track will now seek to ensure that these references form the basis of the rapid delivery of the next phase of the WRC, the Western Rail Corridor, from Galway to, uh, to Mayo. It also remains our firm objective to continue the railway northwards to Sligo and to support the development of a cross-border rail link from Derry to Donegal with the ultimate objective of linking the entire Western seaboard by rail. That is the vision that people have there. And you look at the it, 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 disused rail lines are being replaced and brought back into operation and stations and services in Scotland more than anywhere else, the new border rail line, uh, in England and in the Republic of Ireland. The only part of these islands where all disused rail lines are... Councillor McCann, I'm going to have to ask you to bring your remarks to a close, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Mayor, for letting me in there. Uh, I, I would totally agree with the sentiment, sir, from Councillor McCann. Uh, if anybody can remember back, a lot of you probably won't, there was a guy called Werner Hoyback. Werner Hoyback was in charge of, uh, as it was, an Ulster bus or the uh, Ulster transport. His idea was to completely get rid of the railways in Northern Ireland and move everything on the roads. And my fear would be that when the A6 is completed, that unless we get a push on with the rail, upgrading the rail, people will be forced onto the A6. And therefore, we'll also bring into uh, play what Mary spoke about earlier, about the uh, carbon footprint, etc. So we would be supporting this uh, motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Hey. Remember, I have no... Councillor Burton. And wishes to speak on the amendment. <clears throat> Councillor Turk, are you online there? Oh, that's right. Yes, yeah. Mayor. No, it's just simply that um, we're, we're happy to support this amendment. Uh, I think these questions are very valid uh, and we deserve the answer. So, and thank uh, Eamon McCann. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Member Tyson Waller indicated speakers on uh, the amendment by Councillor McCann. Um, and unless I'm hearing any dissent, I'm going to take the amendment as acceptable by you all. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, and returning now, um, obviously, to the has become the substantive motion. Um, and I've no indicated speakers at this point on the substantive motion. Okay, so before we go for the vote, members, I'm going to ask Councillor Fleming. Um, do you want to sum up, Councillor Fleming? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Brian. And Thanks to all of the contributors, and, and I think we're of one mind in this. Uh, it's just a bit unfortunate, and unfortunately, it creeps into a lot of things. The uh, same tired old rhetoric uh, from some people who seem to think that they aren't part of the executive when it suits them type thing. But the broader issue of, of uh, phase three, along with all of the other pro projects that we know that we need to deliver for all of the people that we all represent, then that, that's the more important uh, point and the more important issue that we all go forward on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fleming. Members, I'm going to put substantive motion to the floor. Um, and as I say, I haven't heard any dissenting voices. Um, and unless I hear any, I'm going to put take it um, that you're all content with the motion as it's read. Okay, members, um, the motion in the name of Councillor Fleming um, has been passed. Thank you, Councillor Fleming. Thank you, Brian. 
Moving on, um, the next motion is in the name of Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Donnelly. Chair, thank you, Chair. And the motion is given concerns over human rights breaches. This council calls on the 26th County Administration to do all in its power to reverse its decision to extradite Liam Campbell to Lithuania. Chair, Liam Campbell is a first. Before, just vote. before you go on, Gary, uh, Councillor Donnelly, if you don't mind, I just need to get a seconder for your for your motion. I'll second that, Chair. Councillor Gallagher seconded. Um, Councillor Donnelly, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Chair Liam Campbell is a 50 year, 58 year old county life man and is being sought for questioning in Lithuania regarding an attempt to procure firearms, a country he has never set foot in. His brother Michael was held in Lithuania for almost six years on trumped up charges. He was not permitted a phone call home for the first 21 months and no visitors for the first three years. Family were not allowed to be present in court and he had extremely limited access to translation during court proceedings. The case against Michael Campbell eventually collapsed at an appeal hearing. British and free state authorities refused to cooperate with the Lithuanian judicial system as it emerged that MI5 operatives had created the entire situation. It is widely believed that both refused to cooperate as it would reveal that both had prior knowledge of the entrapment and would, this would be exposed. Michael's lawyer stated that the appeal court had accepted the principle that a state cannot create a crime and convict a person for it. It should be noted that British intelligence lies led to the Iraq war resulting in millions of deaths and untold destruction. The same services who are behind this case. In a Belfast recorder's court, Ju Justice Burgess ruled that he was satisfied that extraditing Liam Campbell to Lithuania would expose him to a real risk of inhuman and degrading treatment by reason of the jail conditions. He refused extradition on the grounds that it was in contravention of Article 3 of the European Court of Human Rights. This decision was copper fastened by the High Court and Supreme Court rulings. At this point, Liam Campbell had spent four years in prison, most of which was spent in solitary confinement, which itself is a human rights violation. Lithuania has been censored on a number of occasions by the European Court of Human Rights. This crosses a number of issues which are relevant in this case. These include human, inhuman prison conditions, widespread corruption within the judicial system, and the abduction and torture of foreign prisoners by the CIA at secret rendition centres within Lithuania. All of this is on public record for anyone who is interested. It, you know, because someone is arrested for something, it does not mean they're guilty. And it is a sad indictment that the leader of a political party who lauds itself as a defender of civil and human rights has chosen to de deem Liam Campbell guilty. Colin Eastwood has indicated he will endeavour to send an Irish citizen to inhuman conditions in Lithuania. The fundamental basis of most systems of jurisprudence is innocent until proven guilty, a right denied to Liam Campbell by the SDLP. It puts the SDLP on the side of MI5 intrigue rather than the basic concept of human rights and four square against a resolution of the European Court of Human Rights. It is therefore no surprise for the SDLP to carry on this concept of prejudice and ignorance of long established due processes by Colin Meeswood by ordering his councillors to vote against the, the motion without hearing any debate. I do not envy the individual from the SDLP who has to cobble together some reason for the reversal of the SDLP vote in Fermanagh and carry out Colin Meeswood's diktat. The case is clearly, this case is clearly an abusive process and is very clearly a human rights issue. And on that basis, I would ask you to support the motion. Kuramayogam. Thank you, um, Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me in. I have an amendment I submitted. Um, if you want to put it up on the screen, I know that the city solicitor has a particular view on it, but if you would indulge me, I would like to read the amendment. Um, can we get a seconder for the amendment, please? I'll second it, Mayor. Councillor Jackson. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Duffy. Okay, thank you. Um, so the amendment is given concerns on the human rights issue of Lane Campbell. There is a campaign ongoing, and I asked the Council to contact the offices of Antishak and their Department of Justice calling on them to protect the human rights of Irishman Liam Campbell, who is currently facing extradition to Lithuania. 
The Supreme Court already ruled against the extra extradition of Liam Campbell to Lithuania as it found that prison conditions there could breach his right to freedom from torture, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment. There is a concern that if, if extradited, he could face a lengthy period in detention before his case comes to trial in conditions that have been criticised by the UN's Committee on Torture. He's an Irish citizen and the Taoiseach has a responsibility to protect the rights of Irish citizens. In addition, this council states our total and unequivocal condemnation of the OMA bomb, which occurred on the 15th of August 1998. We wish to reiterate our ongoing sympathy with the families of those who lost their lives in this atrocity, our ongoing solidarity with those who were injured, and further to this, our resolve to ensure that those who carried out this attack on the people of OMA and beyond and on the peace process should face the full sanction of the legal and judicial process. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Duffy. Um, I assume that that's your um, contribution in terms of speaking on the debate. Um, yes. So, and as you've pointed out, uh, the city solicitor has um, some concerns over the amendment. If you can just bear with me. Um, I would like to, to hear those concerns, um, and then we'll ask the city solicitor to um, express those concerns to uh, the wider members um, as well. Just bear with me, please. Okay, members, um, and uh, as Councillor Duffy has outlined, um, the city solicitor has some concerns, and I would uh, just ask that he hear them with the meeting. So, over to yourself, Bob. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We have had a similar issue arise uh, in the not too recent past, um, or not too distant past, in relation to a motion. Although it's on the same broad issue, it does delete the entirety of the motion apart from the first two words, given concerns. And on the previous occasion, we had indicated that we would not accept that as an acceptable motion or an acceptable amendment. Okay, Philip, um, thank you for that. Um, I remember it well because it was my amendment um, that particular occasion. So, members, you have heard um, the city solicitor's um, advice, and I uh, tend to agree. So. Um, unfortunately, that amendment is not acceptable. Um, Councillor Duffy. Um, Alderman uh, Work. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for letting me on here. Very, very disappointed today. Very disappointed that the suspension of standing orders failed and that some members of the Council. Um, more or less than I set my motion to allow, allow the OMA victims to speak. What are some members in the, the council here scared of? The truth. I have beside me here a number of family members like the OMA bombing, and in front of you says Michael Gallagher, and the family members here have read a statement for yourselves because the council will not listen them. But I'm sure in the, in the long grass here, Councillor Donnelly, you'll be hopefully tomorrow morning, you might be on a radio interview with Michael Gallagher. On behalf of the, the OMA families, I'm sorry that the voice of victims was denied the opportunity to speak today 
by the majority of Derry and Sir Ancestry Council. The motion today is directly linked to those who destroyed our lives forever on the 15th of August 1998. And this motion can only cause divisions in our community and cannot change the decisions being taken by the Irish and Lithuanian government. The human rights of our dead must also be taken into consideration. We respect the human rights of all people. We are calling on your council to support a cross-border public inquiry. We call the British and Irish government to support an inquiry and the circumstances surrounding Nova bomb on the 15th of August 1998. We ask only for the truth, the justice and the dignity. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for that, um, Alderman Work. Um, Councillor Mooney. Thank you, Chair. Um, just like the, uh, speaking on this motion uh, on behalf of the SDLP, uh, the idea of human rights is to be supported by everyone. Human rights on their own is not enough and can only be augmented by an appropriate system in order to be reasonably effective. Human rights breaches occur on a daily basis in all manner of circumstances. Severity. This we can agree on. In respect of human rights breaches, we can agree some go unnoticed while others do not. And some become public and visible for all to see on a near daily occurrence in our news reporting. It should not be so, but unfortunately, this is the way things are. This brings me to the motion in hand presented by Councillor Donnelly today. The motion is as read as you can see on the screen. Fortunately for us in this jurisdiction and in our neighbouring jurisdiction, we have a system that has implemented the concept of human rights into law. We know that our neighbouring jurisdiction, as, as it is, has a written constitution with legal guarantees and governs on the concept of what's called the separation of powers principle. Inherent in this doctrine is the independence of the judiciary and the latitude that they have to perform this role without interference from, from the other two pillars of government, namely the legislature and executive. Moving on, we must note that Mr. Campbell has recently had his surrender ordered. This was encapsulated in a judgment delivered by Justice Aileen Donnelly on the 26th of June last. The judgment detailed in nature runs to some 32 pages and 127 paragraphs. It is clear from this judgment that Mr. Campbell has fully participated in the process, providing his the senior and junior counsel and solicitor with full instructions and being afforded the opportunity, opportunity of having experts give evidence on his, on his behalf in the proceedings. The judgment itself is, is evidently contrary to the motion at hand and is at the heart of rebutting the essence of it. Number one, we should note that as internationally recognised, our neighbours have in place an extradition agreement with Lithuania. This is the heart of the matter. This is enforced and based on the principle of mutual trust and comedy, like all extradition agreements. This is dealt with at the start of the judgment and deals with this in some detail. Number two, let me come to the substance of the judgment itself. Mr. Campbell's own arguments against his surrender. And please bear with me, members, as it is hard to distill all this material into a short synopsis. The point Mr. Money, I'm going to have to ask you to bring your comments there, close, please. Number one, there was four points made on his behalf. The inhuman degrading treatment point, which was very extensively argued. The Article 3 point itself under the ECHR uh, explores the present conditions that were inherent in the 2013 case. At the, at the motion in Dublin, this was dealt with by the judge when she considered that the Kiskus prison has now closed on July 2nd, 2019. This was the prison that was the subject of the 2013 decision. And the state received. Councillor Mooney, I'm going to have to ask you to bring your remarks to a close, please. The second chair, commented in our prison at Kunis, which is own expert, Professor Morgan, took no exception with. Um, Thank you. Should say Thank that you, Councillor Mooney. I'm sorry, we can't. You're, you're only allowed two minutes right. when, when responding to the motion, and I've been. Um, more than um, accommodating. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, to, have to ask you to bring your remarks to a close. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it's just unfortunate. Um, the, the, the next. I, I, I can't, um, Councillor Mooney, I'm sorry. I can't, um, unfortunately. Um, uh, we, we've got a list of speakers here. Uh, I'm sorry. I've been, I've been uh, more than um, accommodating. I think um, the next speaker is Alderman McCain. Thank you, Mayor, for letting me in. Mayor, the Austrian Unionist Party will not be supporting this motion. This is a poor example of a human rights case, to be honest. This, uh, and 
you've been talking on human rights, the prison that this uh, individual was meant to go to has since been closed, is my understanding, and that the prison that hopefully it will be going to is now accept, acceptable under the EU regulations. Now, let's, let's get this in perspective. Liam Campbell was found guilty by a civil court of the Oma bomb in 1998, where 29 people was killed and two unborn children. My wife was on Oma that day, eight months pregnant, with our oldest son, who's coming 22. Where would her human rights have been, or my unborn son, if, if they would have been blown to bits that day, along with the poor victims of Oma? My colleagues went down to work in the Drone County Hospital. My colleagues had to lift lumps and put them into bin bags uh, of people who were blown to pieces. You know, this, this is an outrage, to be honest. Not alone was he content with that, but eight years later, he was in Lithuania trying to buy guns and explosives to bring more carnage back to these islands. You know, the case, you know, like a similar motion was brought before the council and Oma and Fermanagh. What has, which has brought much, much hurt to Oma and the surrounding areas. A lot of councillors made very bad decisions and, and made very lame excuses that night that they didn't know who Liam Campbell was and that they weren't familiar with, with the motion that was in front of them. Let this council be aware, well aware of what motion is in front of us tonight and, and don't let the same outcome happen again. Uh, there are so many people in Oma that, that has caused so much hurt to, and I extend my sympathy today to those people who are there with, with Councillor Wark. And I'll conclude by saying, let's let's get the things in perspective here, and let's see who we are talking about here. This 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 is a, a poor example of human rights, and I hope this man be sent to Lithuania as soon as possible to face the crimes that he has committed. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Alderman McKean. Alderman Devaney. Just getting tuned in here. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, where do we see to get this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me in. And we in the Democratic Unionist Party will not be supporting this motion here coming forward. Um, but one thing I will say, I will welcome the, the decision by the SDLP to overturn the decision made in the Oma and Fermanagh Council. And when we look here at this motion here, Councillor Donnelly is very prescriptive here. Um, I've never heard Councillor Donnelly or any, many of the Republicans um, calling for those terrorists who skipped across the border into the Republic of Ireland to send them back to Northern Ireland for trial for tr troubles that, that they carried out in Northern Ireland. And, you know, th this is an insult to the people of Oma. And when you look at, at Michael Gallagher sitting in that photograph, the gun face, that tells you the pain and hurt um, that is go ongoing here. And, you know, he talks about um, human rights here, Mr. Mayor. Let's look at the human rights of all those who were murdered in the Oma bombing. And let's widen it out. What about the human rights of those in Clotty who were blue to pieces? Many in the city here were blue to places. One of the, probably the darkest nights I've had was when I went to a wake house in the waterside and above the lady's um, coffin was her late husband and her daughter who was murdered by Republicans. Where is their rights? And Mr. Mayor, and just in case some of people within the, the, the council at the moment, let's look at the trouble hurt here to unions. Look at the Claude, Alderman, the, the past Alderman um, Mary Hamilton was badly injured. We had Alderman Breslin who um, attempted murder in Straban by Republicans. We also have the Kerrigan, Alderman Kerrigan, and the previous Alderman Kerrigan, who has had a relative murdered by Republicans on the border. And you know, Mr. Mayor, he talks about civil. Uh, um, he talks about um, human rights here. What about theirs? Uh, and you know, uh, at the end of the day, Alderman um, Devaney, I'm going to have to ask you to bring your remarks to a close. No, just to finish up, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, we will not be supporting the motion. Alderman Devaney, Alderman McCann. Mr. McKenna, yes, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah go oh, ahead. Okay. Uh, let me say first that, that people before profit will be supporting the motion. 
uh, we'd be supporting the motion on the same basis as we opposed extradition all over the last 50 years. Uh, we I mean, uh, uh, voted against, argued against, indeed I stood on platforms against uh, the uh, extradition of members of the provisional IRA down through the years. People who, for example, as Morris has just said, who perpetrated the atrocious sectarian atrocity uh, I, 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 in Claudie and many others. I see that they have no more right to do that than Mr. Campbell had to do what he did, if indeed, I mean, he did do it. We can't uh, I, uh, uh, preempt that. So I would say not only are we not associating ourselves, sort of which the causes, which it is alleged Mr. Campbell uh, uh, pursued, we are against the strategy of so-called armed struggle altogether. We say to people, young people in particular, might be tempted onto the path of armed struggle, seek another road. We tell them, and we say to you, all of them again, as we have done uh, uh, so often, that nothing will come out of their armed struggle, commensurate with the pain inflicted and endured which the armed struggle is going to uh, uh, involve. The whole basis upon which we uh, support this motion is quite simply that we should not be uh, deporting people to places where their human rights cannot be guaranteed. And for all the closures of prisons and the rest of it, and they know that, uh, uh, about that background, for all of that, nobody's human rights can be guaranteed by the uh, judicial system in Lithuania. So we're against it, and we make it absolutely clear that we draw sort of a clean line between ourselves Sort of, and those who would advocate armed struggle, whether it is the provost armed struggle, sort of, and the, a lot of people who were go, uh, supporting that struggle with gusto on platforms and saying that not a word should be uttered against the heroes who were carrying out the provisional IRA campaign, can now say, I don't think that they're on very good ground unless they retrospectively condemn that. Councillor McCann, you're going to have to bring your remarks to Thanks a million. Thank you. Councillor Kiar. For Kiara, are you online there? Sorry about that. Go ahead, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I am on record here in this council over many years uh, condemning violence, and I still have the same to this day. But I'll be supporting this motion simply because of man's human rights. The British judicial system would not extradite him to Lithuania. That says something. And he would not, he would be in humane treatment over there. So, as I say, I condemn violence no matter where it comes from. And two wrongs don't make a right. So I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kiar. Members, I have uh, no further indicated speakers um, on this motion. Chair, can I come Hello, excuse me, Mayor. Mayor, I did put my name down there. Sorry, you're, you, sorry, you're right, uh, Councillor McKinney. Um, we'll go to Councillor McKinney and then we'll go to Councillor Gallagher, I think it is, um, as well. Councillor McKinney. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for that. Can I just say that we, we offer our support to all those that are with Alderman Walk. And in fact, uh, we voted for the, the actual suspension of the uh, standing orders, just for the record. But what we'd like to say as well is that this is another jurisdiction's judicial system we're interfering in. And we do not believe that the council has any authority to meddle in their affairs. We will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor McKinney. Councillor Gallagher. Thank you for letting us in, Chair. Just on, on, on Councillor McKinney's remarks there, uh, a court in Belfast refused this extradition, uh, and that court in Belfast was overseen by his minister at the time, Ford. So I, uh, this jurisdiction didn't I, uh, agree with us, and that was based on purely on the human rights. And to see, uh, within Lithuania, it's been well proven around the brutality and the corruption that goes on within that uh, country. But just can I say, like, this is purely around a human rights element. I have, I have every sympathy for the Oma victims. I have no problem saying Oma was wrong, it should never have happened. This is not about Oma. This is about human rights. Do you see when I was growing up as a young fella? I clearly remember the hunger strikes in Long Cash and the brutality that went on in Long Cash. Hunger strikers I went on 
and starved to death. And I remember the SDLP and their uh, party concentrating on what they were saying was of where these people were coming from, with what they may have done or what they may have not done. Right? They took it down a wrong road and had seen people losing their lives, having to starve to death for human rights. I don't want to see that happen again. And I would call on the SDLP. Mr. Gallagher, can you stick to the, to, to the wording of the motion? And and speak, to, speak to the wording of the motion and not the decision by the SDLP and what way they're going to vote on this? This is about, but I'm, I, I can call across the, the chamber. Can you stick to the, the, the wording of the motion? This is about human rights. And we've seen it in the past when human rights in this country has been abused. We've seen it and we've seen the consequences of that. And what I'm saying is don't reinforce that and force this man to go to the other area where we know his human rights are going to be breached. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Um, Councillor McCluskey. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me in. Um, I normally don't do this, but uh, I just wanted to echo Councillor McCann, Councillor Carr, and Councillor Gallagher have all uh, said aspects of what I wanted to say again. Uh, support of this motion in no way condones or accepts uh, the the violent acts that happened to all members of our society and, 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 and individually and collectively in recent decades. Uh, those days are over. But the issue here is about this man's right to due process and the preservation of his human rights. So I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCluskey. Members, I have no uh, further allocated speakers on this motion. I'm going to ask Councillor Donnelly, would you like the, um, the opportunity to sum up? Councillor Donnelly. Chair, Chair, thank you. And Chair, I, I do feel I need to point out that this debate has been taken down a different road. It, it has largely been about OMA, and that once that I hear you rebuke anybody about that, but you, you rebuked uh, uh, Councillor Gallagher. So, Chair, some of the some of the comments that have been made here obviously have this man convicted of 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 these you know this this incident. Not only that, also convicted of a terrible act that he has never ever been tried on. What happened that day, Chair, was absolutely wrong, and it it, it it's very you couldn't it can't be justified like countless other tragedies right across the six counties. All wrong. The deaths of civilians are wrong, and but. Chair, what I would say in summing up here and finishing up, two wrongs will never make a right. And you know, and we can't call some people call for the perpetrators or of, of, of certain acts to be brought to justice while ignoring the other. You know, that's selective justice. But I'd like to thank everybody who who's supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. Um members obviously I'm listening to the the bit we're having uh we're going to have to go to a vote, so I'm going to ask John to go through the, the vote, please. John, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members, Alderman Bresland. Oh, uh, recorded vote, sorry. Can you speak? Yes, it is a recorded vote, members. Alderman Bresland. Against. Alderman Devaney. Against. Alderman Guy. Against. Alderman Carrigan. Against. Alderman McClintock. Against. Alderman McCready. Against. Alderman McCain. Against. Alderman Ramsey. Against. Alderman Wark. Against. Councillor Jason Barr. Against. Councillor John Boyle. Against. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Abstain. Councillor Burke. Abstain. Councillor Carr. Councillor Cooper. Stain. Councillor Cusick. Against. Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Duffy. Abstain. Councillor Durkin. Against. Councillor Edwards. Against, John. Councillor Farrell. Against. 
Fancer Ferguson. Against. Fancer Fleming. Fancer Gallagher. Four. Fancer Harkin. Fancer Jackson. Abstain. Fancer Kelly. Abstain. Fancer Logue. Abstain. Fancer McCann. Councillor McCann. Councillor McCluskey. Four. Councillor McGuire. Staying. Councillor McHugh. Councillor McHugh. Councillor McKeever. Against. Councillor McKinney. Councillor McKinney. John. Against. Sorry, John. Against. Councillor Mellon. Abstain. Councillor Mooney. Against. Riley. Against. And Councillor Tierney. Against. Thank you, members. Sound a normal on the meeting here. I was abstaining there, John. Councillor McKee. members the results of that uh, vote was six and four and four the motion 21 against and 11 abstentions therefore uh, the motion falls members moving on um alder guy at the beginning of the meeting um, withdrew his motion so the next motion that we'll hear will be in the name of councillor mary durkin councillor durkin girl my good fair i'll take the motion as read Thank you. Can we get a seconder, please? A second, Mayor. Councillor Edwards, thank you. Um, Councillor Durkin, go ahead. Right. Uh, thanks, Mayor. It's uh, Well, it's 13 months now since this council unanimously uh, passed the declaration of climate emergency motion. We know that we've got our climate emergency pledge now and our climate adaptation plan is going to be launched very soon. Uh, we had no storm at the executive function last year when we brought the declaration of emergency. But now we've got the new decade, new approach, setting out commitments and promises from the executive. And we need to see legally binding regulations to see meaningful action. And I suppose this motion is timely because we've had the climate motion before the assembly this week. And uh, I am aware that the minister puts attitude uh, has been concerning and some of the revelations and indications um, of uh, his officials advice. Um, now, I'm not on top of the fact and we don't know the facts there and there will be exploration of this, I'm sure, by the DERA committee. Uh, but this council is calling, this motion is calling for action by the minister and the wider executive because as I said earlier, it's about the responsibility that falls on everyone at executive all five parties, including our own. And this, if anything, the minister's uh, conduct shows that we really do need to call for due urgency to be applied uh, and that legislation needs to come quick. I think there was suggestion that he's focused on actions and he doesn't have the resources to do the legislation. But the thing is, we're behind all our regions here. We're lagging behind. There's climate emergency legislation in neighboring jurisdictions 
this isn't complicated legislation. Um, the executive can allocate all the resources to get the legislation drafted uh, and ready to move. Um, so, and I'm conscious of time, but yeah, really, this motion uh, came out of discussions that we had at the all party group of climate action at Stormont, at which I represent this council. And it was about how do we coordinate central government action and local government? There needs to be more coordination generally. So we're calling on the executive to act and do their part. As a council, we are commended for being ahead of others in the north on this. Uh, and we do have excellent expertise in house and our staff and our climate action officer, our green infrastructure team, uh, our energy officer. So uh, as a council, we stand ready to do more than our bit. And it's on that basis that I'm asking the council to call for the sustainability champion within the planning department. Uh, and this will be someone that it's to bridge a gap that exists between our climate emergency aspirations and our existing plan and policy framework. Uh, and in terms of the Tackling Plastic Initiative, it's a, an initiative ongoing with DARA, and this is Plastic Free July. And I know our council has already committed to this, and uh, we have seen the removal of single-use plastics at venues and uh, at facilities and uh, at events. There has been challenges on the whole plastic elimination and single use uh, disposals during the COVID. So it's just about this Plastic Free July campaign is about reaffirming our commitment. And I have spoken to officers who have agreed to formally record a plastic pledge as part of this campaign. So I, I'm not wanting to go over my time. Uh, I'll just finish it there, Mayor. Uh, Tan, Rinshaw and Tawokta. Uh, Thank you, um, Councillor Durkin. Um, Councillor Harkin. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I forwarded an amendment uh, to yourself and John and uh, Theresa, if that could be up there. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I so just first of all... Uh, just to, if, we, if you just would, we get the sure. amendment on screen there, um, Councillor Harkin, we have to get a second there. One thing in an hour, so just bear with us. Okay, members, the motion um, is on the screen there um, in front of you, proposed by Councillor Harkin. Um, Councillor Harkin, have you got a second there for that motion? I'm seconding the motion. Okay, Councillor McCann. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Couldn't get through. No, you're all right. We were, uh, we were uh, expecting it. Um, Councillor Harkin, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Mary for bringing forward the uh, motion. And uh, I agree with all the points that Mary made. I mean, it's 13 months now since we, as a council, passed the climate emergency as part of a wave uh, across Ireland and across the world of people 
grasping the scale of the challenge that we now face. Um, and I think that uh, everything that's in Mary's uh, motion are things that we need action on. And we just had a discussion about the need to uh, expand our rail line and, and, and the urgency of that. So uh, I, for this reason, I, I find it utterly shocking that the most powerful person uh, in the six counties, uh, Minister Edwin Poots, when it comes to the, the environment, has just this week said that uh, we shouldn't talk about a climate emergency and a climate crisis, that this is unuseful. Uh, and it, it appears to me that he doesn't actually understand that we face a climate emergency. So uh, all the proposals that Mary has there and all the things that we're trying to do as a council, I don't see how we can move forward when we have a minister who actually disagrees with uh, climate crisis, who disagrees that we face a climate emergency. Um, and I think as a council, we need to send this uh, message to Stormont that uh, no progress is possible in dealing with a climate emergency when you have someone uh, who is overseeing the response, who actually disagrees with it and is calling on people not to talk about a climate emergency and not to talk about climate uh, a climate crisis. Uh, this is really unacceptable and it goes against everything that the council uh, has voted for. It goes against everything that the council is doing. It actually goes against what Stormont has voted for as well because Stormont has also voted like our council for that we face a climate emergency. So for this reason, uh, and I wasn't planning to amend this emotion because I think it's I think it's a very good one, but I, I do think we need to we need to send a message to uh, Stormont that a, a minister who doesn't accept climate change uh, is going to block progress and is going to lead uh, to, as Mary said, us falling further and further behind on the issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Um, members, there's a, an amendment on the floor. Um, I have a number of speakers, Councillor McCluskey, Burke, Ferguson, Devaney and Duffy. I know Councillor Duffy is on the amendment. Councillor McCluskey, are you on the amendment? I'm happy to speak on both together. Um, I, you know what I have to say really encompasses both. So do you want, if, do you want me to do the yeah. amendment or? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, it, it, it's quite unusual for me. I actually agree with with, with um, Edwin Poots on, on this one. Um, there are I've spent significant periods to lock up reading uh, primary sources on on the whole climate issue, and there's huge dissent and huge uh, conflict within the scientific community around the fact that there is a, an, an imminent climate emergency, and in fact, the, the weight of opinion even in the IPCC seems to suggest that, that the, the word emergency is, 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 is over-egging it. There does seem to be, uh, at the moment, uh, some increase in surface temperatures, and there seems to be reasonable evidence that carbon dioxide contributes to this to some extent. Uh, the amount of this, I mean, we had the, the medieval warm period, and then we had the Ice Age, and then over 25 years ago, the, the Malthusian climate, climate uh, population alarmists, such as Paul Ehrlich, were talking about global cooling, and then it changed to global warming. And it seems that at the back of this, there's a profoundly anti-human um, um, narrative, which says that, the, the, because we can't fix this. I mean, I'm looking at figures here. Uh, one of our total global energy, um, the only, only renewables only produce electricity. And uh, of the 20% of our total global energy, which is electrical, wind produces 5%, solar 2%. And we've seen that windmills actually are carbon, net carbon emitters. They use more energy to set up than they do, than they produce over their lifetime. And we've seen actually a million pounds of public money being spent here in the North of Ireland for windmills to be turned off over the past 18 months, finishing, I think, in June of this year because there were problems with the grid. The battery storage globally will power the grid for one hour. You know, we just are not at the stage when we can do away with carbon emitting. Uh, uh, McCluskey, I wanted to ask you to bring your yeah, clothes, please. But I want, I want to ask Mary, um, does she, is she aware that only 2% of current global energy are produced by renewables? And how, what part of the 80% which of, of which is dirty energy are we going to do without? Is it going to be transport? Is it going to be... Your remarks there, close, please. And the, I just want to look, show you this book here. 
And it's a very, very important book. It's called Eco Imperialism Green Power, Black Death. Thank and you, what it Conrad says McCloskey. Is, Conrad McCloskey, thank you. Rich Americans yes. and Europeans are. You've had more than enough time, to Conrad suffer. McCloskey, thank you. And given the Council's commitment to Black Conrad Lives McCloskey, Matter. Please. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. Members, it's difficult, um, I know, to try and get all of your remarks on um, within the allocated time, but um, I'm trying to make sure that we're not sitting here the well after midnight. Um, I'm not, I appreciate I'm that, not, Mr. Mayor. I'm not I'll shut up. Thank you. I'm not deliberately being difficult, um, but I assume that you all uh, want to get through the business as, as quickly as possible. Um, so I would just ask that you uh, bear with me, and when I'm asking you to bring your remarks to a close, please. Councillor Ferguson um, has indicated she wants to speak on the amendment. So, Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to speak on both. So, thank you, Mary, for bringing the, the, the motion forward. Obviously, I think it's a whole executive issue dealing with on the climate change uh, plan working group. With you. It's something that has to be put with hand of every, which is why I agree completely on a planning champion. Uh, so as leaps ahead of other councils, and I think this is the only way if we bring central government in to uh, bring other councils in line with ourselves. Um, there's only really so much that we can do on our own. I do agree with the, the sentiment of um, um, Councillor Harkin has said the the comments that dear Minister Edwin puts were shocking that the fact that the the words and terminology but unfortunately we won't be supporting the amendment because i think it takes away from a very good motion um and it, it nearly takes it into a possibility where it would have had unanimous support across the, our chamber hopefully because um everybody's knows how important climate change is to more of a political point scoring so um happy to support the motion um but we won't be supporting the amendment thank you thank you um councillor ferguson Councillor alderman Devaney. I assume you want to speak on the, the amendment. I want to just run across the both. Look, uh, um, yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, um, thank you for allowing me in, Mr. Mayor. And look, um, our party um, would have supported uh, um, um, Councillor Durkin's um, um, uh, coming for our idea coming forward here. And uh, look, I, I do like the previous speaker think that the the amendment takes away from the good work that, that Mary has put in there. And I have to say, Mr. Mayor, we as a council are doing fairly, fairly well as far as renewables are concerned. Uh, and, you know, we really support um, the removal of single use plastics and tackling plastic initiative and partnership and keeping Northern Ireland beautiful. But I have to say, Mr. Mayor, I just want to reiterate what, what our minister has said. You know, he has stated that, that he has no problem doing a climate change act. Uh, and we'll do that in due course. But his focus, uh, as he states himself, for officials in his department is actually on delivering things, actions, which will make tangible differences. And, you know, we, we are making differences here, even within our council area. And I do, like the previous speaker, say that really, look, um, I do appreciate that we do need a champion to promote this. And when you look at all these uh, um, initiatives and renewables, uh, as one of the speakers did say clearly earlier on, there are a lot of different conflicts of opinions uh, in this area. And Mr. Mayor, uh, just to let you know, we will not be supporting the amendment. Thank you, um, Alderman Devaney. Um, I don't think anyone expected you to support it, um, but uh, we, we, we take the point. Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me in. Um, Tina's going to deal with the motion, but I just wanted to deal very quickly with the amendment. Um, the amendment is probably in relation to the motion that was brought by Declan McAleer, um, our MLA in West Tyrone, earlier in the week regarding um, the climate emergency. Um, it doesn't surprise me that um, Councillor McCluskey is a climate denier, but that's that's her business. Um, in terms of the, the amendment, um, I just think it's a sad attempt by Councillor Harkin to actually showboat and grab a headline out of what is a really good motion that has been brought here by Councillor Durkin. Um, I think that Councillor Harkin knows right and well that even if Evan puts um, resign tomorrow or was sacked tomorrow, he will be replaced by a DUP minister. So that, it's just a nonsense amendment and we absolutely won't be supporting it. Um, just so Councillor Harkin can grab a headline. Thank you, um, Councillor Duffy. Councillor Durkin. 
Uh, on the amendment, Councillor Dorgan. Yeah, thank you, Gorham. I'll get a fair. Uh, and um, uh, we will not be supporting the amendment, but that's not to say that we share a lot of the frustration uh, and a lot of the criticism directed here is valid. But however, I, I don't think that the, in this instance, this brings value to the over motion and the spirit of the motion is about coordination and it's about demanding action from the executive. And like I said earlier, it's about the executive stepping up, like all five parties that signed up to the new decade, new approach. And a lot of the issues that need to be uh, teased out here about, you know, um, what advice said when puts is getting, uh, what's the expertise of the advice, um, that can be teased out by the DARA committee. And the DARA committee also have legislative powers. They can maybe bring forward legislation the executive has legislative powers. So um, on that basis, uh, not supporting the motion or not supporting the amendment. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, um, Councillor Durkin. Members, I have no other indicated speakers on the amendment. Um, and I send on a different opinion. So we're going to have to go to a vote. Um, John, come here, Jeff. Thank you, Mayor. On the amendment, members, Alderman Bresland. Are you there, Alderman Bresland? Members, on this occasion, um, I'm going to have to take silence as somebody who's left the meeting. If you wish to abstain, please uh, state that you wish to abstain. Here now, John. Oh, where do you want to vote, Alderman Bresland? Against. Thank you. Alderman Devaney? Against. Alderman Guy? Against. Alderman Carrigan? Against. Alderman McClintock? Against. Alderman McCready? Alderman McCready? Right, John. John, thank you. Uh, Alderman McCain? Against. Uh, Alderman sorry. Ramsey? Anyway, I couldn't. Against. Alderman okay. Wark? Against. Councillor Jason Barr? Against. Councillor John Boyle? Uh, against. Councillor Michaela Boyle? Against. Councillor Burke? Okay. Councillor Burke, are you there? Against, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Councillor Carr? Abstain. Councillor Cooper? Against. Councillor Cusick? Against. Uh, Councillor Dobbins, are you there? No. Councillor Donnelly? Four. Councillor Duffy? Against. Councillor Durkin? Councillor Durkin? Against. Councillor Edwards? Against, John. Councillor Farrell? Against. Councillor Ferguson? Against. Councillor Fleming? Against, John. Councillor Gallagher? Councillor Donovan. Councillor Harkin. Or. Councillor Jackson. Against. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Logue. Against. Councillor McCann. Or. Councillor McCluskey. Against. Councillor McGuire. Against. Councillor McHugh. Against, John. Councillor McKeever. Against. Councillor McKinney. Against, John. Councillor Mellon. Against. Councillor Mooney. Against, John. Councillor Riley. Councillor Riley. Against, John. Sorry, thank you, Martin. And Councillor Tierney. Yes. Three, four. I have.
Okay, members, that was three for the amendment, 31 against and one abstention. Therefore, the amendment falls. Heading back now to the original motion. Um, I have two indicated speakers. Councillor Burke. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so as Sandra's already said, we will be supporting this motion. Um, I think it was Councillor Durkin who said it is timely given the calls this week from the Assembly, um, including our own party for the Dear Minister, the introduced climate legislation that needs to be implemented now. Um, and it needs to coincide with the executive's recovery plan so that we can be uh, on target to hit them um, target reductions that have already been set. Uh, it needs to be done now as it's not something we're going to get a second chance at either. Um, the climate emergency that this council has already declared is a threat to us all and immediate action is needed. Just a few points um, in relation to the sustainability champion and the nomination on the planning. We would agree with this. Um, we do need greener, more sustainable policies, but it's also important that social justice isn't removed from climate action so that communities aren't left behind or disadvantaged. We need to ensure that balance so that we can still provide quality housing, transport and facilities, which people need. Um, given the crisis we're facing, the environmental impact does need to be considered and discussed across all levels of government, including this council and decisions being made around planning in all areas and the policy should reflect this. Um, finally, just on the plastic pollution, I think that's probably should be a key objective anyway for all the parties and obviously independents in this chamber as the damage and the crippling damage that these single use plastics are causing to the marine life and wider environment. It's been well documented and needs to be addressed immediately. So, as I said, we're happy to support the motion. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Burke. Um, Councillor McCluskey. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I want to make clear I'm not a climate change denier. I accept absolutely that the climate is changing. What I'm trying to make the point is that there's very little in our current state of technological knowledge and development that we can do to mitigate that realistically without wiping out tens of millions of the world's poorest and most marginalised populations. And given this Council's commitment to the, the, the ethos that Black Lives Matter, I think it's very important for us to recognise that the people who suffer most from wealthy Americans and Europeans uh, worrying about the mathematical modelling effects which may cause a climate emergency which is by no means certain, the people who will suffer from those policies are going to be the world's poorest people, mainly living in the Southern Hemisphere and in the poorest parts of Africa and in Latin America. So that the policies that we make here and the things that we say we're going to do, for example, reducing carbon dioxide emissions to 0% means that either we forego the, the technological advances of modernity on which our civilization has thrived, either we forego these things or we watch poor People die in their tens of millions. That is, you know, these are the alternatives. At the moment, we do not have the technological solutions to reducing carbon dioxide. Now, whether that has an effect on climate or not, as I say, is, is something which a lot of scientists think is happening, but there's a significant amount. For example, 150 people after Christmas wrote to the IPCC saying that they did not agree with, with the climate alarmists. So, but what I am saying is, is that by reducing, unless we are prepared to reduce the population in the world, absolutely dramatically, which is which is going to happen gradually anyway, that we will subject poor people to a life without the advantages which we in the developed world have 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 uh, enjoyed for centuries. Thank, you. Thank you. Close, I'm thank finished. You. Thank you very much. Councillor Harkin. Thanks, Mayor. Well, look, my understanding is that we are already in a planetary uh, climate emergency and it is already the poorest people around the world who are suffering most. Um, and it is set to get worse, worse, which is why uh, we have the urgency of taking action. Uh, and that's why uh, we, uh, along with other parties, have led the way in terms of calling for climate emergencies over a year ago. Um, and it was very disappointing that the executive parties combined, uh, again, to block what I would see as a kind of straightforward uh, message to uh, the, the the that we can't really make progress on climate change when we have when the people in charge don't actually believe it. Uh, so I am not confident that uh, we will see the kind of progressive change that we need to see uh, on climate uh, uh, coming from Stormont, which is why I think we have to put the emphasis on what we can do locally, uh, and that means what we can do through the council 
but also uh, what we can do through activism and campaigning. Um, and I think that that's going to be the key. Uh, it isn't really going to be the people in Stormont that make the change. They'll only do it if they're forced to do it, which includes Edwin Putz. Um, so it's really about the kind of mass campaigns uh, that we've seen. It was students and young people that put this on the agenda. And it's going to require more action by young people and workers to actually uh, deliver real change uh, uh, on climate. Um, but, you know, despite all that, uh, I will be backing this amendment or this uh, motion 100 percent and doing everything I can to encourage activism and campaign around the goals uh, in it. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me in. And look, I'm not going to rehearse everything that I said. Um, I nearly said it all the first time. It's just to reiterate that, that the DUP will be supporting the, this notice of motion here coming forward. Stands. I think it's very, very timely and a very, very good one. And we support it. Thank you, um, Alderman Devaney. Councillor McCann. Councillor McCann, are you online there? No. No. Okay. That... Councillor McCann? No. Okay. Um, thank you. I have no further indicators um indications of people looking to speak sorry councillor donnelly go ahead chair can you hear me yes councillor donnelly go ahead ha ha having a bit of a problem with sound there earlier so hopefully it's rectified yeah. is your sound okay now yeah yeah 100 percent. thank you okay. uh chair look uh no bar with the motion uh you know the environment and all that protected it's just that i do have to take exception with uh, I understand the sentiments and 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 I agree with them, but you see this the the last four words keep Northern Ireland beautiful. I understand that it is an agency, but I just want to put in record there's absolutely nothing beautiful about the so-called state of Northern Ireland. So I just felt the need that I had to make that point. Got my good chair. Thanks for that. I'm confident only. Members, I have no further indication uh, indication that people are looking to speak on this motion. I'm going to give Councillor Durkin the opportunity to sum up. Councillor Durkin. Just keep it brief, Mayor Graham Iogut. Um, just the Councillor Donnelly's last comment there, it, it is the name of the campaign, uh, and it's a campaign that I do believe the Council should sign up to. Um, Councillor McCluskey uh, made a lot of comments that we can continue the discussion, but the intention of this motion wasn't to reopen the debate about the science that led to the declaration of emergency. We all as a council voted for that unanimously last year. Just want to thank everyone for their comments and their contributions. And uh, Councillor Harkin made the point about the brilliant activists and the great work by various campaign groups here in the Northwest. And that's something to that expertise. There's no shortage of environmental experts that that can um, have input into the legislation so if i think the minister suggests that there may be resource issues well the executive can, um, can know uh, uh, and be reassured that there's excellent expertise out there that can be drawn on in this jurisdiction for am i will get it there thank you um councillor Durga. members um i'm going to put the, the motion to the floor um can i ask is anyone not in favor of the, of the motion are voting against it? Mayor, I want to vote against it. Councillor McCluskey. Councillor McCluskey, we, we, we've got that. Um, anyone else? Any abstentions? No abstentions either. I'm going to take it that everyone with the exceptions of Councillor McCluskey um, is in favour of the motion. It's 34 for, one against, and no abstentions. Okay, members. Thank you, um, Councillor Durkin. Members, moving on to the motion in the name of Councillor Mellon. Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll take the motion. It's read. 
Thank you, um, Councillor Mellon. Can we get a seconder, please? Yeah. Mayor. I'll second it. Is that Councillor Burke? Yeah. Thank you, um, Councillor Burke. Go ahead, Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, before um, the debate around this motion begins, I want to acknowledge that different parties and individuals hold different views about the use of academic selection. But I hope that the one thing that we can all agree on here tonight is that we want to put the health and well-being of our young people first. It is with our young people in mind that I have proposed this motion that the council call on those grammar schools within this city and district which have not yet suspended the use of academic selection as part of their entrance criteria for the school year commencing in 2021, to do so immediately. If I had my way, Mayor, I would ban the use of academic selection every year because of the harm that it does to our young people, labeling many as failures at the age of 10 or 11 and scaring them mentally for the rest of their lives. But as I have already acknowledged, this is not a universally held view within this chamber. But for those who support a choice, I would say that surely you can see that in the current circumstances that those children primary sex have faced a very grueling year. Their education has been disrupted because of the coronavirus pandemic. They have not been in school for several months and even look into the future there is a great uncertainty as to whether they will have a period of uninterrupted schooling as our society plans for a second wave of this pandemic. Schools have sought to do their utmost to maintain our young people's education and many teachers have gone above and beyond their call of duty in order to help their pupils and they are to be commended for that. But the reality remains, Mayor, that they cannot be expected to cure all of our social ills. We are not, we all know that homeschooling has proved to be very difficult for many parents, juggling with work and home commitments, as well as having to assist a number of children at the same time. And I say this without judgment, as at times I'd include myself in this. Some homes have not been able to afford access to broadband, and in many cases, particularly in rural areas, Broadband coverage is so poor as to render the support from schools inoperable. We also know that some homes have not been able to afford the electric electronic devices that children would have needed in order to assist with their homeschooling. Yes, the Department of Education have made efforts to access and distribute these devices, but this effort came far too late to be of any benefit to many of the young people who needed it. The need for a suspension of the use of academic selection as an entrance criteria for some of our primary schools in 2021 has already been recognised by Thornhill College and St Columns College. They have taken commendable decision not to put our young people under any further stress and anxiety. Of late, we have heard the voices of church leaders, trade unions, the Children's Commissioner, the Catholic Principals Association, past pupils of grammar schools, and the principals of the majority of primary schools in this city calling for a suspension of the use of academic selection. The use of academic selection as an entrance criteria for 2021 has been described as cruel. Hunter Mellon, I'm going to have to ask you to bring your remarks there close. It has been said by school principals this year, special circumstances lead to greater educational dis disadvantage. Do we want to support that? I ask you to support this motion and in doing so send out a message. Councillor Mellon, I'm going to have to ask you to bring your remarks to a close, please. There are young people that they will not be left behind socially, emotionally or academically. And this council has the courage to stand alongside them in their time of need. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, Councillor Mellon. Councillor Gallagher. Councillor Gallagher, are you online there? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. You hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for bringing us in. Uh, I'd like to support this motion, and I'd like to welcome the fact that Sinn Féin is now telling us that, that this council does have some authority to write to the schools in this district. No further back than the 13th of March, when this pandemic was upon us, I brought a proposal to write to the schools to close the schools down to protect our young people. Uh, and 
Sinn Féin opposed that motion, saying that we had no right to tell the schools what to do. So I welcome the U-turn on that, and I welcome the fact of bringing forward this motion. And I think that they should also include, when when they say about to do so immediately, that they should also work to abolish these uh, tests altogether. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Collagher. Councillor Edwards. Uh, Mayor, thanks. Uh, for, and, uh, I welcome this opportunity to contribute to this motion time to thank the proposal for bringing it. And I do first want to thank um, our teachers and our principals from across the district who, um, for all the hard work that they're doing and all the planning they're doing to, to reopen our schools. We are in uncharted waters. I know that they're doing all they can under extreme conditions. Mayor, turning to tonight's motion, uh, there have been major concerns raised by parents about transfer tests this year, given the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on education. Children have been deprived of normal education since March uh, this year, and despite schools and teachers' best efforts, distant learning has failed many children, and it's clear that it's not working through research conducted by um, inspectors and other reports released um, in the last few weeks. This is, distance learning has put all pupils at a disadvantage for, face, um, for facing transfer tests in November, December this year, and putting back in exams a few weeks does not deal with the real issue here and will only compensate for the loss of learning over the pandemic. Mayor, there is also a larger issue here concerning children from disadvantaged backgrounds where parents um, have not had the resources to pay for private tutors or provide laptops and iPads needed for these online classes. And there's a bigger issue too around broadband connectivity, especially in rural areas, which has proven to um, disadvantage rural children. The loss of learning is exacerbated um, with the plans to return children to school uh, next month, where schools will only be able to accommodate 50% of their pupils at any one time. Half of their children uh, will be on Monday and Tuesday, and the other half on Wednesday or on Thursday and Friday. Um, this means that there is no plans for a normal return to education anytime soon, and pupils will continue to lose out as a result. Under these conditions, Mary the SLP believe it is unreasonable and unfair to ask 10 year olds to take transfer tests as they're already facing significant stress and anxiety for them and for, for their parents. While some grammar schools across the North have recognised this and put the pastoral care of pupils uh, first by suspending transfer tests, tests, others have not. And the SLP would encourage to... Thank you, Mayor. Edward. I'm going to ask you to bring your marks back close, please. Thank you, Mayor. Finally, I'm just on the, the DEP amendment. Uh, we're not in support of it, and we believe that uh, everyone should have the same educational opportunities. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Mellon, for bringing this forward. I think that this, um, we will be supporting this motion because I think this is vital for our young people. Um, I won't reiterate the, um, the re Councillor Mellon put a lot of them across very well. Um, personally, I don't believe in the ac academic selection, um, and I, I think that it just causes undue stress um, and anxiety to our young uh, people within our, our city and district. I do commend local grammar schools that have decided to suspend it this year, and hopefully they will also see a way forward without these tests after doing it this year. But um, we will be supporting this motion. I. I do believe that this might be one of these things where parents will have to just opt out um, because it seems that there is such a mixed feeling um, for the, the transfer test across the whole political um, parties. But no, I just wanted to say that and thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Uh, Alderman McClintock. Thanks, Mayor. And can I just first clarify the DUP are not making an amendment to this motion? Um, but now I just want to acknowledge the fact that our current year six pupils will have missed out on four months of school and face-to-face -face teaching by the time they go back again. And it would be remiss of us not to consider the potential threat to their well-being of these 10 and 11 year olds. Um, I know I've spoken to the education minister today and he has been looking at all possibilities of mitigating the effects on children, including looking at whether or not the transfer test could be postponed to a later date, but it just isn't working out to be practical at all. Um, however, without a test, um, it's, how do we move forward? How are decisions going to be made? Because will the schools then, will the teachers uh, have to select who's going to grammar school or not? 
Will it be down to the teacher to be forced to make that decision? Will there be a criteria that means that if your brother or sister goes to the school, that then you have a better chance of getting in, which is clearly not the right way forward? Um, None of, none of these would be welcome ways to go forward and parents are concerned about how this will happen. This is a very difficult situation and it is complicated by the announcements from some of the grammar schools who have already made decisions as it is their right to do so. Um, we absolutely share the concerns about children taking tests later this year. We entirely understand the sentiment of the motion and have great empathy for the position stated. However, we don't see a viable alternative to deciding who goes into grammar school and who doesn't. So therefore, we find ourselves unable to support the motion that's coming before us. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, uh, Alderman McClampick. Councillor Donnelly. Chair, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Councillor Donnelly, yeah. Chair, look, a lot, a lot of what I have to say has already been said. So, uh, you know, just just as, as 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 someone who did do the test and everything that went went with that, I, as a parent, uh, none of my three children uh, done this test. It was completely unfair. A lot of the points have already been made, but I just want to emphasize the point of of the discriminatory, the the disadvantage. The, the children who who would come from you know working class areas that 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 it's so blatant that that you know it, but but again all them points have been made and I'm not sure if it's an amendment or an addition or would do it anyway but I think if this is passed you know can we send a copy of it to those uh, schools who are still engaged in this practice. Okay, Councillor Donnelly. Thank you. Yeah, and that the notice of motion, if passed, will be communicated um, in uh, accordance with members' wishes. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Harkin. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Councillor Mellon for bringing forward this motion. I think it's uh, appropriate that we're seeing this now. Um, and I think that. Uh, it's a welcome uh, motion and hopefully it'll pass. pass. Uh, this is something that could have been done uh, by Stormont ministers in the past and it's disappointing that that didn't happen. Uh, but if there is agreement now uh, that it should happen, that's a good thing. And it's good to see schools uh, leading uh, from below as well and actually uh, deciding that they're not gonna uh, uh, keep up this practice. Uh, for as people before profit were against academic selection. Um, exams, as we know, really only test your ability to do exams. Um, and uh, right now with a system that fails many, many children every year, uh, the goal has to be to bring all schools up to the same level. And that requires a serious commitment to funding. Uh, so answering many of Hillary's questions, uh, it's about funding, it's about every school uh, being a priority uh, and not one school being better than another school uh, because that will disadvantage uh, many, many students. As is happening across the north right now, many students are losing out because of the way education is being organised. Um, we, we have talked uh, at recent meetings about, uh, you know, teachers being essential workers um, and the needs of our students and the needs of students with special needs. Uh, and we know that the funding crisis um, is failing them. Uh, and uh, so I think the combination of, uh, you know, ridding ourselves of the elitism of academic selection uh, that judges people at such an early age and can have an impact for, on them for the rest of their lives. And also, uh, you know, uh, seriously addressing the funding crisis is the way forward for our education system. And I think, again, this is going to come down to campaigning for it, no matter what Stormont's doing. So what are the teachers unions doing? What are the parents doing? What are students themselves doing uh, to bring about these uh, fundamental changes that we need? Uh, and at the end of the day, the people who lose out, as all our people have said, are working class students. 
um, who won't be able to live in the area where the best schools are. So they, they're, they're losing out uh, in, a, in a number of different ways. So we'll be supporting the motion and thank you for count, the Councillor Mellon for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Councillor McCluskey. Thank you, uh, Mayor, for letting me in. Um, again, I want to support this motion. I think, uh, and it's my party's position, that uh, academic selection is, is, is an injustice which creates economic, social and health outcomes which follow that child for the rest of their lives. Um, the 11 plus was abolished in the north of Ireland, and I think it was 2003, because our MAVE, I thought, would never have to do the 11 plus. Uh, and then it just went on and on and on. Uh, my personal opinion is that if parents want academic selection and schools want to impose academic selection, they should pay for it themselves and, and arrange, arrange it outside of the publicly funded education system. And in that regard, I agree with a lot of what, what, what Sean has just said about you know, the, the requirement in a, any society, education has to be the priority. So, uh, Councillor Mellon, thank you for bringing the uh, motion. As I say, I support it wholeheartedly. Uh, and I'd also like to just pay tribute to the, the work that teachers have been doing in trying to help people through this, 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 this health crisis. And uh, I wish them all the best going forward. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor McCluskey. Councillor McGann. Councillor McCann. Hello. Yes, Eamon, go ahead. Sir. I finally worked a bit. I think I've stubby fingers and all. So then, I, I, I want to support uh, Councillor Mallon's uh, a motion. Of course, I do. Uh, a, and yeah, I'm not going to repeat sort of the things that have been said so far. Uh, I just want to say that the, the uh, academic selection at the age of 11 uh, or whatever uh, doesn't introduce a division sort of into uh, the potential and potential for attainment sort of of uh, young people. It's already there. So what we find sort of is that from a very early age, from nursery age, all the research shows that sort of the, uh, a, a, that the more comfortable a background you come from, the, the better off you're going to be in terms of learning and uh, development. I mean, studies will show, sort of every study conducted will show that that begins around the age of three. What happens at 11 is that there's a sudden uh, widening of the gap through academic selection. A widening of the gap sort of which, uh, from which there is no coming back. If you, uh, it, 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 there are many, many thousands of young people who have disappeared from official registers and so on, who are, uh, uh, who are not at school, who are not in employment. And the question is, where are they? They probably left school and gone into the gig economy or some other informal uh, type of employment, or in many cases, they're ducking and diving sort of uh, uh, to make their way uh, a, a, th a through through life. So, uh, so it's that divide to do this, as has been mentioned. So the point about academic selection sort of, is that the end of academic selection in the morning, you would have to do things, and I'm sure Councillor Mellon and others would agree with this, unless you improved access to nursery schooling, sort of, and uh, uh, schooling right through, you're not really going to bridge the gap, which is there. As I say, what we've seen here is a widening of the gap, not the beginning of it. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Um, Councillor Alderman Guy. All right, thank you, Mayor, for letting me in. Um, we in Ulster Unionist Party, we, we, we're for academic selection, um, although this year there is problems with it. I'm not going to say the much on it, right, because obviously kids have missed three months, so we don't know what the new term holds. Um, we would have been for pushing it back a bit, but what what is going to you know how is his first month or two months going to work out it's a case too of the content would have to be reduced on these exams this time because of the the, the amount of school that's been missed out um it's really it's a, it's, it's a hard decision um and really we don't know until they go back how it's going to affect them so we can sit here and talk about it but no one knows. No one knows, and that's it. That's it. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Alderman Guy. Members, I have no further indicated speakers on this motion, um, and 
I'm going to give Contra Mellon the opportunity to show up. Contra Mellon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you to members who are in support of the motion. Um, I just wanted to um, come across a few things and sum it up. Um, First Lady Councillor Gallagher's um, alleged um, comments that he had towards Champagne as doing a U turn. We've been out in front um, supporting our teachers, supporting our parents, and supporting our schools from the very start of COVID and indeed before a lot of, within the executive. Councillor Gallagher tried to bring a proposal to uh, an early COVID briefing that he was told would not be accepted because it was a briefing and we could not um, put proposals or motions to the floor. So uh, if it was sculled on process, that's, that's hard now. Uh, and uh, as well, Hillary, um, Councillor or Alderman McClintic, um said around if um, there's no other criteria and how would we do it? That would be up in the school boards. But what we would be saying here at the council is that we support the young people um, and not allowing a greater dis educational disadvantage to take place because of the COVID situation that we have found the society to be in and our young people do not need any more undue stress. Um, in terms of uh, Councillor Alderman Guy's comments around the unknown, that is exactly why we should be calling to suspend academic selection. Would you put your own children, and, and I'm sure that I wouldn't put mine in it, to the unknown, to, to be involved in a stressful situation that they have already gone through a lot of educational poverty in some places, uh, and there is no fair or equal opportunity for all young people with an academic selection. And particularly not within this year when there's been lack of educational resource. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. Uh, I think we're going to have to go to a vote on this one. So over to yourself, John. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. Thank you, members. Uh, Alderman Breslin. Against. Alderman Devaney. Against. Alderman Guy. Against. Alderman Carrigan. Against. Alderman McClintock. Against. Alderman McCready. I think he's dropped out. He's not here. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Alderman McKean. Against. Alderman Ramsey. Against. Alderman Wark. Alderman Wark. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr. Barr. Uh, Councillor John Boyle. Barr. Councillor Michaela Boyle? Four. Councillor Burke? Four. Councillor Carr? Four. Councillor Cooper? Four. Councillor Cusick? Four. Councillor Dobbins is not here. Councillor Donnelly? Four. Councillor Duffy? Four. Councillor Durkin? Four. Councillor Edward? Four. Councillor Farrell? Four. Councillor Ferguson. Four. Councillor Fleming. Four, John. Uh, Councillor Gallagher, are you back with us? Yes. Four. Councillor Harkin. Councillor Harkin. Four. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Four. Councillor Kelly, are you with us? Four. Thank you. Councillor Logue. Four. Councillor McCann. Four. Councillor McCluskey. Four. Councillor McGuire. Councillor McGuire. Four, John. Councillor McKee. Four, John. Councillor McKeever. Four. Councillor McKinney. Councillor Mellon. Four. Councillor Mooney. Four, John. Councillor Riley. It's four, John. Councillor Tierney. Four, John. Thank you, members. Sorry, John, against this uh, older man work here. <coughs> John, it's older man yeah. work here again. Yeah, we've got you, Graham. We've got you.
Okay, members, um, the result is 29-4, eight against and no attendance. So that motion is carried um, by Councillor Mellon. Um, thank you, Councillor Mellon. Um, members, moving on, the, the next notice of motion is in the name of Councillor Farrell. Councillor Farrell. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I'll take my motion as read, and I think I've a seconder from our group. Yeah, yep. <clears throat> I'm content to uh, second that, Mayor John Boyle. Thank you, uh, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Farrell, go ahead. Thanks, John. Um, it's it's excellent news that, that funding for the medical school has been approved and that also universally have begun to advertise the course. Um, it's been a long, hard battle, but we're nearly there. Um, hurdles await in terms of GMC accreditation, but the bulk of the work has been done and we're hopeful of student intake in September 2021. Um, it's been a team effort involving the executive, also university, Irish and British governments and stakeholders across the healthcare sector. Uh, the medical school, once open, will address the shortage of doctors across the north and bring more students to McGee, which is a, it's a one one for Derry. Talking of students, uh, it's no secret that we need more at McGee. Progress uh, since the 10,000 target was announced in 2011 has been glacial. Uh, since then, McGee has achieved an average of 20 extra students per year. At the current rate of expansion, it will take 300 years to reach 10,000 students. Relocating health sciences from Jordanstown to McGee could bring 800 extra students. That's 40 years of current growth overnight. Ulster University is moving health sciences from Jordanstown. That is happening. Uh, the question is, where will all the radiotherapy, occupational therapy, radiography, where will all those students go? Will it be McGee, will it be Coleraine, or will it be Belfast? Um, the SDLP obviously want those 800 students and the associated academic, technical and admin staff to come to Derry, uh, and so does this council. We demanded it back in February. Uh, coincidentally, in February, Ulster University announced that its preferred option in terms of relocation of the courses was that all undergraduates would go to McGee and all postgrads would go to Belfast. Um, that option works for us. Um, but also, University also made their own helpful announcement that it would conduct a public consultation on the available options. The end result could be that Belfast gets everything uh, and we get nothing, a Groundhog Day that we're all sadly familiar with. Um, the consultation has happened, whether we like it or not, uh, and is currently paused due to COVID. The original consultation document mentioned tacit approval for the medical school. Tacit means implied, it means suggested, it means hunted. Uh, but the recent confirmation of funding is a game changer, and those words no longer apply. Also, university should update its documents to reflect this. Also, university should make it very clear with no ambiguities that McGee is the best location for health sciences and the 800 students that it attracts. Derry expects also university to deliver McGee expansion. Relocating these courses uh, will demonstrate a level of commitment to the Northwest, and relocating these courses will provide a signal of intent. We can wait in years, but we cannot wait 300 years. Health sciences must come to McGee. Thank you. Um, Councillor Farrell. Councillor Cooper, there's someone there. Just before you come on there, Councillor Cooper, there's someone with a TV seems to be on in the background. Um, if you're not speaking, could you just uh, knock off your mic, please? Um, Councillor Cooper, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, we have no issue with the motion. Um, and even if we take the gems aside, the medical school aside, the, the argument for allied uh, health courses that come to McGee, as far as we're concerned, it's, it's already both well rehearsed and extremely uh, well justified in terms of even the also universities approach of the last few years, stated approach that um, they would try and cluster certain courses, uh, certain faculties within certain campuses. Um, so from our perspective, there's no brainer that allied health would already be coming here in terms of all of the, the medical, um, in terms of the school nurse and all of that that's already in place. So we, we would be completely supportive of this. The, the, the point around the, the consultation, uh, we, we had certain concerns about in terms of documents being revised that would have caused 
any any issue around uh, things having to go back to scratch, but we've been assured that that's that's not going to be the case. So from our perspective, there's no issue uh, supporting this. Um, the the idea of, of student numbers again, this is just one small element of it. Uh, this will be very much not one big bang around the ten thousand students. This is going to be a number of uh, different elements uh, in, in terms of uh, the other projects around KR, for example, coming from the city. The monies that have already been secured. And the work that was done uh, by both our former MP, by our MLAs, and all our stakeholders, and all our partners, and all our parties, is all uh, to be acknowledged and, and recognised. Um, but as a starting point, in terms of having a large chunk of additional Mazen uh, put onto the McGee campus, this is a, a no-brainer. Uh, and as far as we're concerned, the uh, the people here responding to the consultation, we would hope would already realise that the medical school is is going to be coming uh, the pass anyway. That people here. Um, minded enough to respond to the consultation, will have that uh, already on their radar. But there's no harm in, in uh, making that more uh, that clarity even more uh, clear uh, within the consultation documents. Uh, again, the consultation perspective wasn't required. It should have been uh, a, a, a case of uh, automatically uh, the university stating that the, the, the places would come to McGee. But we are where we are. So from our perspective, uh, making that extra clarity is not an issue from our perspective. It's making sure this consultation is carried out as soon as possible is the most important thing, and hopefully we get those places moved as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Pepper. Councillor McCann. Damon, are you online? Councillor McCann. Hey. Hello. Y yes, I'm going to go ahead. Sorry, somebody keeps going unmuting me. Anyway, uh, uh, muting and unmuting. Uh, I, I, I just submitted an amendment in the afternoon. I mean, I wonder if can that be put up? Or, uh, I don't want to be reading it out and wasting time. Yes, it's, it's coming yeah. on screen there now. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat all that. Obviously, I want to. So I support all the arguments that have been yeah. made. If you just if you just bear with us, um, we need to get a seconder for your oh, amendment. Sorry, of course you do. A seconder for that amendment, folks. I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Councillor McCann, go ahead. Okay. I Say first a bit. I leave that the argument is contained within sort of the uh, uh, wording of the amendment itself. So I don't have to go um, over that again. This day, if anybody in Belfast thinks that they have gained from uh, Derry being deprived of university education, they should think again. Uh, they should look at the uh, a, the result sort of, of cramming in. They're trying to cram in an extra 13,000 students into Belfast city centre. You only have to drive through it or walk through it to see uh, what's happening. And if you look at the details of what's happening there, and there's a warning here for Derry, you know the details of what is happening. For example, I mean, academics are hot desky. They don't have rooms of their own. There's nowhere where students and uh, lecturers can meet, sort of to create sort of the proper ambience a, 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 of, a, of a university. And they, 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 they keep in mind that uh, also that with a lot of concentration here, and it underlies an awful lot of the discussion, that the purpose of a university would be to regenerate or uh, uh, upgrade the generation sort of, of the economy. That's a terrific thing when it happens. And if you have thousands more students in Derry, of course that would be good for the economy. But that ought not to be our only argument. So the reason I mentioned sort of the bleak wasteland that's been created in Belfast is that you know, if people study uh, uh, the humanities and languages sort of, uh, uh, and history, they actually, in the present climate over the last couple of years, have more chance of getting a job than people who study STEM subjects. I mean, and that is very often sort of a a a, a, a lost sight lost sight of. So I mean, we should be encouraging sort of the wider cultural a, a expression of university uh, education here uh, a, in Derry. Let me give you a sing, a little example of what I'm talking about. The Kane uh, website, Kane site only employed a tiny number of people, really was tiny, a handful. You count them on the fingers a, a, of one hand. Right? And, a, and yet, it was of tremendous importance, wasn't it, to Derry and to the cultural life and reputation a, of Derry. So there's a lesson in that for, uh, a, for all of us when we come to consider a, a education. Third level education is a social good in itself. It doesn't have to have a provable, a measurable sort of uh, economic effect in order to be a good 
uh, a thing in itself. So we've all got the right. We talked a few minutes ago about academic selection and the way so, so many young people are left behind. Well, you know, people are left behind all the time, sort of, if we want to have sort of a, a, an educational system that serves the needs sort of, of all the people and the, the, the soul of people as well, sort of as their economic uh, well-being. Then we have to argue it on that basis. And it seems to me sort of that Derry has got a better chance of attracting students sort of, uh, 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 and developing a viable uh, university that takes that approach than merely sort of well, counting things. As I mentioned in the motion, I'll finish uh, uh, on this sort of uh, uh, when we have university leaders and other people supporting universities who are all pros and no poetry. That doesn't enhance the quality of university education and it doesn't enhance the prospect of a proper university with 10,000 plus students. Councillor McCann, can you bring your remarks to a close, please? Yep. That's it. Thank you. I'm Councillor McCann. Alderman Devaney is next to speak. Alderman Devaney, are you looking to speak on the amendment or on the original motion by Councillor Farrell? Uh, sort of, I'll speak on the amendment. Uh, uh, I was going to speak on, I was looked at, looking at the, the motion coming forward by Councillor Farrell. Right. So I can just speak at the amendment uh, at the moment. Okay. Councillor, um, just look um, at the end of the day, uh, I see nothing um, that we couldn't agree on here. Um, I, I, I do see that. Uh, very little uh, in the, the amendment about the good news of the money that has been ring-fenced around here. And I think we should all take that as a very, very positive. Uh, and, you know, as the previous speakers have said uh, on the, the, the motion coming forward by Councillor Farrell, you, you know, you're, you're banging on a, on a very much, on a very, the, the chamber has very much unilaterally agreed on the expansion of McGee and the argument for the, the medical school. So it's something, Mr. Mayor, that we are very, very united on. Uh, we don't have any problem in supporting the amendment. Thank you, Alderman Devaney. Councillor Kerber on the amendment. <clears throat> Thanks, Mayor. Um, well, the first thing I would say is um, the, the first line of Councillor McKenna's amendments in terms of the, the argument being well rehearsed and, and being won. Uh, is, it's welcome that he stated that, well, hopefully as acknowledgement, that uh, the executive, uh, in, in terms of, um, we would obviously say from Michelle O'Neill's perspective in particular, taking this forward under the executive office around the, the uh, medical school as, as, as a starting point to expansion, um, that, that is, it's shown it uh, from our perspective at the executive level that this is uh, McGee expansion is, is being seen as a as an absolute necessity and game changer for the Northwest. So I'm, I'm glad he's put on that first line. The wider stuff that he has on there, I can't really see what the rest of his motion is actually calling for in any specific sense. I mean, as far as I can see, he's talking STEAM, not STEM, in the sense that uh, STEM, uh, focusing on science, technology, engineering, maps, has, has been seen as the, the main driver. And in many ways, that's justified in terms of the, the new type of uh, employment we're trying to attract here in terms of a book international and by SMEs here locally. It's it's in many ways the, the new show in town, but the, the, the aid and mustn't aid the arts and that covers things like humanities as well, like uh, history, politics and, and much wider than that, uh, that that still has to be uh, serviced as well or, or, or given expression to by any decent university that it is as expansive as that in terms of the course offers that are that are there. I mean, higher history and politics was moved to four in a number of years ago. I, I have three degrees out of out of my campus. Two of them are in higher history and politics. The others in computing. Um, so I'm talking at it from from both angles. Um, you know, I would say we need as much STEM employment as possible and, and STEM focused courses, but we still should have uh, an arts element there and covering arts and humanities. So I have no issue with the rest of the uh, the motion. The only thing that I can see is it doesn't actually. It states a lot, it makes a lot of statements, um, which I've no real issue with, but it's not actually calling for anything in addition. Uh, the cane issue in itself is, is symptomatic of the fact that humanities and arts has been sort of pushed aside in terms of the McGee campus, and I, I think that is a tragedy because specifically Derry's reputation as a cultural centre, that should still be given expression to by the courses that are offered. Um, there's nothing in there that's actually calling for anything in addition, as far as I can see. Um, but we've no issue um, supporting the amendments uh, on, the, on the, the rationale that I've just given. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Clipper. Members, I have no other indicated speakers um, on the amendment, so I'm going to put the amendment to uh, the 
before. Well, I haven't really heard any dissenting voices, so um, if I, I, unless I do, members, I'm going to take it as read. The amendment as read. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, the amendment is passed and referred now to the substantive motion. Again, members, at this point, I've no indicated speaker on the on the substantive motion. Yep, okay. Um, I'm going to give um, Councillor Farrell the opportunity to sum up. Councillor Farrell. Uh, th thanks, Mayor. Um, when I had written this motion, I anticipated an avalanche of amendments, and I didn't really get it. Um, we got one from people before profit that probably multiplied the, the size of the motion by 10. Um, and as, as Councillor Cooper has said, um, it, it doesn't really ask for anything, but, you know, it doesn't ask for anything, therefore we can't really oppose it. Uh, so I am glad uh, that there was support for this motion uh, across the chamber and there, there were no dissenting voices. And I think it's important that we do speak with one voice in something that is important, as is important to our city as university expansion. So thank you. Thank you. Can I come in? Can I come in again? Sorry, Councillor McCann, I haven't. I've given Councillor Farrell the opportunity to sum up the debate. Okay, the, 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 that's ridiculous. That that doesn't the debate, the debate is no, Councillor McCann. Councillor McCann, the debate is sorry, now closed. The debate is now closed, and I'm going to put the substantive motion to the floor. Um, and as a, again, I haven't heard any dissenting voices, so I'm going to take it as read, unless you make me aware. Oh. Thank you, members. That uh, motion in the name of Councillor Farrell um, has passed unanimously. Thank you, Councillor Farrell. Members, um, I'm going to suggest that we take a short break um, once again, um, and we'll come back in about 15 minutes, and we'll hear um, the motion from Councillor Michaela Boyle. But about 10 past 10, members, um, if, if that's okay. Thank you.
Okay, members, uh, we're going to kick off uh, once again. Um, we're going to start with the motion in the name of Councillor Michaela Boyle. Okay, Mayor, uh, thank you. I'll take the motion as read. And um, if I could second her motion. Second that, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. Uh, members, I've submitted this motion um, calling for an interdepartmental interagency approach to tackle the increasing spread of hogweed in a proactive and effective manner. In Straban, like many other areas across the uh, council district area, there has been an alarming spread of giant hogweed along the banks of our local rivers, footpaths and road verges over recent years. This has led to the increasing concerns about its serious health risks that it poses, evidenced by the many serious injuries that have been caused to children and adults alike, resulting from contact with this giant invasive species. Like many other elected representatives across the district, I have been making representations to the relevant agencies to take action as and when constituents contact me about the hogweed flourishing in this or that particular area. And more recently, we see it along our footways. However, I believe the problem of hogweed spread can only be tackled if there is a planned, coordinated, multi-agency approach to this problem and one which will ensure the necessary resources and spray treatment measures are made available to tackle it. I'm therefore asking Council to support this motion, calling upon the Minister for Agricultural, Environment and Rural Affairs to formulate a joined up strategy with the Minister for Infrastructure and in conjunction with Council and other relevant statutory agencies, ensuring that this growing problem is at last addressed in a proactive, holistic and effective manner. The giant hogweed can grow 20 foot tall. It's often mistaken for cow parsnip and not everybody is aware of it. So I believe we also do need to be raising an educational aware, awareness campaign around this issue. The symptoms that it causes, uh, that the giant hogweed causes, uh, can be very severe, sometimes disfiguring uh, the individual who comes into contact with it leaving them blistered and sometimes even more extreme causes of it as extreme blistering and burning and indeed blindness also. In terms of uh, legislation here in the north in, in relation to um, invasive species, there really isn't any. Um, it is governed uh, by the Countryside Act and Wildlife and Natural Environment Act. Um, uh, and uh, to be honest, it, it's not really robust enough. Uh, it states in the Countryside Act, if you have invasive plants on your premises, you have a responsibility to prevent them from spreading and making a nuisance. Or if you own land or occupy land, you must uh, specify, you must be uh, comply with the specific legal responsibilities, which include the spraying, the burning and the burial of soil uh, that, it, that um, holds the invasive plant material. Uh, it, also, it also tells us that you do not need to notify anyone about the invasive uh, plant on your land. So this lets landowners off the hook in terms of dealing with the invasive species. Uh, I want to commend uh, our councillor workers uh, for what they do in carrying out their duty uh, in dealing with this hogweed and making sure that it is eliminated off our own council property. Um, I want to um, also uh, pay compliment to the development and implementation of the Dairy and Straban Green Infrastructure Plan, which seeks to conduct habitat and species surveys on council owned properties. And in that, it, 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 it states that it will ra raise awareness, conduct surveys, and control of invasion of alien species on council owned land. So I would I would welcome updates on that as we move forward with with this motion. Um, all of that is in our own biodiversity plans. But as I said, members, I'm I'm asking everyone to to um, support this motion this evening as we have before us. It is a growing problem. It's a growing health concern within the city and the district. And we also need to raise a, a public awareness about people coming into contact with this species and the dangers of it. 
Gormila Mayagov, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Boyle. Um, Councillor Edwards. Mayor, um, thank you for, for letting me in. I'm going to keep my comments brief given the time, but I thank uh, Councillor Boyle for bringing uh, this motion um, today. And like her and Straban, I've been raising the issue of uh, how we drew in. Um, the DARE DEA over recent weeks. And, and this motion calls for um, an interagency approach. I think that's desperately, desperately needed. And I've seen that firsthand where I've been chasing council um, who deal with hogweed on council ground. I've been chasing river service who deal with the river banks, locks agency who deals with our lakes, and then road service who, who deal with um, our roads. So I think um, an interagency approach is desperately needed here. And again, the same as uh, Councillor Boy, I do have concerns about hogweed on private land. And I seen firsthand a few weekends ago um, with a, a local activist and, and Derek Hussey in um, Sayam Mows um, in, in the middle of a, of a wooded area. There's, there's hogweed, as Councillor Boyle had said, um, it's 20 foot tall, it's, it's up at the roof or the treetops. Uh, and we do believe that. Um, uh, a lot of seeds and stuff are carrying um, from there along the riverbanks um, and up to up to Straban. So I do believe that this is a is an issue that needs um, some action on, and I think that the interagency approaches is, is the best way to do it. But we also need to look at private landowners and how we can maybe or maybe it's a stormant issue how how legislation can be strengthened um, where use and hogweed uh, hogweed is on, on on people's private land. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor Edwards. Alderman Ramsey. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Boyle, for bringing this forward. Um, realistically, up until this week, I knew very little about hogweed, and my colleague, uh, Alderman Devaney, um, made that clear whenever I was given this. He said, what do you know about hogweed? <laughs> but uh, I, made, I made the effort to... Uh, to learn about it this week, um, and um, I've listened carefully to what you're saying, Michaela. And you know, there's no doubt about it. This is a very, very dangerous um, uh, weed, um, and the fact that it, you know it does produce twenty thousand seeds, roughly, they produce in their lifespan. Um, there's a case study, the River Row Lamavari, um, where they they currently have a system in place it's from two thousand and nine, where all the hogweed was removed. It's a five-step process, identify solutions, quote, removal and treatment. The big issue for us in our council is treatment um, because it has to be chemically treated. Um, this is a really, really evasive uh, plant and the dangers of this plant, and obviously our Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 um, is clear that, you know, it's illegal uh to have this about the place really it's it's just it's just a very very dangerous uh weed to have about um i know in my local water side area myself uh and alderman mcclintock it's uh, ours would be like the falcon river which we all know is a very important river as well and that's infested with this weed so um legislation is, is has to be definitely looked at we have to obviously look at the use of chemicals in this regard and there's no other way of getting rid of this weed. Yes, uh, it does be taken away from the top to the bottom uh, and then basically treated then. Uh, and it has to be put under. Alderman the Ramsey, as interested and as I am and thank all you, your um, facts, but I'm asking you to bring your remarks to a close. Thank you very thank much you. to, uh, again, to Councillor Boyle for bringing this forward. And it's great education. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Councillor Ramsey. Number five, no other. Councillor Gallagher. Councillor Gallagher? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I'm uh, happy to support the motion. Uh, and I, I would ask maybe the proposer of possibly adding a C onto it. And, and, and that is sending uh, this motion to Donegal County Council. This this uh, plant, and I, when it's activated, it can travel in the air. Uh, this giant hogweed if, if we it runs the river foil and the fan runs right through our, our district and it also on the far side of the bank is Donegal and if, if we were treating it this side and it goes untreated on the far side it just it'll travel back over 
So we need to treat this as an All Ireland approach, and that we could send this motion to um, Donegal Council and ask them to work alongside us and formulate a, a cross border uh, strategy of dealing with this problem. Or, or, and if we don't, we will we will see hogweed along the foil and the fin for a very long time, even though we're we're spending money and resources to try and get rid of it. So. It, I would ask the proposal maybe to put on a C, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Um, Alderman Guy. Uh, thanks, Bear, for letting me on. Um, we support this here motion fully. Um, completely agree with everything uh, Councillor Boyle has said. Um, I would just like to make an amendment, and it's not really changing it, it's just adding something to it. Where it says, given the increase in spread of giant hogweed, can we add and Japanese knotweed to that as well? I know there's been a, a big problem with Japanese knotweed around the Fahan uh, after the bad floods of a few years ago, and in the Eglinton area as well. So we could just maybe add that, and that's, that's all I want to say on the matter. You know, it's, it's grand, and I'm happy to support the motion. Thanks. Thanks, Bear. Thanks. Thank you, um, Alderman Guy. Yeah. Um, Alderman Guy, yeah, that's a, an amendment, so it needs a seconder um, on that. So if I can get a seconder, members. I second that. Second yeah. Alderman McCain and Councillor Ferguson, I think that was. Okay, members, the, uh, I've no other indicated speaker at this point, so the amendment, first of all, is in front of you. I'm not hearing many dissenting voices, so I'm going to take it as read, unless uh, someone makes me aware. Okay, um, that's the amendment um, passed uh, unanimously. Again, members, I have no other indicated speaker on this motion, so I'm going to give Councillor Michaela Boyle the opportunity to sum up. Yeah, thank Councilor you. Boyle. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks everyone for their comments, and, and, and thank you uh, for uh, Councillor Guy's amendment also. I have no problem with including Japanese knotwood in that. Um, and thanks, there was no descending voices um, on such an important issue. And I, I know just in relation to Council Gallagher's comments, um, my party colleagues in Donegal um, are also bringing this forward as a motion to Donegal County Council also. Um, you know, so, and he's absolutely right in his comments, you know, the seed spread, as, as Councillor Ramsey said, 20,000 seeds in each plant, and they do spread. Birds carry them, uh, the wind carries it. So, so uh, along the river banks, if you clear it in one, one area, it grows in another. So it does need um, a, a multi-agency, inter-agency approach and an all Ireland approach to it as well also. Uh, thank you everybody for supporting the um, motion here before us this evening. Gormila Mayogut, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Members, I'm going to put the substantive motion to the floor. Um, and again, I'm not hearing any dissenting voices, so I'm going to take it as read, unless um, members make me aware. No. Okay, I'm going to take it to that motion has passed unanimously. Um, thank you, Councillor Boyle. And members are hopefully content that we also uh, forward that motion to Donegal County Council as it's suggested um, by Councillor Gallagher. So moving on, um, the motion in the name of Councillor McCann. Councillor McCann, go ahead. Councillor McCann, are you online there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Eamon. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to read out the motion again because of the lateness of the hour and so forth. But uh, I can say that one of the reasons I. Uh, can you just bear with me? If you're, if you're not going to read it out, I need to get a second before you start speaking this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Can I get a second for Councillor McCann's motion, please? Happy to second. If you need it. Yep. Councillor McCluskey, um, seconding. Go ahead, Councillor McCann. Okay, I think that there can be very few of us, if any, who have not encountered members of the public who believe that they have been badly treated uh, by representatives of official organisations when they make complaints. Now, it is always possible, of course, that people, uh, disgruntled people uh, of this sort, have no valid complaint to make. The point is that they have not been satisfied or treated with dignity and respect by uh, the institutions uh, about whom 
uh, I, they are, they, that they are complaining. Uh, I want to urge people to read the report published on the 25th of last month of the Northern Ireland Audit Office. I don't usually go around recommending sort of dry reading uh, to people, but this is a fascinating report. It calls for, for example, one of its uh, uh, clearest calls is for all public bodies, councils and, and others, to appoint a champion for external whistleblowers. That is to say, someone who will take complaints from people outside the institution, not workers or councillors, but people from outside who are making complaints that there ought to be somebody, the report says, to whom uh, a, a person with complaints about the operation of the uh, institution to go and consult, and that person should champion sort of the right sort of individuals to do that. It seems to me that this is very necessary indeed. The report references and other things, a, a number of matters, including, obviously, the RHA uh, a scandal. And it explicitly says that in any meetings resulting from a, a complaint by an external person with a, officials of the public body concerned should be recorded. There shouldn't be like in the RHA where uh, advisors and politicians and officials of one kind or another were having meetings and making decisions without anything being recorded. Such meetings should be recorded so there can be no argument afterwards about what was said on behalf of the public body and what was said by the people uh, uh, a, a making the complaint. It's a very simple motion, but the implications of it, it seems to me, are very profound. Sort of, and I think that the, uh, uh, a, 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 the country will be doing well uh, to uh, listen to what the NIAO has to say and to blaze a trail for the rest of the public sector sort of, uh, in the north by uh, appointing someone either from within the uh, a council or recruited uh, for, uh, for the, uh, uh, the purpose. Because the person you'll go to, the go-to person, to make complaints against the way public bodies treat citizens. I'm, I will give examples if you want, but many of these issues arise in relation to the environment and to people. Like, for example, I have in mind the Fochan Anglers, the Prahem Environmental and Historical Society, and many others. We have bitter complaints to make about the way they've been treated by official bodies and as things go at the minute, there's nobody to speak for them then because they are external. If it hadn't been for an external whistleblower, we might never have known about the shenanigans which went on behind the scenes and which led to the RHI scandal. I command the motion to you. Thank you for that, um, Councillor McCann. Councillor John Boyle. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, also thank you to uh, Councillor McCann for bringing the motion forward. I, I do agree with him. Uh, it's a very simple motion. Um, it could have uh, very profound effects and hopefully a very, very uh, positive profound effects uh, on how it is that we do business and how it is that, that as a council, uh, Derry City and Stravan District Council communicates and listens to um, uh, our constituents uh, and indeed uh, our rate payers. Um, so, uh, on behalf of the SDLP, and you'd be pleased to know this, Mayor, uh, I intend on keeping this very, very brief. Uh, given the lateness of the hour, indeed, I was starting to worry there. I have to get my bin out for the bin man. I was thinking I might have met them in the morning uh, on the way out. Um, so, just to say, Mayor, actually, the report that, that the Councillor McCann is uh, referring to, um, I have read it. Um, uh, it is very extensive. It's primarily aimed, uh, as I'm sure all other members will appreciate, uh, at, at, at those who work for uh, government agencies and indeed people who work uh, in councils uh, included in that. Um, and actually, in a couple of paragraphs on one page, there's reference to um, members of the public and how it is that they might become, in inverted commas, whistleblowers. Um, but they are no less important, and, and, and Councillor McCann is quite correct, uh, to highlight, for example, uh, one example uh, 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 in, in relation to the, the RHI and how it was a member of the public who came forward um, and to some intents and purposes didn't get listened to uh, and certainly felt very unsatisfied with the treatment that they, would re they received. And I would like to think um, that, that going forward um, and after we uh, support this motion, and I fully expect that we will, um, that, that our council will uh, find a mechanism uh, to put in place a champion, in inverted commas, uh, of the ordinary man or woman, boy or, or girl in the street. Uh, and I look forward to that day. It's certainly something I think that we should should all welcome. Um, it's an opportunity for uh, even greater transparency um, uh, in the work that, that we do. And of course, that's notwithstanding 
that uh, elected representatives uh, are uh, supposed to fulfil that role, and and uh, in the course of our work, uh, our councils we do. Bring your mark to mark there, well, please, I thank please. you, for, I thank you very much again, uh, Councillor McCann, and again, Mayor. That's about as brief as I could keep it. I'll get the buns out now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Uh, I know that was a struggle for you to keep that brief. Um, Alderman Kerrigan. I'll, uh, thank you, Mayor, for letting uh, Mayor, I uh, read this motion and uh, took a good study at it, but uh, as far as I see, we have nothing to fear in this motion. We're more than content with it. And uh, I would be reminded, Mayor, that uh, uh, we are content for the EUP to support it. Uh, I personally have had no problem at all within our council. I think all our council staff are more than uh, 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 to to anyone, and that was before I was on council. Any dealings I had with them, so I would imagine we should have no difficulty whatsoever with our own staff uh, in that regard. And uh, so I have no problem supporting it, and we'll fully support the motion. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. Um, Councillor Logue. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would like to thank Councillor McKeon for bringing this motion, and indeed uh, the audit office report of raising concerns in November. 2014, seeing the publication of a good practice guide for public sector workers and employers on whistleblowing or raising concerns for employees. This guide has been a very useful tool, which has been used by different sectors of public services. However, reviews and practices always throw up gaps, followed by recommendations. And there, there is a clear recommendation coming from this report that a raising concerns policy for a third party or members of the public is needed in all public sector organizations. And that this policy has key criteria that leads to an effective processing of the concerns raised. Therefore, our party have fully support this motion on council appointing a person who has a relevant skill set to champion this policy. Thank you, Councillor Luke. Members, I have no further speakers um, on this motion at this point, so I'm going to give Councillor McCann the opportunity to sum up. Councillor McCann. I'm content, Brian. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Members, I haven't heard any dissenting voices, so once again, I'm going to take this motion as is read, unless um, anyone wants to make me aware of that now. No. Okay, members, that motion in the name of Councillor McCann has passed um, unanimously. Moving on, the next motion is in the name of Councillor Harkin. Councillor Harkin, would you like to move your motion? I would, yeah. Uh, I'm going to take it as read. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Can we get a seconder for that motion, please? Second it. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Yeah. Councillor Harkin, go ahead. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm sure people have heard uh, that uh, thousands, 2,000 Debenhams workers were laid off at 11 stores in the south. Um, and this is something, uh, this is really the, the kind of redundancies that we worried could uh, come about as a result of the pandemic. Um, so this is a massive job loss. And um, uh, many more workers, unfortunately, are... are uh, being told the same is happening to them. And this is really an issue uh, across Ireland, across the world. So uh, this motion is about standing in solidarity with the Debenhams workers um, who uh, feel that Debenhams uh, isn't living up to the commitments that they made to the workers uh, a number of years ago in terms of contractually agreed redundancy. Um, and they haven't just idly stood by, they, they've taken action. So they have uh, organized protests uh, at the Debenham stores in the south. Um, they have come to Belfast and they've come to Derry and people have stood in solidarity with them uh, all across the island because I think people very much identify with the issues that they're raising and believe that they should be uh, treated fairly. So there's a number of ways in which the demands of the workers um, can be met. One of them is by, through the parent company, taking responsibility for the, re the redundancy 
package uh, that the workers should have access to. Um, there's also the responsibility of the of the Irish government and the Bank of Ireland, who are connected into this in different ways. Um, so this is really about standing uh, and supporting their demand, standing in support of their activism, um, and really encouraging them to continue the fight until they get justice. And obviously, this is not just about uh, Debenhams workers. Um, we we had an earlier discussion when Brian reported back about his meeting with the Trades Council. Uh, workers at Eason's, at Thornton's, um, at Ulster University catering workers uh, here at McGee. Uh, and there's many, many, many more examples that people probably are familiar with where workers are now being told that they're going to be made redundant. Um, I think that the concern we have would be that uh, some decisions about redundancy are being made uh, without uh, enough concern about the impact that it's going to have on workers, the impact it's going to have on communities, and the impact that it's going to have on the overall economy. Um, so really, you know, companies need to accept after being bailed out themselves through the pandemic um, that they have a res broader responsibility, a social responsibility, um, and need to be able to work with council, with government, to, to protect jobs, protect communities, and to protect um, uh, the economy. Uh, so they can't just be making decisions based on what they think is best for their shareholders uh, and for their CEOs. And indeed, uh, I'm sure people or some people will have read uh, the reports about uh, Debenhams owners and management planning to uh, have a 20 million euro payout for shareholders in the autumn. Um, and this is this is the kind of uh, this is unacceptable when when thousands of workers are losing their jobs. Uh, and face a, 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 a limited uh, redundancy. Um, so there's all sorts of ways. There, there's much that I think government can do in terms of stepping in to stop redundancies, to stop mass redundancies, um, uh, uh, you know, as they did during the pandemic. Um, but I but I think that the, one of the things that I think is most important is it's, it's workers taking action at Debenhams and I think we want to send the message of solidarity to all workers who face this, that they have- Mr. The Hurt, can I ask you to bring your remarks to a close, please? And I, and, I, and I think the same is true of Easton's workers and Thornton's, that we stand in solidarity with them, encourage them to fight and stand up and, and win justice. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hurt. And Councillor Jackson? Um, Mail, good Mayor, and thank you for the Councillor Hurt for bringing the motion. Um, can I start by um, welcoming the engagement with yourself, Mayor, um, with the Trade Council, um, which was alluded to earlier in the meeting, and Councillor Harkin referenced it in the speaking points, because there is a lot of concern right across the island, as Councillor Harkin has pointed out, around redundancies um, and potential closures, particularly within the retail sector. And we would be keen to see Council Council's ongoing support for local businesses, particularly within the retail center or sector. So um, I just wanted to start by making that point. But in relation to the motion, um, on behalf of Sinn Féin, we support the motion. Um, it's scandalous how the Debenhams workers have been treated. After give, given years of service to the company, the very least that they should expect is to be treated with fairness and respect. Our party, party leader, Mary Lou MacDonald, has been to the fore in supporting the Debenhams workers um, and highlighting their cause um, with the Irish government. And the reality is that, um, that successive Irish governments have not stepped up in an appropriate way to protect workers against tactical liquidations and insolvencies. The state needs to intervene now to protect the rights of Debenhams workers and all other workers during this time of an economic crisis. And we believe that the best intervention is to legislate. Um, so I'm proposing a small amendment. I don't know if you sent it to um, the committee clerks. So hopefully it should be coming on the screen shortly.
Sorry, Mayor, just through you, Teresa, I'm just checking, do you have that amount? No, she didn't receive it. Okay. Um, do you want to um, send it through again, Christopher? Well, I, I can, I can, I can read it out. In a way. Sure. Yeah. See, just um, on the second last paragraph. Or no, 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 no. So apologies. In the in the last paragraph, it's just at the end, at, at the end of where it says workers' rights. Um and. Uh, I put on insert and calls on the Irish government to legislate. To bring an end to the practice of tactical insolvencies. And liquidations. Sorry, members. Um, what's can I get a second or no for that uh, amendment from Councillor Jackson, please? Happy to second, Sandra. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Members, uh, the next indicated speaker is Councillor McCann. Councillor McCann, are you speaking on the amendment or on the substantive motion? Well, I can speak on both, I'm speaking on both really, you know. Yeah, go ahead. It's okay. I mean, I just the point I wanted to make really was that sometimes, you know, we think that passing resolutions like this, you know, I, I mean, have got no weight, they're of no effect, they're just sort of a, a radical to a, a, a windbaggery of some sort, sort of that makes no difference. I just want to, to say to people, and I'm sure quite a number might know, that if you are involved in an industrial dispute like the Debenhams uh, uh, workers are, if you're tromping up and down on a picket line, sort of a night, the rain's coming down on you. Resolutions like this, motions like this, passed through a council, can have an enormous effect on your morale. It has I mean, I know that from personal experience. So the only reason I'm saying this is just to put it into the minds of councillors that this isn't an empty uh, ritual we are going through here. This can have a material effect and on that basis, like others uh, uh, before me, like Councillor Jackson and others, uh, I commend the motion to you. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Councillor Durkin, are you looking to speak on the amendment or on the substantive motion? Um, Mayor, I'm uh, speaking on the motion, but I can speak on both. Go ahead. Um, just to indicate we'll be supporting the motion and we're happy to support the amendment too. And thank the previous speakers and thank Councillor Harkin for bringing the issue before and indeed for the work he's been doing on this issue. And it's it's perfectly right, you know, the, the pandemic more than anything has shown a light on the importance of uh, unions and uh, the vulnerabilities of workers. Uh, of course, earlier on, it was in relation to the health and safety issues where people were literally thinking they were choosing between lives and livelihoods, forced into hard choices. But uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one that has been dealing with people who contacted in terms of redundancy. They've been getting redundancy notices, maybe on a Friday afternoon and told to respond by a Monday. They've no union, they've nowhere to turn to, they've no idea about their rights. And people are really it's living in fear. Workers are living in fear. Um, we need to show and send a strong message. Um, Sean's right, this message uh, or this campaign is so important because it will send a message and precedent to other employers and welcome Chris's uh, uh, amendment calling for government intervention, Irish government intervention, which is really needed on, on this issue. Um, it's just so worrying that more and more redundancies are coming our way. And in terms of the overnight insolvency, workers are really left with no protection at all. So um, we'll be supporting the motion. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Alderman Vinnie. Thank 
you, Mayor, for um, allowing me in. And I have to say, um, first of all, if this had been Devon's uh, in Northern Ireland, um, Councillor Harkin would have been probably calling it was Tory austerities. But I do believe, Mr Mayor, um, the Irish government um, should have had a more important role here to play uh, in keeping the survival of the company and the shops open down in the Republic. They, they seem to have been lacking on that, or if they were in discussions with them, they failed. And I heard um, Councillor McCann there saying about a windbaggery, which uh, sometimes I'll, ha I'll have to look up, look up the dictionary to see if it's in there. But um, back to Sinn Féin's comments that, that their president, um, Mary Lou MacDonald, has been on the case uh, uh, and speaking on the issue. You know, really, uh, if that was the case, she didn't deliver very much at the end of the day. So maybe a bit of one baggery would be coming in there, whatever that means. But, Mr Mayor, um, we will be not supporting the amendment. Uh, we will be abstaining. Okay, thank you, um, Alderman Devaney. Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Chair, and uh, no issues with the sentiment of the motion. Agree with it. Agree with the amendment, apart from one thing, and it's the what it what it calls the Irish government, Chair. Uh, you know that to me is, is 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 a serious flaw for somebody who lives in the six counties. This is a government of the twenty six counties. If that could be changed with uh you know with with uh cooperation of the 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 councillor to put the amendment and then you know I, I i would have absolutely no motion or sorry no problem with the motion getting tired here chair we all are councillor Donnelly. i think we all are Members, there's no further indicated speaker so i'm going to put the amendment um, uh, to the floor mayor yeah. i was looking to come in and um, to Right. Did you I don't see, see a message. No, I don't see a message from me. But go ahead. And is it not in the chat box there? No. No, I can't see it. I can't see it. But go ahead. Well, I put it in the way, but I don't. Know. Uh, I know. I just wanted to uh, support the original motion. Uh, I have been a trade unionist a lot longer than <coughs> a councillor, and uh, I think uh, the council and, and our council should stand with these people and uh, should protect the working class person. Uh, I fear that uh, wealthy people and uh, executives and are, have an opportunity or will seize on an opportunity of COVID here to, to maybe close businesses and save them off their profits and, uh, let the, and forget about the, the ordinary worker. So uh, I agree with Councillor Harkin's motion and, uh, and uh, per, uh, per, agree with it. Thank you. I'm getting tired myself. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, um, Alderman McCain. I think it's clear that so am I because I do see your message in the chat box. My apologies um, if I overlook you. Members, at this point, I'm putting it to the floor, the amendment to the floor, um, and I haven't heard any dissenting voices. No, I have, sorry. I have. I'm going to go put it to vote. So I'm going to ask John to take us to the vote. Thank you, Mayor. Alderman Bresland? Abstaining. Alderman Devaney? Abstaining. Alderman Guy? Four. Alderman Carrigan? Abstaining. Alderman McClintock? Abstaining. I don't think Alderman McCready is with us. Alderman McCain? Four. Alderman Ramsey? Abstaining. Alderman Work? Abstaining. Councillor Jason Barr. Councillor Jason Barr, are you there? Councillor John Boyle. Councillor John Boyle. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Uh, four, John. Councillor Burke. Or John. Councillor Carr. Or. Councillor Cooper. Or John. Councillor Cusick. Or John. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Duffy. 
For. Councillor Durkin. <laughs> Councillor Durkin. For. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. For John. Councillor Farrell. For. Councillor Ferguson. For John. Councillor Fleming. For Councillor Gallagher. For John. Councillor Harkin. For. Councillor Jackson. For John. Councillor Kelly. For John. Councillor Logue. For John. Councillor Logue. Thank you. Councillor McCann. For. Councillor McCluskey. For. Councillor McGuire. For. Councillor McHugh. For. Councillor McKeever. Councillor McKeever. Councillor McKinney. Councillor McKinney. Councillor Mellon. Councillor Mellon. Sorry, John. Four. Can you hear Thank me? Thank you. Yep. Councillor Mooney. Four, John. Councillor Riley. Four, John. Councillor Tierney. Four, John. Thank you, members. <clears throat> Okay, members, um, the result is 28 for, none against, and six abstentions. So the amendment is carried. Just to make you aware, to Councillor Jason Barron, Councillor Donnelly, we've seen your casted vote in the, in the chat box as well, which you've been counted. Members, that takes us to the substantive motion in the name of um, Councillor Harkin. I have no further indicated other man of any. Berlin, just for expediency, um, we are the only group, and, and I would say you'll come out with the same vote this time. But just to put on record that the DUP will be abstaining, the group in that, that voted the last time, just for expediency purposes. Thanks for that, um, Alderman Mandavini. Councillor Harkin, would you like an opportunity to sum up? Yeah, first of all, thanks to everybody who uh, supported the motion and who uh, spoke in solidarity with the uh, struggle of the workers. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, I was very supportive of uh, Councillor Jackson's amendment as well. If people want to follow what's happening, you can go to the Mandate Trade Union page uh, on Facebook or the Stand in Solidarity with Debenhams Workers page or the, um, the Devil Wears Debenhams page. And you can get an idea of the what workers are doing the campaign. Uh, one of the things that workers have had to do, in addition to being out uh, at the at the stores, is they they've had to block the uh, company from trying to remove the assets in the stores because that those assets are worth millions, uh, and the company is trying to remove those. And really, right now, this is one of the only um, uh, this is the leverage that workers have if they can if they can protect. The, the goods in the stores, they, they can hopefully try to force uh, the Debenhams uh, parent company to negotiate in good faith. Uh, and as Chris pointed out as well, uh, it pressure the Irish government to, to, to uh, take, the, take a stand on the side of the workers. Um, this, this, they, they have tried to occupy the workplace. Um, this is last resort uh, tactics by the workers. Um, and I think, but it's a practical next step uh, when, uh, you know, this is really, as people have said, this is a tactical insolvency. This is smash and grab and workers' rights. 
Um, these are opportunistic uh, layoffs in many ways. Um, and companies are thinking very narrowly about uh, profits and shareholders, rather thinking about a broader social good. So I think that uh, for workers here in the north or anywhere else, um, there's a real lesson in uh, what the Debenhams workers are doing. Uh, this is a way to organize. This is a way to get solidarity. And this is the way to get uh, some justice, organizing, campaigning, speaking out and um, standing up. And I think that this motion will send a message that we're on their side uh, and encourage them to, to keep on campaigning, but also send a message to workers here in Derry and Straban and across the district uh, that we're against opportunistic layoffs uh, here. Uh, and we understand that some of that is happening, but that uh, worker, we're encouraging workers to take action, to stand up for themselves, to join a trade union um, and, the, and, the, uh, and to not accept, uh, uh, you know, uh, smash and grabs on their rights. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Harkin. Um, and before we take the vote, members, can I just, um, on your behalf, thank those that have contacted all of us today um, from Debenhams with uh, by email uh, to make us aware of the, the the situation that they find themselves on. Uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic should not be used, in my opinion, by any company to unfairly uh, treat their workforce. Um, and I think, as Councillor McCann pointed out. Um, at the very least, this will, will boost the morale of the workforce um, across Debenham. So uh, I think it's a, it's a worthwhile motion. But um, I'm going to call the, the, the vote now. And if, as Alderman Devaney has indicated, um, the DUP will be abstaining. If anyone is changing their vote from the amendment, could they make me aware? And if not, I'm going to take it that we've got the same result as we had at the amendment. No. Okay. Members, I'm going to declare that vote 28 for the substantive motion, none against, and eight abstentions. In the name of Councillor Harkin. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Members, moving on, um, items number 12 to 15 are um, for information. I intend to pick them as read unless um, any member wants to, to raise a particular issue given the the time of night uh, that it is, as you see, Councillor Farrell wants to raise something in item number 13. Councillor Farrell. Uh, thanks, Mayor. And folks, I know it's late, but I really want to raise this. Um, we, we had a university motion back in February, and we received a response from the economy minister. Um, the response was mainly focused on the maximum student numbers. We asked. Uh, in our motion for the economy minister to make the necessary adjustments for ex exclusive use in dairy. She said she can't do that, uh, but she conveniently sort of swerved the wider issue, which is we need the Mazen cap to be increased by about five or 6,000 for us to reach the 10,000 student target. Um, I'm disappointed that she didn't address that at all. Um, and I know I had said in business and culture a couple of times that you know the minister probably thinks I have an unhealthy obsession with her. Um, I know that we have invited her on a number of times to come to this council. We have invited her to come to speak about regional balance, and I am asking at that meeting, whenever it happens, uh, that maximum student numbers is on the agenda because McGee isn't going to be expanded unless the number of students that are allowed in the north uh, has increased substantially. Thank you. OK, members. Um as I said, I intend to take items 12, 14, and 15 now um, as read, as uh, no one has, made, has indicated that they, that they wish to raise any, uh, anything on those um, particular model, uh, items. So, if I can get a proposal to go on the confidential, please. So proposed, Mayor Morris. <coughs> Alderman Devaney. Seconded, Martin here, Councillor Riley. Seconded by Councillor Riley. Members, item number 16 is a confirmation of the confidential.